Translator's Preface to Crime and Punishment. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Nelson. Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett, 1861 to 1946. Translator's Preface. A few words about Dostoevsky himself may help the English reader to understand his work. Dostoevsky was the son of a doctor. His parents were very hard-working and deeply religious people, but so poor that they lived with their five children in only two rooms. The father and mother spent their evenings in reading aloud to their children, generally from books of a serious character. Though always sickly and delicate, Dostoevsky came out third in the final examination of the Petersburg School of Engineering. There he had already begun his first work, Poor Folk. This story was published by the poet Nekrasov in his review, and was received with acclamations. The shy, unknown youth found himself instantly something of a celebrity. A brilliant and successful career seemed to open before him, but these hopes were soon dashed. In 1849 he was arrested. Though neither by temperament nor conviction a revolutionist, Dostoevsky was one of a little group of young men who met together to read Fourier and Proudhon. He was accused of taking part in conversations against the censorship, of reading a letter from Bylinsky to Gogol, and of knowing of the intention to set up a printing press. Under Nicholas I, that stern and just man, as Maurice Baring calls him, this was enough, and he was condemned to death. After eight months' imprisonment, he was, with twenty-one others, taken out to the Semyonovsky Square to be shot. Writing to his brother Mikhail, Dostoevsky says, They snapped words over our heads, and they made us put on the white shirts worn by persons condemned to death. Thereupon we were bound in threes to stakes, to suffer execution. Being the third in the row, I concluded I had only a few minutes of life before me. I thought of you and your dear ones, and I contrived to kiss Plestiev and Durov, who were next to me, and to bid them farewell. Suddenly the troops beat a tattoo, we were unbound, brought back upon the scaffold, and informed that His Majesty had spared us our lives. The sentence was commuted to hard labor. One of the prisoners, Grigoryev, went mad as soon as he was untied and never regained his sanity. The intense suffering of this experience left a lasting stamp on Dostoevsky's mind. Though his religious temper led him in the end to accept every suffering with resignation and to regard it as a blessing in his own case, he constantly recurs to the subject in his writings. He describes the awful agony of the condemned man and insists on the cruelty of inflicting such torture. Then followed four years of penal servitude, spent in the company of common criminals in Siberia, where he began the dead house, and some years of service in a disciplinary battalion. He had shown signs of some obscure nervous disease before his arrest, and this now developed into violent attacks of epilepsy, from which he suffered for the rest of his life. The fits occurred three or four times a year, and were more frequent in periods of great strain. In 1859 he was allowed to return to Russia. He started a journal, Vremya, which was forbidden by the censorship through a misunderstanding. In 1864 he lost his first wife and his brother Mikhail. He was in terrible poverty, yet he took upon himself the payment of his brother's debts. He started another journal, The Epoch which within a few months was also prohibited. He was weighed down by debt, his brother's family was dependent on him, he was forced to write at heartbreaking speed, and is said never to have corrected his work. The later years of his life were much softened by the tenderness and devotion of his second wife. In June 1880 he made his famous speech at the unveiling of the monument to Pushkin in Moscow, and he was received with extraordinary demonstrations of love and honor. A few months later Dostoevsky died. He was followed to the grave by a vast multitude of mourners, who gave the hapless man the funeral of a king. He is still probably the most widely read writer in Russia. In the words of a Russian critic, 
who seeks to explain the feeling inspired by Dostoevsky. He was one of ourselves, a man of our blood and our bone, but one who has suffered, and has seen so much more deeply than we have, his insight impresses us as wisdom. That wisdom of the heart which we seek that we may learn from it how to live. All his other gifts came to him from nature, this he won for himself, and through it he became great. End of Translator's Preface Part 1 Chapter 1 of Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky Translated by Constance Garnett, 1861-1946 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1 Chapter 1 On an exceptionally hot evening early in July, a young man came out of the garret in which he lodged in S. Place, and walked slowly, as though in hesitation, towards K. Bridge. He had successfully avoided meeting his landlady on the staircase. His garret was under the roof of a high, five-storied house, and was more like a cupboard than a room. The landlady who provided him with garret, dinners, and attendants lived on the floor below, and every time he went out he was obliged to pass her kitchen, the door of which invariably stood open. And each time he passed the young man had a sick, frightened feeling, which made him scowl and feel ashamed. He was hopelessly in debt to his landlady, and was afraid of meeting her. This was not because he was cowardly and abject, quite the contrary, but for some time past he had been in an overstrained, irritable condition, verging on hypochondria. He had become so completely absorbed in himself, and isolated from his fellows, that he dreaded meeting not only his landlady, but any one at all. He was crushed by poverty, but the anxieties of his position had of late ceased to weigh upon him. He had given up attending to matters of practical importance. He had lost all desire to do so. Nothing that any landlady could do had a real terror for him. But to be stopped on the stairs, to be forced to listen to her trivial, irrelevant gossip, to pestering demands for payment, threats and complaints, and to rack his brains for excuses, to prevaricate, to lie. No, rather than that, he would creep down the stairs like a cat and slip out unseen. This evening, however, on coming out into the street, he became acutely aware of his fears. "'I want to attempt a thing like that, and am frightened by these trifles,' he thought with an odd smile. Hmm, yes, all is in a man's hands, and he lets it all slip from cowardice. That's an axiom. It would be interesting to know what it is men are most afraid of. Taking a new step, uttering a new word, is what they fear most. But I am talking too much. It's because I chatter that I do nothing. Or perhaps it is that I chatter because I do nothing. I've learned to chatter this last month lying for days together in my den thinking, of Jack the Giant Killer. Why am I going there now? Am I capable of that? Is that serious? It is not serious at all. It's simply a fantasy to amuse myself, a plaything. Yes, maybe it is a plaything. The heat in the street was terrible, and the airlessness, the bustle and the plaster, scaffolding, bricks and dust all about him, and that special Petersburg stench, so familiar to all who are unable to get out of town in summer, all worked painfully upon the young man's already overwrought nerves. The insufferable stench from the pothouses, which are particularly numerous in that part of the town, and the drunken men whom he met continually, although it was a working day, completed the revolting misery of the picture. An expression of the profoundest disgust gleamed for a moment in the young man's refined face. He was, by the way, exceptionally handsome, above the average in height, slim, well-built, with beautiful dark eyes and dark brown hair. Soon he sank into deep thought, or more accurately speaking, into a complete blankness of mind. He walked along not observing what was about him, and not caring to observe it. From time to time he would mutter something, from the habit of talking to himself, to which he had just confessed. 
At these moments he would become conscious that his ideas were sometimes in a tangle, and that he was very weak. For two days he had scarcely tasted food. He was so badly dressed that even a man accustomed to shabbiness would have been ashamed to be seen in the street in such rags. In that quarter of the town, however, scarcely any shortcoming in dress would have created surprise. Owing to the proximity of the haymarket, the number of establishments of bad character, the preponderance of the trading and working-class population crowded in these streets and alleys in the heart of Petersburg, types so various were to be seen in the streets that no figure, however queer, would have caused surprise. But there was such accumulated bitterness and contempt in the young man's heart, that in spite of all the fastidiousness of youth, he minded his rags least of all in the street. It was a different matter when he met with acquaintances or with former fellow-students, whom, indeed, he disliked meeting at any time. And yet, when a drunken man, who for some unknown reason was being taken somewhere in a huge wagon dragged by a heavy dray horse, suddenly shouted at him as he drove past, "'Hey there, German Hatter!' bawling at the top of his voice and pointing at him, the young man stopped suddenly and clutched tremulously at his hat. It was a tall round hat from Zimmermann's, but completely worn out, rusty with age, all torn and bespattered, brimless and bent on one side in a most unseemly fashion. Not shame, however, but quite another feeling akin to terror had overtaken him. "'I knew it,' he muttered in confusion. "'I thought so. That's the worst of all. Why, a stupid thing like this! the most trivial detail might spoil the whole plan. Yes, my hat is too noticeable. It looks absurd, and that makes it noticeable. With my rags I ought to wear a cap, any sort of old pancake, but not this grotesque thing. Nobody wears such a hat. It would be noticed a mile off. It would be remembered. What matters is that people would remember it, and that would give them a clue. For this business one should be as little conspicuous as possible. Trifles, trifles are what matter. Why, it's just such trifles that always ruin everything." He had not far to go. He knew indeed how many steps it was from the gate of his lodging-house, exactly seven hundred and thirty. He had counted them once when he had been lost in dreams. At the time he had put no faith in those dreams and was only tantalizing himself by their hideous but daring recklessness. Now, a month later, he had begun to look upon them differently, and in spite of the monologues in which he jeered at his own impotence and indecision, he had involuntarily come to regard this hideous dream as an exploit to be attempted, although he still did not realize this himself. He was positively going now for a rehearsal of his project, and at every step his excitement grew more and more violent. With a sinking heart and a nervous tremor, he went up to a huge house which on one side looked on to the canal, and on the other into the street. This house was let out in tiny tenements, and was inhabited by working people of all kinds—tailors, locksmiths, cooks, Germans of sorts, girls picking up a living as best they could, petty clerks, etc. There was a continual coming and going through the two gates and in the two courtyards of the house. Three or four doorkeepers were employed on the building. The young man was very glad to meet none of them, and at once slipped unnoticed through the door on the right and up the staircase. It was a back staircase, dark and narrow, but he was familiar with it already and knew his way, and he liked all these surroundings. In such darkness even the most inquisitive eyes were not to be dreaded. If I am so scared now, what would it be if it somehow came to pass that I were really going to do it?" he could not help asking himself as he reached the fourth story. There his progress was barred by some porters who were engaged in moving furniture out of a flat. He knew that the flat had been occupied by a German clerk in the civil service and his family. This German was moving out then and so the fourth floor on this staircase would be untenanted except by the old woman. That's a good thing, anyway, he thought to himself, 
as he rang the bell of the old woman's flat. The bell gave a faint tinkle as though it were made of tin and not of copper. The little flats in such houses always have bells that ring like that. He had forgotten the note of that bell, and now its peculiar tinkle seemed to remind him of something and to bring it clearly before him. He started, his nerves were terribly overstrained by now. In a little while the door was opened a tiny crack. The old woman eyed her visitor with evident distrust through the crack, and nothing could be seen but her little eyes, glittering in the darkness. But seeing a number of people on the landing she grew bolder, and opened the door wide. The young man stepped into the dark entry, which was partitioned off from the tiny kitchen. The old woman stood facing him in silence and looking inquiringly at him. She was a diminutive, withered-up old woman of sixty, with sharp malignant eyes and a sharp little nose. Her colorless, somewhat grizzled hair was thickly smeared with oil, and she wore no kerchief over it. Round her thin long neck, which looked like a hen's leg, was knotted some sort of flannel rag, and in spite of the heat there hung flapping on her shoulders a mangy fur cape, yellow with age. The old woman coughed and groaned at every instant. The young man must have looked at her with a rather peculiar expression, for a gleam of mistrust came into her eyes again. Raskolnikov, a student, I came here a month ago? The young man made haste to mutter, with a half bow, remembering that he ought to be more polite. I remember it, my good sir, I remember quite well your coming here, the old woman said distinctly still keeping her inquiring eyes on his face. "'And here, I am again on the same errand,' Raskolnikov continued, a little disconcerted and surprised at the old woman's mistrust. "'Perhaps she is always like that, though. Only I did not notice it the other time,' he thought with an uneasy feeling. The old woman paused, as though hesitating, then stepped on one side, and pointing to the door of the room, she said, letting her visitor pass in front of her. "'Step in, my good sir!' The little room into which the young man walked, with yellow paper on the walls, geraniums and muslin curtains in the windows, was brightly lighted up at that moment by the setting sun. "'So the sun will shine like this then, too,' flashed as it were by chance through Raskolnikov's mind, and with a rapid glance he scanned everything in the room trying as far as possible to notice and remember its arrangement. But there was nothing special in the room. The furniture, all very old and of yellow wood, consisted of a sofa with a huge bent wooden back, an oval table in front of the sofa, a dressing-table with a looking-glass fixed on it between the windows, chairs along the walls, and two or three halfpenny prints in yellow frames, representing German damsels with birds in their hands. That was all. In the corner a light was burning before a small icon. Everything was very clean. The floor and the furniture were brightly polished. Everything shone. Lizaveta's work, thought the young man. There was not a speck of dust to be seen in the whole flat. It's in the houses of spiteful old widows that one finds such cleanliness, Raskolnikov thought again and he stole a curious glance at the cotton curtain over the door leading into another tiny room, in which stood the old woman's bed and chest of drawers, and into which he had never looked before. These two rooms made up the whole flat. "'What do you want?' the old woman said severely, coming into the room and, as before, standing in front of him so as to look him straight in the face. "'I've brought something to pawn here and he drew out of his pocket an old-fashioned flat silver watch, on the back of which was engraved a globe. The chain was of steel. "'But the time is up for your last pledge. The month was up the day before yesterday. I will bring you the interest for another month. Wait a little. But that's for me to do as I please, my good sir, to wait or to sell your pledge at once.' "'How much will you give me for the watch, Alyona Ivanovna?' You come with such trifles, my good sir, it's scarcely worth anything. I gave you two roubles last time for your ring, and one could buy it quite new at a jeweler's for a rouble and a half. Give me four roubles for it, I shall redeem it, it was my father's. I shall be getting some money soon. 
A rouble and a half, and interest in advance, if you like." "'A rouble and a half?' cried the young man. "'Please yourself.' And the old woman handed him back the watch. The young man took it, and was so angry that he was on the point of going away, but checked himself at once, remembering that there was nowhere else he could go, and that he had had another object also in coming. "'Hand it over,' he said roughly. The old woman fumbled in her pocket for her keys, and disappeared behind the curtain into the other room. The young man, left standing alone in the middle of the room, listened inquisitively, thinking. He could hear her unlocking the chest of drawers. "'It must be the top drawer,' he reflected. So she carries the keys in a pocket on the right, all in one bunch on a steel ring. And there's one key there three times as big as all the others, with deep notches. That can't be the key of the chest of drawers. Then there must be some other chest or strong-box. That's worth knowing. Strong-boxes always have keys like that. But how degrading it all is!" The old woman came back. "'Here, sir, as we say, ten kopecks the rouble a month. So I must take fifteen kopecks from a rouble and a half for the month in advance. But for the two roubles I lent you before, you owe me now twenty kopecks on the same reckoning in advance. That makes thirty-five kopecks altogether. So I must give you a rouble and fifteen kopecks for the watch. Here it is." "'What? Only a rouble and fifteen kopecks now?' "'Just so.' The young man did not dispute it and took the money. He looked at the old woman and was in no hurry to get away as though there was still something he wanted to say or to do, but he did not himself quite know what. "'I may be bringing you something else in a day or two, Alyona Ivanovna, a valuable thing, silver, a cigarette-box, as soon as I get it back from a friend.' He broke off in confusion. "'Well, we will talk about it then, sir.' "'Good-bye. Are you always at home alone? Your sister is not here with you?' He asked her as casually as possible as he went out into the passage. "'What business is she of yours, my good sir?' "'Oh, nothing particular,' I simply asked. "'You are too quick. Good day, Alyona Ivanovna.' Raskolnikov went out in complete confusion. This confusion became more and more intense. As he went down the stairs, he even stopped short two or three times, as though suddenly struck by some thought. When he was in the street, he cried out, "'Oh, God! How loathsome it all is! And can I, can I possibly? No, it's nonsense, it's rubbish!' he added resolutely. "'And how could such an atrocious thing come into my head? What filthy things my heart is capable of! Yes, filthy above all, disgusting, loathsome, loathsome! And for a whole month I've been—' but no words, no exclamations could express his agitation. The feeling of intense repulsion, which had begun to oppress and torture his heart while he was on his way to the old woman, had by now reached such a pitch and had taken such a definite form that he did not know what to do with himself to escape from its wretchedness. He walked along the pavement like a drunken man, regardless of the passers-by, and jostling against them, and only came to his senses when he was in the next street. Looking round he noticed that he was standing close to a tavern which was entered by steps leading from the pavement to the basement. At that instant two drunken men came out at the door, and abusing and supporting one another they mounted the steps. Without stopping to think, Raskolnikov went down the steps at once. Till that moment he had never been into a tavern, but now he felt giddy and was tormented by a burning thirst. He longed for a drink of cold beer and attributed his sudden weakness to the want of food. He sat down at a sticky little table in a dark and dirty corner, ordered some beer, and eagerly drank off the first glassful. At once he felt easier, and his thoughts became clear. "'All that's nonsense,' he said hopefully, "'and there's nothing in it at all to worry about. It's simply physical derangement. Just a glass of beer, a piece of dry bread, and in one moment the brain is stronger, 
the mind is clearer and the will is firm. Phew! How utterly petty it all is!" But in spite of this scornful reflection, he was by now looking cheerful as though he were suddenly set free from a terrible burden. And he gazed round in a friendly way at the people in the room. But even at that moment he had a dim foreboding that this happier frame of mind was also not normal. There were few people at the time in the tavern. Besides the two drunken men he had met on the steps, a group consisting of about five men and a girl with a concertina had gone out at the same time. Their departure left the room quiet and rather empty. The persons still in the tavern were a man who appeared to be an artisan, drunk, but not extremely so, sitting before a pot of beer, and his companion, a huge stout man with a grey beard, in a short full-skirted coat. He was very drunk, and had dropped asleep on the bench. Every now and then he began as though in his sleep, cracking his fingers, with his arms wide apart and the upper part of his body bounding about on the bench, while he hummed some meaningless refrain, trying to recall some such lines as these. His wife a year he fondly loved, his wife a, a year he fondly loved. Or suddenly waking up again, walking along the crowded row, he met the one he used to know." But no one shared his enjoyment. His silent companion looked with positive hostility and mistrust at all these manifestations. There was another man in the room who looked somewhat like a retired government clerk. He was sitting apart, now and then sipping from his pot and looking round at the company. He, too, appeared to be in some agitation. End of Part 1, Chapter 1 Part One, Chapter Two of Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett, 1861 to 1946. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part One, Chapter Two. Raskolnikov was not used to crowds, and, as we said before, he avoided society of every sort, more especially of late. But now all at once he felt a desire to be with other people. Something new seemed to be taking place within him, and with it he felt a sort of thirst for company. He was so weary after a whole month of concentrated wretchedness and gloomy excitement that he longed to rest, if only for a moment, in some other world, whatever it might be. And in spite of the filthiness of the surroundings, he was glad now to stay in the tavern. The master of the establishment was in another room, but he frequently came down some steps into the main room, his jaunty, tarred boots with red turnover tops coming into view each time before the rest of his person. He wore a full coat and a horribly greasy black satin waistcoat, with no cravat, and his whole face seemed smeared with oil like an iron lock. At the counter stood a boy of about fourteen and there was another boy, somewhat younger, who handed whatever was wanted. On the counter lay some sliced cucumber, some pieces of dried black bread, and some fish, chopped up small, all smelling very bad. It was insufferably close, and so heavy with the fumes of spirits, that five minutes in such an atmosphere might well make a man drunk. There are chance meetings with strangers that interest us from the first moment, before a word is spoken. Such was the impression made on Raskolnikov by the person sitting a little distance from him, who looked like a retired clerk. The young men often recalled this impression afterwards, and even ascribed it to presentiment. He looked repeatedly at the clerk, partly, no doubt, because the latter was staring persistently at him, obviously anxious to enter into conversation. At the other persons in the room, including the tavern-keeper, the clerk looked as though he were used to their company and weary of it, showing a shade of condescending contempt for them as persons of station and culture inferior to his own, with whom it would be useless for him to converse. He was a man over fifty, bald and grizzled, of medium height, and stoutly built. His face, bloated from continual drinking, was of a yellow, even greenish tinge with swollen eyelids out of which keen reddish eyes gleamed like little chinks. 
but there was something very strange in him. There was a light in his eyes as though of intense feeling, perhaps there were even thought and intelligence, but at the same time there was a gleam of something like madness. He was wearing an old and hopelessly ragged black dress coat, with all its buttons missing except one, and that one he had buttoned, evidently clinging to this last trace of respectability. A crumpled shirt front, covered with spots and stains, protruded from his canvas waistcoat. Like a clerk, he wore no beard nor mustache, but had been so long unshaven that his chin looked like a stiff grayish brush. And there was something respectable and like an official about his manner, too. But he was restless. He ruffled up his hair and from time to time let his head drop into his hands dejectedly resting his ragged elbows on the stained and sticky table. At last he looked straight at Raskolnikov, and said loudly and resolutely, "'May I venture, honoured sir, to engage you in polite conversation? Forasmuch as, though your exterior would not command respect, my experience admonishes me that you are a man of education and not accustomed to drinking. I have always respected education when in conjunction with genuine sentiments, and am besides a titular counsellor in rank. Marmeladov, such is my name, titular counsellor. I make bold to inquire, have you been in the service?" "'No, I am studying,' answered the young man, somewhat surprised at the grandiloquent style of the speaker, and also at being so directly addressed. In spite of the momentary desire he had just been feeling for company of any sort, on being actually spoken to, he felt immediately his habitual irritable and uneasy aversion for any stranger who approached or attempted to approach him. "'A student, then, or formerly a student,' cried the clerk. "'Just what I thought. I'm a man of experience, immense experience, sir,' and he tapped his forehead with his fingers in self-approval. You've been a student or have attended some learned institution. But allow me." He got up, staggered, took up his jug and glass, and sat down beside the young man, facing him a little sideways. He was drunk, but spoke fluently and boldly, only occasionally losing the thread of his sentences and drawling his words. He pounced upon Raskolnikov as greedily as though he too had not spoken to a soul for a month. Honored sir he began almost with solemnity. Poverty is not a vice, that's a true saying. Yet I know too that drunkenness is not a virtue, and that that's even truer. But beggary, honoured sir, beggary is a vice. In poverty you may still retain your innate nobility of soul, but in beggary never, no one. For beggary a man is not chased out of human society with a stick he has swept out with a broom, so as to make it as humiliating as possible. And quite right, too, for as much as in beggary I am ready to be the first to humiliate myself. Hence the pothouse. Honoured sir, a month ago Mr. Lebeziatnov gave my wife a beating, and my wife is a very different matter from me. Do you understand? Allow me to ask you another question out of simple curiosity. Have you ever spent a night on a hay barge on the Neva?" "'No, I have not happened to,' answered Raskolnikov. "'What do you mean?' "'Well, I've just come from one, and it's the fifth night I've slept so.' He filled his glass, emptied it, and paused. Bits of hay were in fact clinging to his clothes and sticking to his hair. It seemed quite probable that he had not undressed or washed for the last five days. His hands, particularly, were filthy. They were fat and red, with black nails. His conversation seemed to excite a general, though languid, interest. The boys at the counter fell to sniggering. The innkeeper came down from the upper room, apparently on purpose to listen to the funny fellow, and sat down at a little distance, yawning lazily but with dignity. Evidently, Marmeladov was a familiar figure here and he had most likely acquired his weakness for high-flown speeches from the habit of frequently entering into conversation with strangers of all sorts in the tavern. This habit develops into a necessity in some drunkards, and especially in those who are looked after sharply and kept in order at home. Hence in the company of other drinkers 
they try to justify themselves and even if possible obtain consideration. "'Funny fellow,' pronounced the innkeeper. "'And why don't you work? Why aren't you at your duty, if you're in the service?' "'Why am I not at my duty, honored sir?' Marmeladov went on, addressing himself exclusively to Raskolnikov, as though it had been he who put that question to him. "'Why am I not at my duty? Does not my heart ache to think what a useless worm I am? A month ago, when Mr. Lebeziatnikov beat my wife with his own hands, and I lay drunk, didn't I suffer? Excuse me, young man, has it ever happened to you? Hm. well, to petition hopelessly for a loan? Yes, it has. But what do you mean by hopelessly? Hopelessly, in the fullest sense, when you know beforehand that you will get nothing by it. You know, for instance, beforehand with positive certainty that this man, this most reputable and exemplary citizen, will on no consideration give you money. And, indeed, I ask you, why should he? For he knows, of course, that I shan't pay it back. From compassion? But Mr. Lebeziatnikov, who keeps up with modern ideas, explained the other day that compassion is forbidden nowadays by science itself, and that that's what is done now in England, where there is political economy. Why, I ask you, should he give it to me? And yet, though I know beforehand that he won't, I set off to him, and—' "'Why do you go?' put in Raskolnikov. "'Well, when one has no one, nowhere else one can go. For every man must have somewhere to go, since there are times when one absolutely must go somewhere. When my own daughter first went out with a yellow ticket, then I had to go. For my daughter has a yellow passport," he added in parentheses, looking with a certain uneasiness at the young man. "'No matter, sir, no matter,' he went on hurriedly and with apparent composure when both the boys at the counter guffawed and even the innkeeper smiled. No matter, I am not confounded by the wagging of their heads, for everyone knows everything about it already, and all that is secret is made open. And I accept it all, not with contempt, but with humility. So be it, so be it. Behold the man! Excuse me, young man, can you— Not to put it more strongly and more distinctly, not can you, but dare you, looking upon me, assert, that I am not a pig?" The young man did not answer a word. Well, the orator began again stolidly and with even increased dignity, after waiting for the laughter in the room to subside. Well, so be it. I am a pig. But she is a lady. I have the semblance of a beast, but Katerina Ivanovna, my spouse, is a person of education and an officer's daughter. Granted, granted, I am a scoundrel, but she is a woman of a noble heart, full of sentiments, refined by education. And yet, oh, if only she felt for me! Honored sir, honored sir, you know every man ought to have at least one place where people feel for him. But Katerina Ivanovna, though she is magnanimous, she is unjust. And yet, although I realize that when she pulls my hair she only does it out of pity, for I repeat without being ashamed, she pulls my hair, young man," he declared with redoubled dignity, hearing the sniggering again. But, by God, if she would but once! But no, no, it's all in vain, and it's no use talking, no use talking. For more than once my wish did come true, and more than once she has felt for me, but such is my fate, and I am a beast by nature." "'Rather!' assented the innkeeper, yawning. Marmeladov struck his fist resolutely on the table. "'Such is my fate! Do you know, sir, do you know, I have sold her very stockings for drink? Not her shoes, that would be more or less in the order of things, but her stockings, her stockings I have sold for drink! Her mohair shawl I sold for drink, a present to her long ago, her own property, not mine. And we live in a cold room, and she caught cold this winter, and has begun coughing and spitting blood, too. 
We have three little children, and Katerina Ivanovna is at work from morning till night. She is scrubbing and cleaning and washing the children, for she's been used to cleanliness from a child. But her chest is weak, and she has a tendency to consumption, and I feel it. Do you suppose I don't feel it? And the more I drink, the more I feel it. That's why I drink, too. I try to find sympathy and feeling in drink. I drink so that I may suffer twice as much." And as though in despair he laid his head down on the table. "'Young man,' he went on, raising his head again, "'in your face I seem to read some trouble of mind. When you came in I read it, and that was why I addressed you at once. For in unfolding to you the story of my life I do not wish to make myself a laughing-stock before these idle listeners, who indeed know all about it already. But I am looking for a man of feeling and education. Know then that my wife was educated in a high-class school for the daughters of noblemen, and on leaving she danced the shawl-dance before the governor and other personages for which she was presented with a gold medal and a certificate of merit. The medal, well, the medal, of course, was sold, long ago, hm. But the certificate of merit is in her trunk still, and not long ago she showed it to our landlady. And, although she is most continually on bad terms with the landlady, yet she wanted to tell someone or other of her past honours and of the happy days that are gone. I don't condemn her for it, I don't blame her, for the one thing left her is recollection of the past and all the rest is dust and ashes. Yes, yes, she is a lady of spirit, proud and determined. She scrubs the floors herself and has nothing but black bread to eat, but won't allow herself to be treated with disrespect. That's why she would not overlook Mr. Lebeziatnikov's rudeness to her, and so when he gave her a beating for it she took to her bed more from the hurt to her feelings than from the blows. She was a widow when I married her, with three children, one smaller than the other. She married her first husband, an infantry officer, for love, and ran away with him from her father's house. She was exceedingly fond of her husband, but he gave way to cards, got into trouble, and with that he died. He used to beat her at the end, and although she paid him back, of which I have authentic documentary evidence, to this day she speaks of him with tears, and she throws him up to me. And I am glad, I am glad that, though only in imagination, she should think of herself as having once been happy. And she was left at his death with three children in a wild and remote district where I happened to be at the time. And she was left in such hopeless poverty that, although I have seen many ups and downs of all sort, I don't feel equal to describing it even. Her relations had all thrown her off. And she was proud, too, excessively proud. And then, honoured sir, and then, I, being at the time a widower, with a daughter of fourteen left me by my first wife, offered her my hand, for I could not bear the sight of such suffering. You can judge the extremity of her calamities, that she, a woman of education and culture and distinguished family, should have consented to be my wife. But she did. Weeping and sobbing and wringing her hands she married me. For she had nowhere to turn. Do you understand, sir, do you understand what it means when you have absolutely nowhere to turn? No, that you don't understand yet. And for a whole year I performed my duties conscientiously and faithfully, and did not touch this." He tapped the jug with his finger for I have feelings. But even so, I could not please her. And then I lost my place, too, and that through no fault of mine but through the changes in the office. And then I did touch it. It will be a year and a half ago soon since we found ourselves at last after many wanderings and numerous calamities in this magnificent capital, adorned with innumerable monuments. Here I obtained a situation. I obtained it and I lost it again. Do you understand? This time it was through my own fault I lost it, for my weakness had come out. We have now part of a room at Amalia Fyodorovna Lipovetchel's, 
and what we live upon, and what we pay our rent with, I could not say. There are a lot of people living there besides ourselves. Dirt and disorder, a perfect bedlam. Hm, yes. And meanwhile, my daughter by my first wife has grown up. And what my daughter has had to put up with from her stepmother whilst she was growing up, I won't speak of. For, though Katerina Ivanovna is full of generous feelings, she is a spirited lady, irritable and short-tempered. Yes. But it's no use going over that. Sonia, as you may well fancy, has had no education. I did make an effort four years ago to give her a course of geography and universal history, but as I was not very well up in those subjects myself and we had no suitable books, and what books we had... Hmm. Anyway, we have not even those now, so all our instruction came to an end. We stopped at Cyrus of Persia. Since she has attained years of maturity, she has read other books of romantic tendency, and of late she had read with great interest a book she got through Mr. Lebeziatnikov, Lowe's Physiology, do you know it? And even recounted extracts from it to us. And that's the whole of her education. And now may I venture to address you, honoured sir, on my own account with a private question? Do you suppose that a respectable poor girl can earn much by honest work? Not fifteen farthings a day can she earn, if she is respectable and has no special talent, and that without putting her work down for an instant. And what's more, Ivan Ivanitch Klopstock, the civil councillor, have you heard of him? has not to this day paid her for the half-dozen linen shirts she made him, and drove her roughly away, stamping and reviling her, on the pretext that the shirt-collars were not made like the pattern and were put in askew. And there are the little ones hungry. At Katerina Ivanovna, walking up and down and wringing her hands, her cheeks flushed red, as they always are in that disease. Here you live with us, says she. You eat and drink and are kept warm and you do nothing to help." And much she gets to eat and drink when there is not a crust for the little ones for three days. I was lying at the time. Well, what of it? I was lying drunk and I heard my Sonia speaking. She is a gentle creature with a soft little voice, fair hair and such a pale, thin little face. She said, Katerina Ivanovna, am I really to do a thing like that? and Daria Fransovna, a woman of evil character and very well known to the police, had two or three times tried to get at her through the landlady. "'And why not?' said Katerina Ivanovna with a jeer. "'You are something mighty precious to be so careful of.' "'But don't blame her, don't blame her, honoured sir, don't blame her. She was not herself when she spoke, but driven to distraction by her illness and the crying of the hungry children and it is said more to wound her than anything else. For that's Katerina Ivanovna's character, and when children cry, even from hunger, she falls to beating them at once. At six o'clock I saw Sonia get up, put on her kerchief and her cape, and go out of the room, and about nine o'clock she came back. She walked straight up to Katerina Ivanovna, and she laid thirty roubles on the table before her in silence. She did not utter a word. She did not even look at her, she simply picked up our big green drop de dame shawl, we have a shawl made of drop de dame, put it over her head and face and lay down on the bed with her face to the wall. Only her little shoulders and her body kept shuddering. And I went on lying there, just as before. And then I saw a young man, I saw Katerina Ivanovna, in the same silence, go up to Sonia's little bed. She was on her knees all the evening kissing Sonia's feet, and would not get up, and then they both fell asleep in each other's arms. Together, together, yes, and I lay drunk." Marmeladov stopped short, as though his voice had failed him. Then he hurriedly filled his glass, drank and cleared his throat. "'Since then, sir,' he went on after a brief pause, "'since then, owing to an unfortunate occurrence, and through information given by evil-intentioned persons, in all which Daria Fransovna took a leading part on the pretext that she had been treated with want of respect. Since then, my daughter Sofia Semyonovna has been forced to take a yellow ticket, 
and owing to that she is unable to go on living with us. For our landlady, Amelia Fyodorovna, would not hear of it, though she had backed up Darya Fransovna before, and Mr. Lebeziatnikov too. Hm. All the trouble between him and Katerina Ivanovna was on Sonya's account. At first he was for making up to Sonya himself, and then all of a sudden he stood on his dignity. How, said he, can a highly educated man like me live in the same rooms with a girl like that? And Katerina Ivanovna would not let it pass. She stood up for her. And so that's how it happened. And Sonya comes to us now, mostly after dark. She comforts Katerina Ivanovna and gives her all she can. She has a room at the Kapernamovs, the tailors. She lodges with them. Kapernamov is a lame man with a cleft palate, and all of his numerous family have cleft palates too. And his wife too has a cleft palate. They all live in one room, but Sonya has her own, partitioned off. Hm. Yes. Very poor people, and all with cleft palates. Yes. Then I got up in the morning and put on my rags, lifted up my hands to heaven, and set off to His Excellency Ivan Afanasovitch. His Excellency Ivan Afanasovitch, do you know him? No? Well, then, it's a man of God, don't you know? He is wax, wax before the face of the Lord, even as wax melteth. His eyes were dim when he heard my story. Marmeladov, once already you have deceived my expectations. I'll take you once more on my own responsibility. That's what he said. Remember, he said, and now you can go. I kissed the dust at his feet, in thought only, for in reality he would not have allowed me to do it, being a statesman and a man of modern political and enlightened ideas. I returned home, and when I announced that I'd been taken back into the service and should receive a salary, heavens, what a to-do there was! Marmeladov stopped again in violent excitement. At that moment a whole party of revellers already drunk came in from the street, and the sounds of a hired concertina and the cracked piping voice of a child of seven singing the hamlet were heard in the entry. The room was filled with noise. The tavern-keeper and the boys were busy with the newcomers. Marmeladov, paying no attention to the new arrivals, continued his story. He appeared by now to be extremely weak but as he became more and more drunk, he became more and more talkative. The recollection of his recent success in getting the situation seemed to revive him, and was positively reflected in a sort of radiance on his face. Raskolnikov listened attentively. "'That was five weeks ago, sir. Yes. As soon as Katerina Ivanovna and Sonya heard of it, mercy on us, it was as though I stepped into the kingdom of heaven. It used to be, you can lie like a beast, nothing but abuse. Now they were walking on tiptoe, hushing the children. Semyon Saharovich is tired with his work at the office. He is resting. Shh! They made me coffee before I went to work, and boiled cream for me. They began to get real cream for me, do you hear that? And how they managed to get together the money for a decent outfit? Eleven roubles, fifty kopecks, I can't guess. Boots cotton shirt-fronts, most magnificent, a uniform they got it all up in splendid style, for eleven roubles and a half. The first morning I came back from the office I found Katerina Ivanovna had cooked two courses for dinner, soup and salt meat with horseradish, which we had never dreamed of till then. She had not any dresses, none at all, but she got herself up as though she were going on a visit. And not that she'd anything to do it with, she smartened herself up with nothing at all. She'd done her hair nicely, put on a clean collar of some sort, cuffs, and there she was, quite a different person. She was younger and better looking. Sonia, my little darling, had only helped with money for the time, she said. It won't do for me to come and see you too often, after dark maybe, when no one can see. Do you hear? Do you hear? I laid down for a nap after dinner, and what do you think? though Katerina Ivanovna had quarrelled to the last degree with our landlady, Amelia Fyodorovna, only a week before, she could not resist then asking her into coffee. For two hours they were sitting, whispering together. 
Semyon Zaharovich is in the service again now and receiving a salary, says she. And he went himself to His Excellency, and His Excellency himself came out to him, made all the others wait, and led Semyon Zaharovich by the hand before everybody into his study. Do you hear? Do you hear? To be sure, says he. Semyon Zaharovich, remembering your past service, says he, and in spite of your propensity to that foolish weakness, since you promise now, and since, moreover, we've gone on badly without you. Do you hear? Do you hear? And so, says he, I rely now on your word as a gentleman. And all that, let me tell you, she has simply made up for herself, and not simply out of wantonness, for the sake of bragging. No, she believes it all herself. She amuses herself with her own fancies. Upon my word she does. And I don't blame her for it, no, I don't blame her. Six days ago, when I brought her my first earnings in full, twenty-three roubles, forty kopecks altogether, she called me her puppet. Puppet, said she, my little puppet. And when we were by ourselves, you understand. You would not think me a beauty. You would not think much of me as a husband, would you? Well, she pinched my cheek. My little puppet, said she. Marmeladov broke off, tried to smile, but suddenly his chin began to twitch. He controlled himself, however. The tavern, the degraded appearance of the man, the five nights in the hay barge, and the pot of spirits, and yet this poignant love for his wife and children bewildered his listener. Raskolnikov listened intently but with a sick sensation. He felt vexed that he had come here. "'Honored, sir! Honored, sir!' cried Marmeladov, recovering himself. "'Oh, sir, perhaps all this seems a laughing matter to you, as it does to others, and perhaps I am only worrying you with the stupidity of all the trivial details of my home life, but it is not a laughing matter to me. For I can feel it all, and the whole of that heavenly day of my life and the whole of that evening I passed in fleeting dreams of how I would arrange it all, and how I would dress all the children, and how I should give her rest, and how I should rescue my own daughter from dishonour and restore her to the bosom of her family, and a great deal more. Quite excusable, sir. Well then, sir." Marmeladov suddenly gave a sort of start, raised his head and gazed intently at his listener. Well, on the very next day, after all those dreams, that is to say, exactly five days ago, in the evening, by a cunning trick, like a thief in the night, I stole from Katerina Ivanovna the key of her box, took out what was left of my earnings, how much it was I have forgotten. And now, look at me, all of you. It's the fifth day since I left home, and they are looking for me there, and it's the end of my employment, and my uniform is lying in a tavern on the Egyptian bridge. I exchange it for the garments I have on. And it's the end of everything." Marmeladov struck his forehead with his fist, clenched his teeth, closed his eyes, and leaned heavily with his elbow on the table. But a minute later his face suddenly changed, and with a certain assumed slyness and affection of bravado he glanced at Raskolnikov, laughed and said, "'This morning I went to see Sonia. I went to ask her for a pick-me-up. <laughs> "'You don't say she gave it to you!' cried one of the newcomers. He shouted the words and went off into a guffaw. "'This very quart was bought with her money.' Marmeladov declared, addressing himself exclusively to Raskolnikov. Thirty kopecks she gave me with her own hands, her last, all she had, as I saw. She said nothing. She only looked at me without a word. Not on earth, but up yonder. They grieve over men, they weep, but they don't blame them, they don't blame them. But it hurts more, it hurts more when they don't blame. Thirty kopecks, yes. And maybe she needs them now, eh? What do you think, my dear sir? For now she's got to keep up her appearance. It costs money, that smartness, that special smartness, you know. Do you understand? And there's pomatum, too, you see. She must have things. Petticoats, starched ones, shoes, too. Real jaunty ones to show off her foot when she has to step over a puddle. 
Do you understand, sir, do you understand what all that smartness means? And here I, her own father, here I took thirty kopecks of that money for a drink. And I am drinking it. And I have already drunk it. Come, who will have pity on a man like me, eh? Are you sorry for me, sir, or not? Tell me, sir, are you sorry or not? <laughs> he would have filled his glass, but there was no drink left. The pot was empty. What are you to be pitied for? shouted the tavern keeper, who was again near them. Shouts of laughter and even oaths followed. The laughter and the oaths came from those who were listening, and also from those who had heard nothing, but were simply looking at the figure of the discharged government clerk. To be pitied! Why am I to be pitied? Marmeladov suddenly declaimed, standing up with his arm outstretched, as though he had been only waiting for that question. Why am I to be pitied, you say? Yes, there's nothing to pity me for. I ought to be crucified, crucified on a cross, not pitied. Crucify me, O judge, crucify me, but pity me. And then I will go of myself to be crucified. For it's not merry-making I seek, but tears and tribulation. Do you suppose, you that sell, that this pint of yours has been sweet to me? It was tribulation I sought at the bottom of it, tears and tribulation, and have found it, and I have tasted it. But he will pity us who has pity on all men, who has understood all men and all things. He is the one, he too is the judge. He will come in that day and he will ask, Where is the daughter who gave herself for her cross consumptive stepmother and for the little children of another? Where is the daughter who had pity upon the filthy drunkard, her earthly father, undismayed by his beastliness? And he will say, Come to me, I have already forgiven thee once, I have forgiven thee once. Thy sins which are many are forgiven thee, for thou hast loved much. And he will forgive my Sonia, he will forgive, I know it. I felt it in my heart when I was with her just now, and he will judge and will forgive all the good and the evil, the wise and the meek. And when he has done with all of them, then he will summon us. You too come forth, he will say, come forth, ye drunkards, come forth, ye weak ones, come forth, ye children of shame. And we shall all come forth, without shame, and shall stand before him. And he will say unto us, Ye are swine, made in the image of the beast, and with his mark but come ye also. And the wise ones and those of understanding will say, O Lord, why dost thou receive these men? And he will say, This is why I receive them, O ye wise, this is why I receive them, O ye of understanding, that not one of them believed himself to be worthy of this. And he will hold out his hands to us, and we shall fall down before him, and we shall weep, and we shall understand all things then we shall understand all, and all will understand, Katerina Ivanovna even, she will understand. Lord, thy kingdom come!" And he sank down on the bench exhausted and helpless, looking at no one, apparently oblivious of his surroundings and plunged in deep thought. His words had created a certain impression. There was a moment of silence, but soon laughter and oaths were heard again. That's his notion. Talked himself silly. A fine clerk he is. And so on, and so on. Let us go, sir, said Marmeladov all at once, raising his head and addressing Raskolnikov. Come along with me. Kozel's house, looking out into the yard. I'm going to Katerina Ivanovna. Time I did. Raskolnikov had for some time been wanting to go, and he had meant to help him. Marmeladov was much unsteadier on his legs than in his speech, and leaned heavily on the young man. They had two or three hundred paces to go. The drunken man was more and more overcome by dismay and confusion as they drew nearer the house. "'It's not Katerina Ivanovna I'm afraid of now,' he muttered in agitation, "'and that she will begin pulling my hair. What does my hair matter? Bother my hair!' 
that's what I say. Indeed, it will be better if she does begin pulling it, that's not what I'm afraid of. It's her eyes I am afraid of. Yes, her eyes. The red on her cheeks, too, frightens me. And her breathing, too. Have you noticed how people in that disease breathe, when they are excited? I am frightened of the children's crying, too. For if Sonia has not taken them food, I don't know what's happened. I don't know. But blows I am not afraid of. No, sir, that such blows are not a pain to me, but even an enjoyment. In fact, I can't get on without it. It's better so. Let her strike me. It relieves her heart. It's better so. There is the house. The house of Kozel, the cabinet-maker, a German, well-to-do. Lead the way. They went in from the yard and up to the fourth story. The staircase got darker and darker as they went up. It was nearly eleven o'clock, and although in summer in Petersburg there is no real night, yet it was quite dark at the top of the stairs. A grimy little door at the very top of the stairs stood ajar. A very poor-looking room about ten paces long was lighted up by a candle-end. The whole of it was visible from the entrance. It was all in disorder, littered up with rags of all sorts, especially children's garments. Across the furthest corner was stretched a ragged sheet. Behind it, probably, was the bed. There was nothing in the room except two chairs and a sofa covered with American leather, full of holes, before which stood an old deal kitchen table, unpainted and uncovered. At the edge of the table stood a smoldering tallow candle in an iron candlestick. It appeared that the family had a room to themselves, not part of a room, but their room was practically a passage. The door leading to the other rooms, or rather cupboards, into which Amelia Lepershevel's flat was divided, stood half open, and there was shouting, uproar, and laughter within. People seemed to be playing cards and drinking tea there. Words of the most unceremonious kind flew out from time to time. Raskolnikov recognized Katerina Ivanovna at once. She was a rather tall, slim, and graceful woman, terribly emaciated with magnificent dark brown hair and with a hectic flush in her cheeks. She was pacing up and down in her little room, pressing her hands against her chest. Her lips were parched, and her breathing came in nervous, broken gasps. Her eyes glittered as in fever, and looked about with a harsh, immovable stare. And that consumptive and excited face with the last flickering light of the candle-end playing upon it made a sickening impression. She seemed to Raskolnikov about thirty years old, and was certainly a strange wife for Marmeladov. She had not heard them and did not notice them coming in. She seemed to be lost in thought, hearing and seeing nothing. The room was close, but she had not opened the window. A stench rose from the staircase, but the door onto the stairs was not closed. From the inner rooms clouds of tobacco smoke floated in. She kept coughing, but did not close the door. The youngest child, a girl of six, was asleep, sitting curled up on the floor with her head on the sofa. A boy a year older stood crying and shaking in the corner, probably he had just had a beating. Beside him stood a girl of nine years old, tall and thin, wearing a thin and ragged chemise with an ancient cashmere pelisse flung over her bare shoulders, long outgrown and barely reaching her knees. Her arm, as thin as a stick, was round her brother's neck. She was trying to comfort him, whispering something to him, and doing all she could to keep him from whimpering again. At the same time her large dark eyes, which looked larger still from the thinness of her frightened face, were watching her mother with alarm. Marmeladov did not enter the door, but dropped on his knees in the very doorway, pushing Raskolnikov in front of him. The woman, seeing a stranger, stopped indifferently facing him coming to herself for a moment and apparently wondering what he had come for. But evidently she decided that he was going into the next room, as he had to pass through hers to get there. Taking no further notice of him, she walked towards the outer door to close it, and uttered a sudden scream on seeing her husband on his knees in the doorway. "'Ah!' she cried out in a frenzy. "'He has come back! The criminal! The monster! And where is the money? What's in your pocket? Show me!' and your clothes are all different. Where are your clothes? Where is the money? Speak!" 
she fell to searching him. Marmeladov submissively and obediently held up both arms to facilitate the search. Not a farthing was there. "'Where is the money?' she cried. "'Mercy on us! Can he have drunk it all? There were twelve silver roubles left in the chest!' And in a fury she seized him by the hair and dragged him into the room. Marmeladov seconded her efforts by meekly crawling along on his knees. "'And this is a consolation to me. This does not hurt me, but is a positive consolation, honoured sir,' he called out, shaken to and fro by his hair and even once striking the ground with his forehead. The child asleep on the floor woke up and began to cry. The boy in the corner, losing all control, began trembling and screaming and rushing to his sister in violent terror, almost in a fit. The eldest girl was shaking like a leaf. "'He's drunk it! He's drunk it all!' the poor woman screamed in despair. "'And his clothes are gone! And they're hungry! Hungry!' And wringing her hands she pointed to the children. "'Oh, a curse at life! And you, are you not ashamed?' She pounced all at once upon Roskelnikov. "'From the tavern! Have you been drinking with him? Have you been drinking with him, too? Go away!' The young man was hastening away without uttering a word. The inner door was thrown wide open, and inquisitive faces were peering in at it. Coarse laughing faces with pipes and cigarettes and heads wearing caps thrust themselves in at the doorway. Further in could be seen figures in dressing-gowns flung open, and costumes of unseemly scantiness, some of them with cards in their hands. They were particularly diverted when Marmeladov, dragged about by his hair, shouted that it was a consolation to him. They even began to come into the room. At last a sinister shrill outcry was heard. This came from Amelia Lepochevel herself, pushing her way amongst them and trying to restore order after her own fashion, and for the hundredth time to frighten the poor woman by ordering her with coarse abuse to clear out of the room next day. As he went out, Raskolnikov had time to put his hand into his pocket, to snatch up the coppers he had received in exchange for his rouble in the tavern, and to lay them unnoticed on the window. Afterwards on the stairs he changed his mind and would have gone back. "'What a stupid thing I've done!' he thought to himself. They have Sonia, and I want it myself. But reflecting that it would be impossible to take it back now, and that in any case he would not have taken it, he dismissed it with a wave of his hand and went back to his lodging. "'Sonia wants pomatum, too,' he said, as he walked along the street, and he laughed malignantly. "'And such smartness costs money. Hm! And maybe Sonia herself will be bankrupt today, for there is always a risk hunting big game, digging for gold. Then they would all be without a crust tomorrow except for my money. Hurrah for Sonia! What a mine they've dug there! And they're making the best of it. Yes, they are making the most of it. They've wept over it and grown used to it. Man grows used to everything, the scoundrel!" He sank into thought. "'And what if I am wrong?' he cried suddenly, after a moment's thought. What if man is not really a scoundrel, man in general, I mean, the whole race of mankind? Then all the rest is prejudice, simply artificial terrors, and there are no barriers, and it's all as it should be. End of Part 1, Chapter 2 Part 1, Chapter 3 of Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky Translated by Constance Garnett 1861 to 1946. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part One, Chapter Three. He waked up late next day after a broken sleep, but his sleep had not refreshed him. He waked up bilious, irritable, ill-tempered, and looked with hatred at his room. It was a tiny cupboard of a room about six paces in length. It had a poverty-stricken appearance, with its dusty yellow paper peeling off the walls, and it was so low-pitched that a man of more than average height was ill at ease in it and felt every moment that he would knock his head against the ceiling. The furniture was in keeping with the room. There were three old chairs, rather rickety, a painted table in the corner on which lay a few manuscripts and books, 
The dust that lay thick upon them showed that they had been long untouched. A big clumsy sofa occupied almost the whole of one wall and half the floor space of the room. It was once covered with chintz, but was now in rags and served Raskolnikov as a bed. Often he went to sleep on it, as he was, without undressing, without sheets, wrapped in his old student's overcoat, with his head on one little pillow under which he heaped up all the linen he had, clean and dirty, by way of a bolster. A little table stood in front of the sofa. It would have been difficult to sink to a lower ebb of disorder, but to Raskolnikov in his present state of mind this was positively agreeable. He had got completely away from everyone, like a tortoise in its shell, and even the sight of a servant-girl who had to wait upon him and look sometimes into his room made him writhe with nervous irritation. He was in the condition that overtakes some monomaniacs entirely concentrated upon one thing. His landlady had for the last fortnight given up sending him in meals, and he had not yet thought of expostulating with her, though he went without his dinner. Nastasia, the cook and only servant, was rather pleased at the lodger's mood, and had entirely given up sweeping and doing his room, only once a week or so she would stray into his room with a broom. She waked him up that day. "'Get up! Why are you asleep?' she called to him. "'It's past nine. I have brought you some tea. Will you have a cup? I should think you're fairly starving.' Raskolnikov opened his eyes, started, and recognized Nastasia. "'From the landlady, eh?' he asked, slowly and with a sickly face sitting up on the sofa. "'From the landlady, indeed!' She set before him her own cracked teapot full of weak and stale tea, and laid two yellow lumps of sugar by the side of it. "'Here, Nastasia, take it, please,' he said, fumbling in his pocket, for he had slept in his clothes, and taking out a handful of coppers. "'Run and buy me a loaf, and get me a little sausage, the cheapest at the pork-butcher's.' "'The loaf I'll fetch you this very minute, but wouldn't you rather have some cabbage soup instead of sausage?' It's capital soup, yesterday's. I saved it for you yesterday, but you came in late. It's fine soup." When the soup had been brought and he had begun upon it, Nastasia sat down beside him on the sofa and began chatting. She was a country peasant woman and a very talkative one. "'Praskovya Pavlovna means to complain to the police about you,' she said. He scowled. "'To the police? What does she want?' You don't pay her money, and you won't turn out of the room. That's what she wants, to be sure." "'The devil, that's the last straw,' he muttered, grinding his teeth. "'No, that would not suit me, just now. She is a fool,' he added aloud. "'I'll go and talk to her today. Fool she is, and no mistake, just as I am. But why, if you are so clever, do you lie here like a sack and have nothing to show for it? One time you used to go out, you say, to teach children. But why is it you do nothing now?" "'I am doing,' Raskolnikov began sullenly and reluctantly. "'What are you doing?' "'Work.' "'What sort of work?' "'I am thinking,' he answered seriously, after a pause." Nastasia was overcome with a fit of laughter. She was given to laughter, and when anything amused her, she laughed inaudibly, quivering and shaking all over till she felt ill. "'And have you made much money by your thinking?' she managed to articulate at last. "'One can't go out to give lessons without boots, and I'm sick of it. Don't quarrel with your bread and butter. They pay so little for lessons. What's the use of a few coppers?' he answered, reluctantly, as though replying to his own thought. "'And you want to get a fortune all at once?' He looked at her strangely. "'Yes, I want a fortune,' he answered firmly, after a brief pause. "'Don't be in such a hurry. You quite frighten me. Shall I get the loaf or not?' "'As you please.' "'Ah, I forgot. A letter came for you yesterday when you were out.' "'A letter?' For me? From whom? I can't say. I gave three kopecks of my own to the postman for it. Will you pay me back?" 
Then bring it to me, for God's sake, bring it!" cried Raskolnikov, greatly excited. Good God! A minute later the letter was brought him. That was it, from his mother, from the province of R. He turned pale when he took it. It was a long while since he had received a letter, but another feeling also suddenly stabbed his heart. Nastasia, leave me alone, for goodness' sake. Here are your three kopecks, but for goodness' sake, make haste and go!" The letter was quivering in his hand. He did not want to open it in her presence. He wanted to be left alone with his letter. When Nastasia had gone out, he lifted it quickly to his lips and kissed it. Then he gazed intently at the address, the small, sloping handwriting, so dear and familiar, of the mother who had once taught him to read and write. He delayed. He seemed almost afraid of something. At last he opened it. It was a thick, heavy letter, weighing over two ounces. Two large sheets of notepaper were covered with very small handwriting. "'My dear Rodja," wrote his mother, "'it's two months since I last had a talk with you by letter which has distressed me and even kept me awake at night thinking. But I am sure you will not blame me for my inevitable silence. You know how I love you. You are all we have to look to, Donya and I. You are our all, our one hope, our one stay. What a grief it was to me when I heard that you had given up the university some months ago for want of means to keep yourself, and that you had lost your lessons and your other work. How could I help you out of my hundred and twenty roubles a year pension? The fifteen roubles I sent you four months ago I borrowed, as you know, on security of my pension, from Vasily Ivanovich Vorushin, a merchant of this town. He is a kind-hearted man and was a friend of your father's, too. But having given him the right to receive the pension, I had to wait till the debt was paid off, and that is only just done, so that I've been unable to send you anything all this time. But now, thank God, I believe I shall be able to send you something more, and in fact we may congratulate ourselves on our good fortune now, of which I hasten to inform you. In the first place, would you have guessed, dear Rodya, that your sister has been living with me for the last six weeks and we shall not be separated in the future? Thank God, her sufferings are over, but I will tell you everything in order, so that you may know just how everything has happened and all that we have hitherto concealed from you. When you wrote to me two months ago that you had heard that Donya had a great deal to put up with in the Svidrigailov's house, when you wrote that and asked me to tell you all about it, what could I write in answer to you? If I had written the whole truth to you, I dare say you would have thrown up everything and have come to us, even if you had to walk all the way, for I know your character and your feelings, and you would not let your sister be insulted. I was in despair myself, but what could I do? and besides, I did not know the whole truth myself then. What made it all so difficult was that Donya received a hundred roubles in advance when she took the place as governess in their family, on condition of part of her salary being deducted every month. And so it was impossible to throw up the situation without repaying the debt. This sum, now I can explain it all to you, my precious Rodya, she took chiefly in order to send you sixty roubles, which you needed so terribly then, and which you received from us last year. We deceived you then, writing that this money came from Donya's savings, but that was not so, and now I tell you all about it, because, thank God, things have suddenly changed for the better. And that you may know how Donya loves you and what a heart she has. At first, indeed, Mr. Svidrigailov treated her very rudely, and used to make disrespectful and jeering remarks at table. But I don't want to go into all these painful details, so as not to worry you for nothing when it is now all over. In short, in spite of the kind and generous behavior of Marfa Petrovna, Mr. Svidrigailov's wife, and all the rest of the household, Donya had a very hard time, especially when Mr. Svidrigailov, relapsing into his old regimental habits, was under the influence of Bacchus. And how do you think it was all explained later on? Would you believe that the crazy fellow had conceived a passion for Donya from the beginning, but had concealed it under a show of rudeness and contempt? 
Possibly he was ashamed and horrified himself at his own flighty hopes, considering his years and his being the father of a family, and that made him angry with Donia. And possibly, too, he hoped by his rude and sneering behavior to hide the truth from others. But at last he lost all control and had the face to make Donia an open and shameful proposal, promising her all sorts of inducements and offering besides to throw up everything and take her to another estate of his, or even abroad. You can imagine all she went through. To leave her situation at once was impossible, not only on account of the money debt, but also to spare the feelings of Marfa Petrovna, whose suspicions would have been aroused. And then Donia would have been the cause of a rupture in the family. And it would have meant a terrible scandal for Donia, too. That would have been inevitable. There were various other reasons owing to which Donia could not hope to escape from that awful house for another six weeks. You know Donia, of course. You know how clever she is and what a strong will she has. Donia can endure a great deal, and even in the most difficult cases she has the fortitude to maintain her firmness. She did not even write to me about everything for fear of upsetting me, although we were constantly in communication. It all ended very unexpectedly. Marfa Petrovna accidentally overheard her husband imploring Donia in the garden, and putting quite a wrong interpretation on the position, threw the blame upon her, believing her to be the cause of it all. An awful scene took place between them on the spot in the garden. Marfa Petrovna went so far as to strike Donia, refused to hear anything and was shouting at her for a whole hour, and then gave orders that Donia should be packed off at once to me in a plain peasant's cart, into which they flung all her things, her linen and her clothes, all pell-mell without folding it up and packing it. And a heavy shower of rain came on too, and Donia, insulted and put to shame, had to drive with a peasant in an open cart all the seventeen versts into town. Only think now what answer could I have sent to the letter I received from you two months ago, and what could I have written? I was in despair. I dare not write to you the truth, because you would have been very unhappy, mortified, and indignant, and yet what could you do? You could only perhaps ruin yourself, and besides, Donia would not allow it and fill up my letter with trifles when my heart was so full of sorrow I could not. For a whole month the town was full of gossip about this scandal, and it came to such a pass that Donia and I dare not even go to church on account of the contemptuous looks, whispers, and even remarks made aloud about us. All our acquaintances avoided us, nobody even bowed to us in the street. And I learnt that some shopmen and clerks were intending to insult us in a shameful way, smearing the gates of our house with pitch, so that the landlord began to tell us we must leave. All this was set going by Marfa Petrovna, who managed to slander Donia and throw dirt at her in every family. She knows everyone in the neighborhood, and that month she was continually coming into the town, and as she is rather talkative and fond of gossiping about her family affairs, and particularly of complaining to all and each of her husband, which is not at all right, so in a short time she had spread her story not only in the town, but over the whole surrounding district. It made me ill, but Donia bore it better than I did, and if only you could have seen how she endured it all and tried to comfort me and cheer me up. She is an angel, but by God's mercy our sufferings were cut short. Mr. Svidrigailov returned to his senses and repented, and, probably feeling sorry for Donia, he laid before Marfa Petrovna a complete and unmistakable proof of Donia's innocence, in the form of a letter Donia had been forced to write and give to him, before Marfa Petrovna came upon them in the garden. This letter, which remained in Mr. Svidrigailov's hands after her departure, she had written to refuse personal explanations and secret interviews, for which he was entreating her. In that letter she reproached him with great heat and indignation for the baseness of his behavior in regard to Marfa Petrovna, reminding him that he was the father and head of a family, and telling him how infamous it was of him to torment and make unhappy a defenseless girl, unhappy enough already. Indeed, dear Rodya, 
The letter was so nobly and touchingly written that I sobbed when I read it, and to this day I cannot read it without tears. Moreover, the evidence of the servants, too, cleared Doña's reputation. They had seen and known a great deal more than Mr. Svidrigailov had himself supposed, as indeed is always the case with servants. Marfa Petrovna was completely taken aback, and again crushed, as she said herself to us, but she was completely convinced of Doña's innocence. The very next day, being Sunday, she went straight to the cathedral, knelt down and prayed with tears to Our Lady to give her strength to bear this new trial and to do her duty. Then she came straight from the cathedral to us, told us the whole story, wept bitterly and fully penitent, she embraced Doña and besought her to forgive her. The same morning, without any delay, she went round to all the houses in the town and everywhere, shedding tears. She asserted in the most flattering terms Doña's innocence, and the nobility of her feelings and her behavior. What was more, she showed and read to everyone the letter in Doña's own handwriting to Mr. Svidrigailov, and even allowed them to take copies of it, which, I must say, I think was superfluous. In this way she was busy for several days in driving about the whole town, because some people had taken offence through precedence having been given to others. And therefore they had to take turns, so that in every house she was expected before she arrived, and every one knew that on such and such a day Marfa Petrovna would be reading the letter in such and such a place, and people assembled for every reading of it even many who had heard it several times already both in their own houses and in other people's. In my opinion a great deal, a very great deal of all this was unnecessary. But that's Marfa Petrovna's character. Anyway, she succeeded in completely re-establishing Doña's reputation, and the whole ignominy of this affair rested as an indelible disgrace upon her husband, as the only person to blame, so that I really began to feel sorry for him it was really treating the crazy fellow too harshly. Doña was at once asked to give lessons in several families, but she refused. All of a sudden everyone began to treat her with marked respect, and all this did much to bring about the event by which, one may say, our whole fortunes are now transformed. You must know, dear Rodya, that Doña has a suitor, and that she has already consented to marry him. I hasten to tell you all about the matter and though it has been arranged without asking your consent, I think you will not be aggrieved with me or with your sister on that account, for you will see that we could not wait and put off our decision till we heard from you. And you could not have judged all the facts without being on the spot. This is how it happened. He is already of the rank of a counsellor, Pyotr Petrovich Luzhin, and is distantly related to Marfa Petrovna, who has been very active in bringing the match about. He began with his expressing through her his desire to make our acquaintance. He was properly received, drank coffee with us, and the very next day he sent us a letter in which he very courteously made an offer, and begged for a speedy and decided answer. He is a very busy man, and is in a great hurry to get to Petersburg, so that every moment is precious to him. At first, of course, we were greatly surprised, as it had all happened so quickly and unexpectedly. We thought and talked it over the whole day. He is a well-to-do man, to be depended upon, he has two posts in the government, and has already made his fortune. It is true that he is forty-five years old, but he is of a fairly prepossessing appearance, and might still be thought attractive by women. And he is altogether a very respectable and presentable man, only he seems a little morose and somewhat conceited but possibly that may only be the impression he makes at first sight. And beware, dear Rodya, when he comes to Petersburg, as he shortly will do, beware of judging him too hastily and severely as your way is, if there is anything you do not like in him at first sight. I give you this warning, although I feel sure that he will make a favorable impression upon you. Moreover, in order to understand any man, one must be deliberate and careful to avoid forming prejudices and mistaken ideas, which are very difficult to correct and get over afterwards. And Pyotr Petrovich, judging by many indications, is a thoroughly estimable man. 
At his first visit, indeed, he told us that he was a practical man, but he still shares, as he expressed it, many of the convictions of our most rising generation, and he is an opponent of all prejudices. He said a good deal more, for he seems a little conceited and likes to be listened to, but this is scarcely a vice. I, of course, understood very little of it, but Doña explained to me that, though he is not a man of great education, he is clever and seems to be good-natured. You know your sister's character, Rodya. She is a resolute, sensible, patient and generous girl, but she has a passionate heart, as I know very well. Of course there is no great love either on his side or on hers, but Doña is a clever girl and has the heart of an angel, and will make it her duty to make her husband happy who on his side will make her happiness his care. Of that we have no good reason to doubt, though it must be admitted the matter has been arranged in great haste. Besides, he is a man of great prudence, and will see to be sure of himself that his own happiness will be the more secure, the happier Doña is with him. And as for some defects of character, for some habits and even certain differences of opinion, which indeed are inevitable even in the happiest marriages. Doña has said that, as regards all that, she relies on herself, that there is nothing to be uneasy about, and that she is ready to put up with a great deal if only their future relationship can be an honourable and straightforward one. He struck me, for instance, at first, as rather abrupt, but that may well come from his being an outspoken man, and that is no doubt how it is. For instance, at his second visit, after he had received Doña's consent, in the course of conversation he declared that, before making Doña's acquaintance, he had made up his mind to marry a girl of good reputation, without dowry, and above all, one who had experienced poverty, because, as he explained, a man ought not to be indebted to his wife, but that it is better for a wife to look upon her husband as her benefactor. I must add that he expressed it more nicely and politely than I have done for I have forgotten his actual phrases and only remember the meaning. And besides, it was obviously not said of a design, but slipped out in the heat of conversation, so that he tried afterwards to correct himself and smooth it over, but all the same it did strike me as somewhat rude, and I said so afterwards to Doña. But Doña was vexed, and answered that words are not deeds, and that, of course, is perfectly true. Doña did not sleep all night before she made up her mind and thinking that I was asleep, she got out of bed and was walking up and down the room all night. At last she knelt down before the icon and prayed long and fervently, and in the morning she told me that she had decided. I have mentioned already that Pyotr Petrovitch is just setting off for Petersburg, where he has a great deal of business, and he wants to open a legal bureau. He has been occupied for many years in conducting civil and commercial litigation and only the other day he won an important case. He has to be in Petersburg because he has an important case before the Senate. So, Rodya dear, he may be of greatest use to you in every way indeed, and Doña and I have agreed that from this very day you could definitely enter upon your career and might consider that your fortune is marked out and assured for you. Oh, if only this comes to pass! This would be such a benefit that we could only look upon it as a providential blessing. Doña is dreaming of nothing else. We have even ventured already to drop a few words on the subject to Pyotr Petrovitch. He was cautious in his answer, and said that, of course, as he could not get on without a secretary, it would be better to be paying a salary to a relation than to a stranger, if only the former were fitted for the duties, as though there could be doubt of your being fitted but then he expressed doubts whether your studies at the university would leave you time for work at his office. The matter dropped for the time, but Doña is thinking of nothing else now. She has been in a sort of fever for the last few days, and has already made a regular plan for your becoming in the end an associate and even a partner in Pyotr Petrovitch's business, which might well be, seeing that you are a student of law. I am in complete agreement with her, Rodya and share all her plans and hopes, and think there is every probability of realizing them. And in spite of Pyotr Petrovitch's evasiveness, very natural at present, since he does not know you, 
Donia is firmly persuaded that she will gain everything by her good influence over her future husband. This she is reckoning upon. Of course we are careful not to talk of any of these more remote plans to Pyotr Petrovitch, especially of your becoming his partner. He is a practical man and might take this very coldly. It might all seem to him simply a daydream. Nor has either Donia or I breathed a word to him of the great hopes we have of his helping us to pay for your university studies. We have not spoken of it in the first place, because it will come to pass of itself later on, and he will no doubt, without wasting words, offer to do it of himself, as though he could refuse Donia that, the more readily since you may be by your own efforts become his right hand in the office, and receive this assistance not as a charity, but as a salary earned by your own work. Donia wants to arrange it all like this, and I quite agree with her. And we have not spoken of our plans for another reason, that is, because I particularly wanted you to feel on equal footing when you first meet him. When Donia spoke to him with enthusiasm about you, he answered that one could never judge of a man without seeing him close, for oneself, and that he looked forward to forming his own opinion when he makes your acquaintance. Do you know, my precious Rodya, I think that perhaps for some reasons, nothing to do with Pyotr Petrovitch though, simply for my own personal, perhaps old womanish fancies, I should do better to go on living by myself, apart, than with them after the wedding. I am convinced that he will be generous and delicate enough to invite me and to urge me to remain with my daughter for the future, and if he has said nothing about it hitherto, it is simply because it has been taken for granted. But I shall refuse. I have noticed more than once in my life that husbands don't quite get on with their mothers-in-law, and I don't want to be the least bit in anyone's way, and for my own sake too would rather be quite independent, so long as I have a crust of bread of my own and such children as you and Donia. If possible, I would settle somewhere near you, for the most joyful piece of news, dear Rodya, I have kept for the end of my letter. Know then, my dear boy, that we may perhaps be all together in a very short time and may embrace one another again after a separation of almost three years. It is settled for certain that Donia and I are to set off for Petersburg, exactly when I don't know, but very, very soon, possibly in a week. It all depends on Pyotr Petrovitch, who will let us know when he has had time to look round him in Petersburg. To suit his own arrangements, he is anxious to have his ceremony as soon as possible, even before the fast of Our Lady if it could be managed, or if that is too soon to be ready, immediately after. Oh, with what happiness I shall press you to my heart! Donia is all excitement at the joyful thought of seeing you. She said one day in joke that she would be ready to marry Pyotr Petrovitch for that alone. She is an angel. She is not writing anything to you now, and has only told me to write that she has so much, so much to tell you, that she is not going to take up her pen now for a few lines that would tell you nothing, and it would only mean upsetting herself. She bids me send you her love and innumerable kisses. But although we shall be meeting so soon, perhaps I shall send you as much money as I can in a day or two. Now that everyone has heard that Donia is to marry Pyotr Petrovitch, my credit has suddenly improved, and I know that Afanasy Ivanovitch will trust me now even to seventy-five roubles on the security of my pension so that perhaps I shall be able to send you twenty-five or even thirty roubles. I would send you more, but I am uneasy about our travelling expenses, for though Pyotr Petrovitch has been so kind as to undertake part of the expenses of the journey, that is to say, he has taken upon himself the conveyance of our bags and big trunk, which will be conveyed through some acquaintances of his, we must reckon upon some expense on our arrival in Petersburg, where we can't be left without a halfpenny at least for the first few days. But we have calculated it all, Donia and I, to the last penny, and we see that the journey will not cost very much. It is only ninety versts from us to the railway, and we have come to an agreement with a driver we know, so as to be in readiness. And from there Donia and I can travel quite comfortably third class. So that I may very likely be able to send to you not twenty-five, but thirty roubles. But enough. I have covered two sheets already, and there is no space left for more. Our whole history, but so many events have happened. And now, my precious Rodya, 
I embrace you and send you a mother's blessing till we meet. Love Doña your sister Rodya. Love her as she loves you and understand that she loves you beyond everything, more than herself. She is an angel, and you, Rodya, you are everything to us, our one hope, our one consolation. If only you are happy, we shall be happy. Do you still say your prayers, Rodya, and believe in the mercy of our Creator and our Redeemer? I am afraid in my heart that you may have been visited by the new spirit of infidelity that is abroad today. If it is so, I pray for you. Remember, dear boy, how in your childhood, when your father was living, you used to lisp your prayers at my knee, and how happy we all were in those days. Good-bye till we meet then. I embrace you warmly, warmly, with many kisses. Yours till death, Pocheria Raskolnikov. Almost from the first, when he read the letter, Raskolnikov's face was wet with tears. But when he finished it, his face was pale and distorted and a bitter, wrathful, and malignant smile was on his lips. He had laid his head down on his threadbare dirty pillow and pondered, pondered a long time. His heart was beating violently, and his brain was in a turmoil. At last he felt cramped and stifled in the little yellow room that was like a cupboard or a box. His eyes and his mind craved for space. He took up his hat and went out, this time without dread of meeting anyone. He had forgotten his dread. He turned in the direction of the Vasilyevsky Ostrov, walking along Vasilyevsky Prospect, as though hastening on some business. But he walked, as his habit was, without noticing his way, muttering and even speaking aloud to himself, to the astonishment of the passers-by. Many of them took him to be drunk. End of Part 1, Chapter 3 Part 1, Chapter 4 of Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky Translated by Constance Garnett 1861 to 1946. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part One, Chapter Four. His mother's letter had been a torture to him, but as regards the chief fact in it, he had felt not one moment's hesitation, even whilst he was reading the letter. The essential question was settled, and irrevocably settled, in his mind. Never such a marriage while I am alive and Mr. Lusion be damned. The thing is perfectly clear, he muttered to himself, with a malignant smile anticipating the triumph of his decision. No, mother, no, Donya, you won't deceive me, and then they apologize for not asking my advice and for taking the decision without me. I dare say. They imagine it is arranged now and can't be broken off but we will see whether it can or not. A magnificent excuse! Piotr Petrovitch is such a busy man that even his wedding has to be in post-haste, almost by express. No, Donya, I see it all, and I know what you want to say to me, and I know too what you were thinking about when you walked up and down all night, and what your prayers were like before the Holy Mother of Kazan who stands in Mother's bedroom. Bitter is the ascent to Golgotha. Hm. So it is finally settled. You have determined to marry a sensible business man, Avdotya Romanovna, one who has a fortune, has already made his fortune. That is so much more solid and impressive, a man who holds two government posts and who shares the ideas of our more rising generation, as Mother writes, and who seems to be kind, as Donya herself observes. That seems beats everything and that very Donya for that very seems is marrying him. Splendid! Splendid! But I should like to know why Mother has written to me about our most rising generation, simply as a descriptive touch, or with the idea of prepossessing me in favour of Mr. Lusion. Oh, the cunning of them! I should like to know one more thing. How far they were open with one another that day and night and all this time since! Was it put into words, or did both understand that they had the same thing at heart and in their minds, so that there was no need to speak of it aloud, and better not to speak of it? Most likely it was partly like that. From Mother's letter it's evident. He struck her as rude a little, 
and mother in her simplicity took her observations to Donia, and she was sure to be vexed and answered her angrily. I should think so. Who would not be angered when it was quite clear without any naive questions, and when it was understood that it was useless to discuss it? And why does she write to me, Love Donia, Rodia, and she loves you more than herself? Has she a secret conscience prick at sacrificing her daughter to her son? You are our one comfort, you are everything to us. Oh, mother!" His bitterness grew more and more intense, and if he happened to meet Mr. Lusion at the moment he might have murdered him. Hm, yes, that's true, he continued, pursuing the whirling ideas that chased each other in his brain. It is true that it needs time and care to get to know a man. But there is no mistake about Mr. Lusion. The chief thing is he is a man of business and seems kind. That was something, wasn't it, to send the bags and big box for them? A kind man, no doubt, after that. But his bride and her mother are to drive in a peasant's cart covered with sacking. I know, I have been driven in it. No matter. It is only ninety versts, and then they can travel very comfortably third class, for a thousand versts. Quite right, too. One must cut one's coat according to one's cloth. But what about you, Mr. Lusion? She is your bride, and you must be aware that her mother has to raise money on her pension for the journey. To be sure it's a matter of business, a partnership for mutual benefit, with equal shares and expenses food and drink provided, but pay for your tobacco. The businessman has got the better of them, too. The luggage will cost less than their fares and very likely go for nothing. How is it that they don't both see all that? Or is it that they don't want to see? And they are pleased, pleased! And to think that this is only the first blossoming, and that the real fruits are to come! But what really matters is not the stinginess is not the meanness, but the tone of the whole thing. For that will be the tone after marriage, it's a foretaste of it. And mother, too, why should she be so lavish? What will she have by the time she gets to Petersburg? Three silver roubles or two paper ones, as she says? That old woman, hm! What does she expect to live upon in Petersburg afterwards? She has her reasons already for guessing that she could not live with Donia after the marriage, even for the first few months. The good man has no doubt let slip something on that subject also, though mother would deny it. I shall refuse, says she. On whom is she reckoning then? Is she counting on what is left of her hundred and twenty roubles of pension when Afanasy Ivanovitch's debt is paid? She knits woolen shawls and embroiders cuffs ruining her old eyes. And all her shawls don't add more than twenty roubles a year to her hundred and twenty, I know that. So she is building all her hopes all the time on Mr. Lusion's generosity. He will offer it of himself, he will press it on me. You may wait a long time for that. That's how it always is with these Schilleresque noble hearts. Till the last moment every goose is a swan with them, till the last moment, they hope for the best and will see nothing wrong, and although they have an inkling of the other side of the picture, yet they won't face the truth till they are forced to. The very thought of it makes them shiver. They thrust the truth away with both hands, until the man they deck out in false colors puts a fool's cap on them with his own hands. I should like to know whether Mr. Lusion has any orders of merit. I bet he has the Anna in his buttonhole and that he puts it on when he goes to dine with contractors or merchants. He will be sure to have it for his wedding, too. Enough of him, confound him!" Well, mother, I don't wonder at. It's like her, God bless her, but how could Donia? Donia, darling, as though I did not know you! You were nearly twenty when I saw you last. I understood you then. Mother writes that Donia can put up with a great deal. I know that very well. I knew that two years and a half ago, and for the last two and a half years I have been thinking about it, thinking of just that, that Donia can put up with a great deal. If she could put up with Mr. Svidrigailov and all the rest of it, she certainly can put up with a great deal. 
and now mother and she have taken it into their heads that she can put up with Mr. Lusion, who propounds the theory of the superiority of wives raised from destitution and owing everything to their husband's bounty, who propounds it, too, almost at the first interview. Granted that he let it slip, though he is a sensible man, yet maybe it was not a slip at all, but he meant to make himself clear as soon as possible. But Donia, Donia, She understands the man, of course, but she will have to live with the man. Why, she'd live on black bread and water, she would not sell her soul, she would not barter her moral freedom for comfort. She would not barter it for all Schleswig-Holstein, much less Mr. Lusian's money. No, Donia was not that sort when I knew her, and she is still the same, of course. Yes, there's no denying, the Svidrigailovs are a bitter pill. It's a bitter thing to spend one's life a governess in the provinces for two hundred roubles, but I know she would rather be a nigger on a plantation or a let with a German master than degrade her soul, and her moral dignity, by binding herself forever to a man whom she does not respect and with whom she has nothing in common, for her own advantage. And if Mr. Lusian had been of unalloyed gold or one huge diamond, she would never have consented to become his legal concubine. Why is she consenting, then? What's the point of it? What's the answer? It's clear enough. For herself, for her comfort, to save her life she would not sell herself, but for someone else she is doing it. For one she loves, for one she adores, she will sell herself. That's what it all amounts to. For her brother, for her mother she will sell herself. She will sell everything. In such cases we overcome our moral feeling if necessary. Freedom, peace, conscience even, all, all are brought into the market. Let my life go, if only my dear ones may be happy. More than that, we become casuists, we learn to be Jesuitical, and for a time, maybe, we can soothe ourselves, we can persuade ourselves that it is one's duty for a good object. That's just like us. It's as clear as daylight. It's clear that Rodion Romanovich Raskolnikov is the central figure in the business, and no one else. Oh, yes, she can ensure his happiness, keep him in the university, make him a partner in the office, make his whole future secure. Perhaps he may even be a rich man later on, prosperous, respected, and may even end his life a famous man. But my mother? It's all Rodya, precious Rodya, her firstborn. For such a son, who would not sacrifice such a daughter? Oh, loving, over-partial hearts! Why, for his sake, we would not shrink even from Sonia's fate. Sonia, Sonia Marmeladov, the eternal victim so long as the world lasts. Have you taken the measure of your sacrifice, both of you? Is it right? Can you bear it? Is it any use? Is there sense in it? And let me tell you, Donya, Sonya's life is no worse than life with Mr. Lusian. There can be no question of love, mother writes. And what if there can be no respect either, if, on the contrary, there is aversion, contempt, repulsion? What then? So you will have to keep up your appearance, too. Is not that so? Do you understand what that smartness means? Do you understand that the Lucian smartness is just the same thing as Sonia's and may be worse, viler, baser, because in your case, Donia, it's a bargain for luxuries, after all, but with Sonia it's simply a question of starvation. It has to be paid for, it has to be paid for, Donia, this smartness. And what if it's more than you can bear afterwards, if you regret it? the bitterness, the misery, the curses, the tears hidden from all the world, for you are not a Marfa Petrovna. And how will your mother feel then? Even now she is uneasy, she is worried, but then, when she sees it all clearly? And I? Yes, indeed, what have you taken me for? I won't have your sacrifice, Donia, I won't have it, mother. It shall not be, so long as I am alive, it shall not, it shall not. I won't accept it." He suddenly paused in his reflection and stood still. 
It shall not be? But what are you going to do to prevent it? You'll forbid it? And what right have you? What can you promise them on your side to give you such a right? Your whole life, your whole future, you will devote to them when you have finished your studies and obtained a post? Yes, we've heard all that before, and that's all words. But now? Something must be done now, do you understand that? And what are you going to do now? You are living upon them. They borrow on their hundred roubles pension. They borrow from the Svidrigailovs. How are you going to save them from the Svidrigailovs, from Afanasy Ivanovinish Verushin, O oh, future millionaire Zeus, who had arranged their lives for them? In another ten years? In another ten years, mother will be blind with knitting shawls, maybe with weeping, too. She will be worn to a shadow with fasting. And my sister? Imagine for a moment what may have become of your sister in ten years. What may happen to her during those ten years? Can you fancy?" So he tortured himself, fretting himself with such questions, and finding a kind of enjoyment in it. And yet all these questions were not new ones suddenly confronting him. They were old, familiar aches. It was long since they had first begun to grip and rend his heart. Long, long ago his present anguish had its first beginnings. It had waxed and gathered strength. It had matured and concentrated, until it had taken the form of a fearful, frenzied, and fantastic question, which tortured his heart and mind, clamoring insistently for an answer. Now his mother's letter had burst on him like a thunderclap. It was clear that he must not now suffer passively, worrying himself over unsolved questions, but that he must do something, do it at once, and do it quickly. Anyway, he must decide on something, or else. Or throw up life altogether, he cried suddenly in a frenzy. Accept one's lot humbly as it is, once for all, and stifle everything in oneself, giving up all claim to activity, life, and love. Do you understand, sir, do you understand what it means when you have absolutely nowhere to turn? Marmeladov's question came suddenly into his mind for every man must have somewhere to turn." He gave a sudden start. Another thought, that he had had yesterday, slipped back into his mind. But he did not start at the thought recurring to him, for he knew, he had felt beforehand, that it must come back. He was expecting it. Besides, it was not only yesterday's thought. The difference was that a month ago, yesterday even, the thought was a mere dream. But now, now it appeared not a dream at all, it had taken a new, menacing, and quite unfamiliar shape, and he suddenly became aware of this himself. He felt a hammering in his head, and there was a darkness before his eyes. He looked round hurriedly, he was searching for something. He wanted to sit down and he was looking for a seat. He was walking along the Quai Boulevard. There was a seat about a hundred paces in front of him. He walked towards it as fast as he could, but on the way he met with a little adventure which absorbed all his attention. Looking for the seat, he had noticed a woman walking some twenty paces in front of him, but at first he took no more notice of her than of other objects that crossed his path. It had happened to him many times going home not to notice the road by which he was going, and he was accustomed to walk like that. But there was at first sight something so strange about the woman in front of him that gradually his attention was riveted upon her, at first reluctantly and, as it were, resentfully, and then more and more intently. He felt a sudden desire to find out what it was that was so strange about the woman. In the first place, she appeared to be a girl quite young, and she was walking in the great heat bareheaded and with no parasol or gloves waving her arms about in an absurd way. She had on a dress of some light silky material, but put on strangely awry, not properly hooked up, and torn open at the top of the skirt, close to the waist. A great piece was rent and hanging loose. A little kerchief was flung about her bare throat, but lay slanting on one side. The girl was walking unsteadily too, stumbling and staggering from side to side. She drew Raskolnikov's whole attention at last. He overtook the girl at the seat, 
but on reaching it she dropped down on it in the corner. She let her head sink on the back of the seat and closed her eyes, apparently in extreme exhaustion. Looking at her closely, he saw at once that she was completely drunk. It was a strange and shocking sight. He could hardly believe that he was not mistaken. He saw before him the face of a quite young, fair-haired girl, sixteen, perhaps not more than fifteen years old, pretty little face, but flushed and heavy-looking, and, as it were, swollen. The girl seemed hardly to know what she was doing. She crossed one leg over the other, lifting it indecorously, and showed every sign of being unconscious that she was in the street. Raskolnikov did not sit down, but he felt unwilling to leave her, and stood facing her in perplexity. This boulevard was never much frequented, and now at two o'clock, in the stifling heat, it was quite deserted. And yet on the further side of the boulevard, about fifteen paces away, a gentleman was standing on the edge of the pavement. He too would apparently have liked to approach the girl with some object of his own. He too had probably seen her in the distance and had followed her, but found Raskolnikov in his way. He looked angrily at him, though he tried to escape his notice. He stood impatiently biding his time, till the unwelcome man in rags should have moved away. His intentions were unmistakable. The gentleman was a plump, thickly set man, about thirty, fashionably dressed, with a high color, red lips and mustaches. Raskolnikov felt furious. He had a sudden longing to insult this fat dandy in some way. He left the girl for a moment and walked towards the gentleman. "'Hey, you, Svidrigailov! What do you want here?' he shouted, clenching his fists and laughing, spluttering with rage. "'What do you mean?' the gentleman asked sternly, scowling in haughty astonishment. "'Get away! That's what I mean!' "'How dare you, you low fellow!' He raised his cane. Raskolnikov rushed at him with his fists, without reflecting that the stout gentleman was a match for two men like himself. But at that instant someone seized him from behind, and a police constable stood between them. "'That's enough, gentlemen. No fighting, please, in a public place. What do you want? Who are you?' he asked Raskolnikov sternly, noticing his rags. Raskolnikov looked at him intently. He had a straightforward, sensible, soldierly face, with grey moustaches and whiskers. "'You are just the man I want,' Raskolnikov cried, catching at his arm. "'I am a student, Raskolnikov. You may as well know that, too,' he added, addressing the gentleman. "'Come along, I have something to show you.' And taking the policeman by the hand, he drew him towards the seat. "'Look here, hopelessly drunk, and she has just come down the boulevard. There is no telling who and what she is. She does not look like a professional. It's more likely she has been given drink and deceived somewhere, for the first time, you understand? And they've put her out into the street like that. Look at the way her dress is torn, and the way it has been put on. She has been dressed by somebody, she has not dressed herself, and dressed by unpractised hands, by a man's hands, that's evident. And now look there. I don't know that dandy with whom I was going to fight, I see him for the first time but he too has seen her on the road, just now, drunk, not knowing what she is doing, and now he is very eager to get hold of her, to get her away somewhere while she is in this state. That's certain, believe me, I am not wrong. I saw him myself watching her and following her, but I prevented him, and he is just waiting for me to go away. Now he has walked away a little and is standing still, pretending to make a cigarette. Think how we can keep her out of his hands, and how are we going to get her home?" The policeman saw it all in a flash. The stout gentleman was easy to understand. He turned to consider the girl. The policeman bent over to examine her more closely, and his face worked with genuine compassion. "'Ah, what a pity!' he said, shaking his head. "'Why, she is quite a child. She has been deceived, you can see that at once.' "'Listen, lady!' he began addressing her. Where do you live? The girl opened her weary and sleepy-looking eyes, gazed blankly at the speaker, and waved her hand. Here, said Raskolnikov, feeling in his pocket and finding twenty kopecks. Here, call a cab and tell him to drive her to her address. The only thing is to find out her address. 
Missy, Missy, the policeman began again, taking the money. I'll fetch you a cab and take you home myself. Where shall I take you, eh? Where do you live? Go away. They won't let me alone, the girl muttered and once more waved her hand. Ach, ach, how shocking! It's shameful, Missy, it's a shame! He shook his head again, shocked, sympathetic, and indignant. It's a difficult job, the policeman said to Raskolnikov, and as he did so, he looked him up and down in a rapid glance. He too must have seemed a strange figure to him, dressed in rags and handing him money. Did you meet her far from here? he asked him. I tell you, she was walking in front of me, staggering, just here in the boulevard. She only just reached the seat and sank down on it. Ah, the shameful things that are done in the world nowadays! God have mercy on us! An innocent creature like that, drunk already! She has been deceived, that's a sure thing! See how her dress has been torn, too! Ah, the vice one sees nowadays! And as likely as not, she belongs to gentlefolk, too! Poor ones, maybe. There are many like that nowadays. She looks refined, too, as though she were a lady." And he bent over her once more. Perhaps he had daughters growing up like that, looking like ladies and refined, with pretensions to gentility and smartness. "'The chief thing is,' Raskolnikov persisted, "'to keep her out of this scoundrel's hands. Why should he outrage her? It's as clear as day what he is after. Ah, the brute! He is not moving off!" Raskolnikov spoke aloud and pointed to him. The gentleman heard him and seemed about to fly into a rage again, but thought better of it and confined himself to a contemptuous look. He then walked slowly another ten paces away and again halted. "'Keep her out of his hands we can,' said the constable thoughtfully, "'if only she'd tell us where to take her. But as it is... Missy! Hey! Missy!' He bent over her once more. She opened her eyes fully all of a sudden, looked at him intently, as though realizing something, got up from the seat and walked away in the direction from which she had come. "'Oh, shameful wretches! They won't let me alone!' she said, waving her hand again. She walked quickly, though staggering as before. The dandy followed her but along another avenue, keeping his eye on her. "'Don't be anxious. I won't let him have her,' the policeman said resolutely, and he set off after them. "'Ah, the vice one sees nowadays,' he repeated aloud, sighing. At that moment something seemed to sting Raskolnikov. In an instant a complete revulsion of feeling came over him. "'Hey, here!' he shouted after the policeman. The latter turned round. "'Let them be!' What is it to do with you? Let her go! Let him amuse himself!" He pointed at the dandy. What is it to do with you? The policeman was bewildered and stared at him open-eyed. Raskolnikov laughed. Well! ejaculated the policeman with a gesture of contempt, and he walked after the dandy and the girl, probably taking Raskolnikov for a madman or something even worse. He has carried off my twenty kopecks! Raskolnikov murmured angrily when he was left alone. Well, let him take as much from the other fellow to allow him to have the girl, and so let it end. And why did I want to interfere? Is it for me to help? Have I any right to help? Let them devour each other alive. What is it to me? How did I dare to give him twenty kopecks? Were they mine? In spite of those strange words he felt very wretched. He sat down on the deserted seat. His thoughts strayed aimlessly. He found it hard to fix his mind on anything at that moment. He longed to forget himself altogether, to forget everything, and then to wake up and begin life anew. "'Poor girl,' he said, looking at the empty corner where she had sat. "'She will come to herself and weep, and then her mother will find out. She will give her a beating, a horrible, shameful beating and then maybe turn her out of doors. And even if she does not, the Darya Fransovnas will get wind of it, and the girl will soon be slipping out on the sly here and there. Then there will be the hospital directly. That's always the luck of those girls with respectable mothers who go wrong on the sly. And then, again the hospital. Drink, the taverns, and more hospital, 
in two or three years, a wreck, and her life over at eighteen or nineteen. Have I not seen cases like that? And how have they been brought to it? Why, they've all come to it like that. Ugh! But what does it matter? That's as it should be, they tell us. A certain percentage, they tell us, must every year go. That way, to the devil, I suppose, so that the rest may remain chaste and not be interfered with. A percentage! What splendid words they have! They are so scientific, so consolatory! Once you've said percentage, there's nothing more to worry about! If we had any other word, maybe we might feel more uneasy. But what if Donia were one of the percentage? If another one, if not that one? But where am I going? he thought suddenly. Strange, I came out for something. As soon as I had read the letter I came out. I was going to Vasilyevsky Ostrov, to Razumian. That's what it was. Now I remember. What for, though? And what put the idea of going to Razumian into my head just now? That's curious." He wondered at himself. Razumian was one of his old comrades at the university. It was remarkable that Raskolnikov had hardly any friends at the university. He had kept aloof from everyone, went to see no one, and did not welcome anyone who came to see him, and indeed everyone soon gave him up. He took no part in the students' gatherings, amusements, or conversations. He worked with great intensity without sparing himself and he was respected for this, but no one liked him. He was very poor, and there was a sort of haughty pride and reserve about him, as though he were keeping something to himself. He seemed to some of his comrades to look down upon them all as children, as though he were superior in development, knowledge and convictions, as though their beliefs and interests were beneath him. With Razumian he had got on, or at least he was more unreserved and communicative with him. Indeed it was impossible to be on any other terms with Razumian. He was an exceptionally good-humoured and candid youth, good-natured to the point of simplicity, though both depth and dignity lay concealed under that simplicity. The better of his comrades understood this, and all were fond of him. He was extremely intelligent, though he was certainly rather a simpleton at times. He was of striking appearance, tall, thin, black-haired, and always badly shaved. He was sometimes uproarious and was reputed to be of great physical strength. One night, when out in a festive company, he had with one blow laid a gigantic policeman on his back. There was no limit to his drinking powers, but he could abstain from drink altogether. He sometimes went too far in his pranks, but he could do without pranks altogether. Another thing striking about Razumian, no failure distressed him and it seemed as though no unfavorable circumstances could crush him. He could lodge anywhere, and bear the extremes of cold and hunger. He was very poor, and kept himself entirely on what he could earn by work of one sort or another. He knew of no end of resources by which to earn money. He spent one whole winter without lighting his stove, and used to declare that he liked it better, because one slept more soundly in the cold. For the present he too had been obliged to give up the university, but it was only for a time, and he was working with all his might to save enough to return to his studies again. Raskolnikov had not been able to see him for the last four months, and Razumian did not even know his address. About two months before they had met in the street, but Raskolnikov had turned away and even crossed to the other side that he might not be observed, and though Razumian noticed him he passed him by as he did not want to annoy him. End of Part 1, Chapter 4 Part 1, Chapter 5 of Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky Translated by Constance Garnett, 1861-1946 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Chapter 5 Of course, I've been meaning lately to go to Razumian's to ask for work, to ask him to get me lessons or something," Raskolnikov thought. But what help can he be to me now? Suppose he gets me lessons, suppose he shares his last farthing with me, if he has any farthings, so that I could get some boots and make myself tidy enough to give lessons. Hmm. Well, and what then? 
What shall I do with the few coppers I earn? That's not what I want now. It's really absurd for me to go to Resumian." The question why he was now going to Resumian agitated him even more than he was himself aware. He kept uneasily seeking for some sinister significance in this apparently ordinary action. Could I have expected to set it all straight and to find a way out by means of Resumian alone? he asked himself in perplexity. He pondered and rubbed his forehead, and, strange to say, after long musing, suddenly, as if it were spontaneously and by chance, a fantastic thought came into his head. Hm! To Resumians, he said all at once, calmly, as though he had reached a final determination. I shall go to Resumians, of course, but not now. I shall go to him on the next day after it, when it will be over and everything will begin afresh. And suddenly he realized what he was thinking. After it, he shouted, jumping up from the seat. But is it really going to happen? Is it possible it really will happen? He left the seat and went off almost at a run. He meant to turn back, homewards, but the thought of going home suddenly filled him with intense loathing. In that hole, in that awful little cupboard of his, all this had for a month past been growing up in him, and he walked on at random. His nervous shudder had passed into a fever that made him feel shivering, in spite of the heat he felt cold. With a kind of effort he began almost unconsciously, from some inner craving, to stare at all the objects before him, as though looking for something to distract his attention. But he did not succeed, and kept dropping every moment into brooding. When with a start he lifted his head again and looked round, he forgot at once what he had just been thinking about and even where he was going. In this way he walked right across Vasilyevsky Ostrov, came out onto the Lesser Neva, crossed the bridge and turned towards the islands. The greenness and freshness were at first restful to his weary eyes after the dust of the town and the huge houses that hemmed him in and weighed upon him. Here there were no taverns, no stifling closeness, no stench. But soon these new pleasant sensations passed into morbid irritability. Sometimes he stood still before a brightly painted summer villa standing among green foliage. He gazed through the fence. He saw in the distance smartly dressed women on the verandas and balconies, and children running in the gardens. The flowers especially caught his attention. He gazed at them longer than at anything. He was met too by luxurious carriages and by men and women on horseback. He watched them with curious eyes and forgot about them before they had vanished from his sight. Once he stood still and counted his money. He found he had thirty kopecks. Twenty to the policeman, three to Nastasia for the letter. So I must have given forty-seven or fifty to the Marmeladovs yesterday, he thought, reckoning it up for some unknown reason, but he soon forgot with what object he had taken the money out of his pocket. He recalled it on passing an eating-house or tavern, and felt that he was hungry. Going into the tavern he drank a glass of vodka and ate a pie of some sort. He finished eating it as he walked away. It was a long while since he had taken vodka and it had an effect upon him at once, though he only drank a wine-glass full. His legs felt suddenly heavy and a great drowsiness came upon him. He turned homewards, but reaching Petrovsky Ostrov he stopped, completely exhausted, turned off the road into the bushes, sank down upon the grass and instantly fell asleep. In a morbid condition of the brain dreams often have a singular actuality vividness and extraordinary semblance of reality. At times monstrous images are created, but the setting and the whole picture are so truth-like and filled with details so delicate, so unexpectedly but so artistically consistent, that the dreamer, were he an artist like Pushkin or Turgenev even, could never have invented them in the waking state. Such sick dreams always remain long in the memory and make a powerful impression on the overwrought and deranged nervous system. Raskolnikov had a fearful dream. He dreamt he was back in his childhood in the little town of his birth. He was a child about seven years old, walking into the country with his father on the evening of a holiday. It was a grey and heavy day, 
the country was exactly as he remembered it. Indeed, he recalled it far more vividly in his dream than he had done in memory. The little town stood on a level flat as bare as the hand, not even a willow near it. Only in the far distance a copse lay, a dark blur on the very edge of the horizon. A few paces beyond the last market garden stood a tavern, a big tavern, which had always aroused in him a feeling of aversion, even of fear, when he walked by it with his father. There was always a crowd there, always shouting, laughter and abuse, hideous hoarse singing and often fighting. Drunken and horrible-looking figures were hanging about the tavern. He used to cling close to his father, trembling all over when he met them. Near the tavern the road became a dusty track, the dust of which was always black. It was a winding road, and about a hundred paces further on it turned to the right to the graveyard. In the middle of the graveyard stood a stone church with a green cupola, where he used to go to Mass two or three times a year with his father and mother, when a service was held in memory of his grandmother, who had long been dead and whom he had never seen. On these occasions they used to take on a white dish tied up in a table-napkin a special sort of rice pudding with raisins stuck in it in the shape of a cross. He loved that church, the old-fashioned unadorned icons and the old priest with the shaking head. Near his grandmother's grave, which was marked by a stone, was the little grave of his younger brother who had died at six months old. He did not remember him at all, but he had been told about his little brother, and whenever he visited the graveyard he used religiously and reverently to cross himself and to bow down and kiss the little grave. And now he dreamt that he was walking with his father past the tavern on the way to the graveyard. He was holding his father's hand and looking with dread at the tavern. A peculiar circumstance attracted his attention. There seemed to be some kind of festivity going on. There were crowds of gaily dressed townspeople, peasant women, their husbands, and riffraff of all sorts, all singing and all more or less drunk. Near the entrance of the tavern stood a cart, but a strange cart. It was one of those big carts usually drawn by heavy cart-horses and laden with casks of wine or other heavy goods. He always liked looking at those great cart-horses with their long manes, thick legs, and slow, even pace, drawing along a perfect mountain with no appearance of effort, as though it were easier going with a load than without it. But now, strange to say, in the shafts of such a cart he saw a thin little sorrel beast, one of those peasant nags which he had often seen straining their utmost under a heavy load of wood or hay, especially when the wheels were stuck in the mud or in a rut. And the peasants would beat them so cruelly, sometimes even about the nose and eyes, and he felt so sorry, so sorry for them that he almost cried, and his mother always used to take him away from the window. All of a sudden there was a great uproar of shouting, singing, and the balalaika, and from the tavern a number of big and very drunken peasants came out, wearing red and blue shirts and coats thrown over their shoulders. "'Get in! Get in!' shouted one of them, a young, thick-necked peasant, with a fleshy face red as a carrot. "'I'll take you all! Get in!' But at once there was an outbreak of laughter and exclamations in the crowd. Take us all with a beast like that? Why, Mikolka, are you crazy to put a nag like that in such a cart? And this mare is twenty if she is a day, mates. Get in, I'll take you all, Milkolka shouted again, leaping first into the cart, seizing the reins and standing straight up in front. The bay has gone with Matvi, he shouted from the cart, and this brute, mates, is just breaking my heart. I feel as if I could kill her. She's just eating her head off. Get in, I tell you. I'll make her gallop. She'll gallop." And he picked up the whip, preparing himself with relish to flog the little mare. "'Get in! Come along!' the crowd laughed. "'Do you hear? She'll gallop!' "'Gallop, indeed! She has not had a gallop in her for the last ten years. She'll jog along! Don't you mind her, mates. Bring a whip, each of you. Get ready. All right. Give it to her. They all clambered into Mikolka's cart, laughing and making jokes. Six men got in and there was still room for more. They hauled in a fat, rosy-cheeked woman. 
She was dressed in red cotton, in a pointed, beaded headdress, and thick leather shoes. She was cracking nuts and laughing. The crowd round them was laughing, too, and indeed, how could they help laughing? That wretched nag was to drag all the cartload of them at a gallop. Two young fellows in the cart were just getting whips ready to help Mikolka. With the cry of, Now! the mare tugged with all her might, but far from galloping, could scarcely move forward. She struggled with her legs, gasping and shrinking from the blows of the three whips which were showered upon her like hail. The laughter in the cart and in the crowd was redoubled, but Mikolka flew into a rage and furiously thrashed the mare, as though he supposed she really could gallop. "'Let me get in too, mates!' shouted a young man in the crowd, whose appetite was aroused. "'Get in! All get in!' cried Mikolka. "'She will draw you all! I'll beat her to death!' and he thrashed and thrashed at the mare, beside himself with fury. "'Father! Father!' he cried. "'Father, what are they doing? Father, they are beating the poor horse!' "'Come along, come along,' said his father. "'They are drunken and foolish. They are in fun. Come away, don't look!' And he tried to draw him away, but he tore himself away from his hand, and, beside himself with horror, ran to the horse. The poor beast was in a bad way. She was gasping, standing still, then tugging again and almost falling. "'Beat her to death!' cried Mikolka. "'It's come to that! I'll do for her!' "'What are you about? Are you a Christian, you devil?' shouted an old man in the crowd. "'Did anyone ever see the like? A wretched nag like that pulling such a cartload!' said another. "'You'll kill her!' shouted the third. Don't meddle! It's my property! I'll do what I choose! Get in, more of you! Get in, all of you! I will have her go at a gallop!" All at once laughter broke into a roar and covered everything. The mare, roused by the shower of blows, began feebly kicking. Even the old man could not help smiling. To think of a wretched little beast like that trying to kick! Two lads in the crowd snatched up whips and ran to the mare to beat her about the ribs. One ran each side. "'Hit her in the face! In the eyes! In the eyes!' cried Mikolka. "'Give us a song, mates!' shouted someone in the cart, and everyone in the cart joined in a riotous song, jingling a tambourine and whistling. The woman went on cracking nuts and laughing. He ran beside the mare, ran in front of her saw her being whipped across the eyes, right in the eyes. He was crying, he felt choking, his tears were streaming. One of the men gave him a cut with the whip across the face, he did not feel it. Wringing his hands and screaming, he rushed up to the gray-headed old man with the gray beard, who was shaking his head in disapproval. One woman seized him by the hand and would have taken him away, but he tore himself from her and ran back to the mare. She was almost at the last gasp but began kicking once more. "'I'll teach you to kick!' Mikolka shouted ferociously. He threw down the whip, bent forward and picked up from the bottom of the cart a long, thick shaft. He took hold of one end with both hands and with an effort brandished it over the mare. "'He'll crush her!' was shouted round him. "'He'll kill her!' "'It's my property!' shouted Mikolka and brought the shaft down with a swinging blow. There was a sound of a heavy thud. "'Thrasher! Thrasher! Why have you stopped?' shouted voices in the crowd. And Mikolka swung the shaft a second time, and it fell a second time on the spine of the luckless mare. She sank back on her haunches, but lurched forward and tugged forward with all her force, tugged first on one side and then on the other, trying to move the cart. But the six whips were attacking her in all directions, and the shaft was raised again and fell upon her a third time, then a fourth with heavy measured blows. Mikolka was in a fury that he could not kill her at one blow. "'She's a tough one!' was shouted in the crowd. "'She'll fall in a minute, mates. There will soon be an end of her,' said an admiring spectator in the crowd. "'Fetch an axe to her! Finish her off!' shouted a third. "'I'll show you! Stand off!' Milkoka screamed frantically. He threw down the shaft, stooped down in the cart and picked up an iron crowbar. "'Look out!' he shouted, and with all his might he dealt a stunning blow at the poor mare. The blow fell, 
The mare staggered, sank back, tried to pull, but the bar fell again with a swinging blow on her back and she fell on the ground like a log. "'Finish her off!' shouted Mikolka, and he leapt beside himself, out of the cart. Several young men, also flushed with drink, seized anything they could come across, whips, sticks, poles, and ran to the dying mare. Mikolka stood on one side and began dealing random blows with the crowbar. The mare stretched out her head, drew a long breath, and died. "'You butchered her!' someone shouted in the crowd. "'Why wouldn't she gallop, then?' "'My property!' shouted Mikolka, with bloodshot eyes, brandishing the bar in his hands. He stood as though regretting that he had nothing more to beat. "'No mistake about it, you are not a Christian!' Many voices were shouting in the crowd. But the poor boy, beside himself, made his way screaming through the crowd to the sorrel nag, put his arms around her bleeding dead head and kissed it, kissed the eyes and kissed the lips. Then he jumped up and flew in a frenzy with his little fists out at Mikolka. At that instant his father, who had been running after him, snatched him up and carried him out of the crowd. "'Come along, come, let us go home,' he said to him. Father, why did they kill the poor horse? he sobbed, but his voice broke and the words came in shrieks from his panting chest. They are drunk, they are brutal, it's not our business, said his father. He put his arms round his father, but he felt choked, choked. He tried to draw a breath, to cry out, and woke up. He waked up, gasping for breath, his hair soaked with perspiration, and stood up in terror. Thank God, that was only a dream, he said, sitting down under a tree and drawing deep breaths. But what is it? Is it some fever coming on? Such a hideous dream! He felt utterly broken. Darkness and confusion were in his soul. He rested his elbows on his knees and leaned his head on his hands. Good God, he cried, can it be, can it be, that I shall really take an axe? that I shall strike her on the head, split her skull open, that I shall tread in the sticky warm blood, break the lock, steal and tremble, hide, all spattered in the blood, with the axe? Good God, can it be?" He was shaking like a leaf as he said this. "'But why am I going on like this?' he continued, sitting up again, as it were in profound amazement. "'I knew that I could never bring myself to it. So what have I been torturing myself for till now? Yesterday, yesterday, when I went to make that experiment, yesterday I realized completely that I could never bear to do it. Why am I going over it again, then? Why am I hesitating? As I came down the stairs yesterday, I said myself that it was base, loathsome, vile, vile. The very thought of it made me sick and filled me with horror. No, I couldn't do it, I couldn't do it. Granted, granted that there is no flaw in all that reasoning, that all that I have concluded this last month is clear as day, true as arithmetic. My God! Anyway, I couldn't bring myself to it. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Why, why then, am I still... He rose to his feet, looked round in wonder, as though surprised at finding himself in this place and went towards the bridge. He was pale, his eyes glowed, he was exhausted in every limb, but he seemed suddenly to breathe more easily. He felt he had cast off that fearful burden that had so long been weighing upon him, and all at once there was a sense of relief and peace in his soul. "'Lord,' he prayed, "'show me my path. I renounce that accursed dream of mine.'" Crossing the bridge, he gazed quietly and calmly at the Neva, at the glowing red sun setting in the glowing sky. In spite of his weakness, he was not conscious of fatigue. It was as though an abscess that had been forming for a month past in his heart had suddenly broken. Freedom! Freedom! He was free from that spell, that sorcery, that obsession. Later on, when he recalled that time and all that happened to him during those days, Minute by minute, point by point, he was superstitiously impressed by one circumstance, which, though in itself not very exceptional, always seemed to him afterwards the predestined turning-point of his fate. 
He could never understand and explain to himself why, when he was tired and worn out, when it would have been more convenient for him to go home by the shortest and most direct way, he had returned by the haymarket where he had no need to go. It was obviously and quite unnecessarily out of his way, though not much so. It is true that it happened to him dozens of times to return home without noticing what streets he passed through. But why, he was always asking himself, why had such an important, such a decisive, and at the same time such an absolutely chance meeting happened in the haymarket, where he had, moreover, no reason to go, at the very hour, the very minute of his life, when he was just in the very mood and in the very circumstances in which that meeting was able to exert the gravest and most decisive influence on his whole destiny, as though it had been lying in wait for him on purpose. It was about nine o'clock when he crossed the haymarket. At the tables and the barrows, at the booths and the shops, all the market people were closing their establishments or clearing away and packing up their wares, and, like their customers, were going home. Rag-pickers and costermongers of all kinds were crowding round the taverns in the dirty and stinking courtyards of the haymarket. Raskolnikov particularly liked this place and the neighboring alleys, when he wandered aimlessly in the streets. Here his rags did not attract contemptuous attention, and one could walk about in any attire without scandalizing people. At the corner of an alley a huckster and his wife had two tables set out with tapes, thread, cotton handkerchiefs, etc. They too had got up to go home, but were lingering in conversation with a friend, who had just come up to them. This friend was Lizavetna Ivanova, or, as everyone called her, Lizavetna the younger sister of the old pawnbroker Alyona Ivanovna, whom Raskolnikov had visited the previous day to pawn his watch and make his experiment. He already knew all about Lizavetna, and she knew him a little too. She was a single woman of about thirty-five, tall, clumsy, timid, submissive, and almost idiotic. She was a complete slave and went in fear and trembling of her sister, who made her work day and night and even beat her. She was standing with a bundle before the huckster and his wife, listening earnestly and doubtfully. They were talking of something with special warmth. The moment Raskolnikov caught sight of her, he was overcome by a strange sensation as it were of intense astonishment, though there was nothing astonishing about this meeting. "'You could make up your mind for yourself, Lizavetna Ivanova,' the huckster was saying aloud. "'Come round tomorrow about seven. They will be here too.' Tomorrow, said Lizavetna slowly and thoughtfully, as though unable to make up her mind. "'Upon my word, what a fright you are of Alyona Ivanovna!' gabbled the huckster's wife, a lively little woman. "'I look at you, you are like some little babe, and she is not your own sister either, nothing but a stepsister, and what a hand she keeps over you!' "'But this time don't say a word to Alyona Ivanovna,' her husband interrupted. "'That's my advice.' but come round to us without asking. It will be worth your while. Later on your sister herself may have a notion." "'Am I to come?' "'About seven o'clock tomorrow, and they will be here. You will be able to decide for yourself. And we'll have a cup of tea,' added his wife. "'All right, I'll come,' said Lizavetna, still pondering, and she began slowly moving away. Raskolnikov had just passed and heard no more. He passed softly, unnoticed, trying not to miss a word. His first amazement was followed by a thrill of horror, like a shiver running down his spine. He had learnt, he had suddenly, quite unexpectedly learnt, that the next day at seven o'clock Lizavetna, the old woman's sister and only companion, would be away from home and that therefore at seven o'clock precisely the old woman would be left alone. He was only a few steps from his lodging. He went in like a man condemned to death. He thought of nothing and was incapable of thinking, but he felt suddenly in his whole being that he had no more freedom of thought, no will, and that everything was suddenly and irrevocably decided. Certainly, if he had to wait whole years for a suitable opportunity, he could not reckon on a more certain step towards the success of the plan than that which had just presented itself. In any case, it would have been difficult to find out beforehand and with certainty, and with greater exactness and less risk, and without dangerous inquiries and investigations, 
that next day at a certain time an old woman, on whose life an attempt was contemplated, would be at home and entirely alone. End of Part 1 Chapter 5 Part 1 Chapter 6 of Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky Translated by Constance Garnett 1861-1946. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part One, Chapter Six. Later on, Raskolnikov happened to find out why the huckster and his wife had invited Lizaveta. It was a very ordinary matter, and there was nothing exceptional about it. A family who had come to the town and been reduced to poverty were selling their household goods and clothes, all women's things. As the things would have fetched little in the market, they were looking for a dealer. This was Lizaveta's business. She undertook such jobs and was frequently employed, as she was very honest and always fixed a fair price and stuck to it. She spoke as a rule little, and, as we have said already, she was very submissive and timid. But Raskolnikov had become superstitious of late. The traces of superstition remained in him long after and were almost ineradicable. And in all this he was always afterwards disposed to see something strange and mysterious, as it were, the presence of some peculiar influences and coincidences. In the previous winter a student he knew called Pokorev, who had left for Harkov, had chanced in conversation to give him the address of Alyona Ivanovna, the old pawnbroker, in case he might want to pawn anything. For a long while he did not go to her for he had lessons and managed to get along somehow. Six weeks ago he had remembered the address. He had two articles that could be pawned, his father's old silver watch and a little gold ring with three red stones, a present from his sister at parting. He decided to take the ring. When he found the old woman he had felt an insurmountable repulsion for her at the first glance, though he knew nothing special about her. He got two roubles from her and went into a miserable little tavern on his way home. He asked for tea, sat down, and sank into deep thought. A strange idea was pecking at his brain like a chicken in the egg, and very, very much absorbed him. Almost beside him at the next table there was sitting a student, whom he did not know and had never seen, and with him a young officer. They had played a game of billiards and began drinking tea. All at once he heard the student mention to the officer the pawnbroker Alyona Ivanovna, and gave him her address. This of itself seemed strange to Raskolnikov. He had just come from her, and here at once he heard her name. Of course it was a chance, but he could not shake off a very extraordinary impression, and here someone seemed to be speaking expressly for him. The student began telling his friend various details about Alyona Ivanovna. She is first-rate," he said. You can always get money from her. She is as rich as a Jew, she can give you five thousand roubles at a time, and she is not above taking a pledge for a rouble. Lots of our fellows have had dealings with her. But she is an awful old harpy." And he began describing how spiteful and uncertain she was, how if you were only a day late with your interest the pledge was lost how she gave a quarter of the value of an article and took five and even seven per cent a month on it and so on. The student chattered on, saying that she had a sister Lizaveta, whom the wretched little creature was continually beating, and kept in complete bondage like a small child, though Lizaveta was at least six feet high. "'There's a phenomenon for you!' cried the student, and he laughed. They began talking about Lizaveta. The student spoke about her with a peculiar relish, and was continually laughing, and the officer listened with great interest, and asked him to send Lizaveta to do some mending for him. Raskolnikov did not miss a word, and learned everything about her. Lizaveta was younger than the old woman and was her half-sister, being the child of a different mother. She was thirty-five. She worked day and night for her sister, and besides doing the cooking and the washing, she did the sewing and worked as a charwoman and gave her sister all she earned. She did not dare to accept an order or job of any kind without her sister's permission. The old woman had already made her will, and Lizaveta knew of it, and by this will she would not get a farthing, nothing but the movables, 
chairs and so on. All the money was left to a monastery in the province of N, that prayers might be said for her in perpetuity. Lizaveta was of lower rank than her sister, unmarried and awfully uncouth in appearance, remarkably tall, with long feet that looked as if they were bent outwards. She always wore battered goatskin shoes, and was clean in her person. What the student expressed most surprise and amusement about was the fact that Lizaveta was continually with child. "'But you say she is hideous?' observed the officer. "'Yes, she is so dark-skinned and looks like a soldier dressed up, but you know she is not at all hideous. She has such a good-natured face and eyes, strikingly so, and the proof of it is that lots of people are attracted by her. She is such a soft, gentle creature, ready to put up with anything, always willing, willing to do anything, and her smile is really very sweet. You seem to find her attractive yourself," laughed the officer. From her queerness? No, I'll tell you what. I could kill that damned old woman and make off with her money, I assure you, without the faintest conscience prick," the student added with warmth. The officer laughed again while Raskolnikov shuddered. How strange it was! "'Listen, I want to ask you a serious question,' the student said hotly. I was joking, of course, but look here. On one side we have a stupid, senseless, worthless, spiteful, ailing, horrid old woman. Not simply useless, but doing actual mischief, who has not an idea what she is living for herself, and who will die in a day or two in any case. You understand? You understand?" "'Yes, yes, I understand,' answered the officer, watching his excited companion attentively. Well, listen then. On the other side, fresh young lives thrown away for want of help, and by thousands, on every side. A hundred thousand good deeds could be done and helped on that old woman's money which will be buried in a monastery. Hundreds, thousands perhaps, might be set on the right path. Dozens of families saved from destitution, from ruin, from vice, from the lock hospitals, and all with her money. Kill her take her money, and with the help of it, devote oneself to the service of humanity and the good of all. What do you think? Would not one tiny crime be wiped out by thousands of good deeds? For one life thousands would be saved from corruption and decay. One death and a hundred lives in exchange. It's simple arithmetic. Besides, what value has the life of that sickly, stupid, ill-natured old woman in the balance of existence? no more than the life of a louse, of a black beetle, less in fact, because the old woman is doing harm. She is wearing out the lives of others. The other day she bit Lizaveta's finger out of spite. It almost had to be amputated." "'Of course she does not deserve to live,' remarked the officer. "'But there it is. It's nature.' "'Oh, well, brother, but we have to correct and direct nature, and but for that we should drown in an ocean of prejudice. But for that there would never have been a single great man. Talk of duty, conscience, I don't want to say anything against duty and conscience, but the point is, what do we mean by them? Stay, I have another question to ask you, listen. No, you stay, I'll ask you a question, listen. Well? You are talking and speechifying away, but tell me. Would you kill the old woman yourself?" "'Of course not. I was only arguing the justice of it. It's nothing to do with me.' "'But I think, if you would not do it yourself, there's no justice about it. Let us have another game.' Raskolnikov was violently agitated. Of course it was all ordinary youthful talk and thought, such as he had often heard before in different forms and on different themes. But why had he happened to hear such a discussion and such ideas at the very moment when his own brain was just conceiving the very same ideas? And why, just at the moment when he had brought away the embryo of his idea from the old woman, had he dropped at once upon a conversation about her? This coincidence always seemed strange to him. This trivial talk in a tavern had an immense influence on him in his later action as though there had really been in it something preordained, some guiding hint. 
On returning from the haymarket, he flung himself on the sofa and sat for a whole hour without stirring. Meanwhile it got dark. He had no candle, and, indeed, it did not occur to him to light up. He could never recollect whether he had been thinking about anything at that time. At last he was conscious of his former fever and shivering, and he realized with relief that he could lie down on the sofa. Soon heavy leaden sleep came over him, as it were crushing him. He slept an extraordinarily long time and without dreaming. Nastasia, coming into his room at ten o'clock the next morning, had difficulty in rousing him. She brought him in tea and bread. The tea was again the second brew, and again in her own teapot. "'My goodness, how he sleeps!' she cried indignantly. "'And he is always asleep!' He got up with an effort. His head ached, he stood up, took a turn in his garret, and sank back on the sofa again. "'Going to sleep again?' cried Nastasia. "'Are you ill, eh?' He made no reply. "'Do you want some tea?' "'Afterwards,' he said with an effort, closing his eyes again and turning to the wall. Nastasia stood over him. "'Perhaps he really is ill,' she said, turned and went out. She came in again at two o'clock with soup. He was lying as before. The tea stood untouched. Nastasia felt positively offended and began wrathfully rousing him. "'Why are you lying like a log?' she shouted, looking at him with repulsion. He got up and sat down again, but said nothing and stared at the floor. "'Are you ill or not?' asked Nastasia, and again received no answer. "'You'd better go out and get a breath of air,' she said after a pause. "'Will you eat it or not?' "'Afterwards,' he said weakly, "'you can go.' And he motioned her out. She remained a little longer, looked at him with compassion, and went out. A few minutes afterwards he raised his eyes and looked for a long while at the tea and the soup. Then he took up the bread, took up a spoon, and began to eat. He ate a little, three or four spoonfuls, without appetite, as it were, mechanically. His head ached less. After his meal he stretched himself on the sofa again, but now he could not sleep. He lay without stirring with his face in the pillow. He was haunted by daydreams, and such strange daydreams. In one that kept recurring, he fancied that he was in Africa, in Egypt, in some sort of oasis. The caravan was resting, the camels were peacefully lying down, the palms stood all around in a complete circle. All the party were at dinner. But he was drinking water from a spring which flowed gurgling close by and it was so cool, it was wonderful, wonderful blue, cold water running among the party-colored stones and over the clean sand which glistened here and there like gold. Suddenly he heard a clock strike. He started, roused himself, raised his head, looked out of the window, and seeing how late it was, suddenly jumped up wide awake as though someone had pulled him off the sofa. He crept on tiptoe to the door, stealthily opened it, and began listening on the staircase. His heart beat terribly. But all was quiet on the stairs, as if everyone was asleep. It seemed to him strange and monstrous that he could have slept in such forgetfulness from the previous day and had done nothing, had prepared nothing yet. And meanwhile perhaps it had struck six. And his drowsiness and stupefaction were followed by an extraordinary, feverish, as it were, distracted haste. But the preparations to be made were few. He concentrated all his energies on thinking of everything and forgetting nothing, and his heart kept beating and thumping so that he could hardly breathe. First he had to make a noose and sew it into his overcoat, a work of a moment. He rummaged under his pillow and picked out amongst the linen stuffed away under it a worn-out, old, unwashed shirt. From its rags he tore a long strip, a couple of inches wide and about sixteen inches long. He folded this strip in two, took off his wide, strong summer overcoat of some stout cotton material, his only outer garment, and began sewing the two ends of the rag on the inside, under the left armhole. His hands shook as he sewed, but he did it successfully so that nothing showed outside when he put on the coat again. The needle and thread he had got ready long before and they lay on his table in a piece of paper. As for the noose, 
It was a very ingenious device of his own. The noose was intended for the axe. It was impossible for him to carry the axe through the street in his hands, and if hidden under his coat he would still have had to support it with his hand, which would have been noticeable. Now he only had to put the head of the axe in the noose, and it would hang quietly under his arm on the inside. Putting his hand in his coat pocket, he could hold the end of the handle all the way, so that it did not swing, and as the coat was very full, a regular sack in fact, it would not be seen from outside that he was holding something with the hand that was in the pocket. This noose too he had designed a fortnight before. When he had finished with this, he thrust his hand into a little opening between his sofa and the floor, fumbled in the left corner, and drew out the pledge, which he had got ready long before and hidden there. This pledge was, however, only a smoothly planed piece of wood the size and thickness of a silver cigarette case. He picked up this piece of wood in one of his wanderings in a courtyard where there was some sort of a workshop. Afterwards he had added to the wood a thin smooth piece of iron, which he had also picked up at the same time in the street. Putting the iron which was a little the smaller on the piece of wood, he fastened them very firmly, crossing and recrossing the thread round them then wrapped them carefully and daintily in clean white paper, and tied up the parcel so that it would be very difficult to untie it. This was in order to divert the attention of the old woman for a time, while she was trying to undo the knot, and so to gain a moment. The iron strip was added to give weight, so that the woman might not guess the first minute that the thing was made of wood. All this had been stored by him beforehand under the sofa. He had only just got the pledge out when he heard someone suddenly about in the yard. It struck six long ago. Long ago? My God! He rushed to the door, listened, caught up his hat and began to descend his thirteen steps cautiously, noiselessly, like a cat. He had still the most important thing to do, to steal the axe from the kitchen. That the deed must be done with an axe he had decided long ago. He had also a pocket pruning knife but he could not rely on the knife, and still less on his own strength, and so resolved finally on the axe. We may note in passing one peculiarity in regard to all the final resolutions taken by him in the matter. They had one strange characteristic. The more final they were, the more hideous and the more absurd they at once became in his eyes. In spite of all his agonizing inward struggle, he never for a single instant all that time could believe in the carrying out of his plans. And indeed, if it had ever happened that everything to the least point could have been considered and finally settled, and no uncertainty of any kind had remained, he would, it seems, have renounced it all as something absurd, monstrous, and impossible. But a whole mass of unsettled points and uncertainties remained. As for getting the axe, that trifling business cost him no anxiety, for nothing could be easier. Nastasia was continually out of the house, especially in the evenings. She would run into the neighbors or to a shop, and always left the door ajar. It was the one thing the landlady was always scolding her about. And so, when the time came, he would only have to go quietly into the kitchen and to take the axe, and an hour later, when everything was over, go in and put it back again but these were doubtful points. Supposing he returned an hour later to put it back, and Nastasia had come back and was on the spot. He would, of course, have to go by and wait till she went out again. But supposing she were in the meantime to miss the axe, look for it, make an outcry, that would mean suspicion, or at least grounds for suspicion. But those were all trifles which he had not even begun to consider, and indeed he had no time. He was thinking of the chief point, and put off trifling details until he could believe in it all. But that seemed utterly unattainable. So it seemed to himself, at least. He could not imagine, for instance, that he would sometime leave off thinking, get up and simply go there, even his late experiment, that is, his visit with the object of a final survey of the place, was simply an attempt at an experiment, far from being the real thing, as though one should say, Come, let us go and try it. Why dream about it?" And at once he had broken down and run away cursing, in a frenzy with himself. 
Meanwhile it would seem, as regards the moral question, that his analysis was complete. His casuistry had become keen as a razor, and he could not find rational objections in himself. But in the last resort he simply ceased to believe in himself, and doggedly, slavishly sought arguments in all directions, fumbling for them, as though someone were forcing and drawing him to it. At first, long before, indeed, he had been much occupied with one question. Why almost all crimes are so badly concealed and so easily detected, and why almost all criminals leave such obvious traces? He had come gradually to many different and curious conclusions, and in his opinion the chief reason lay not so much in the material impossibility of concealing the crime as in the criminal himself. Almost every criminal is subject to a failure of will and reasoning power by a childish and phenomenal heedlessness, at the very instant when prudence and caution are most essential. It was his conviction that this eclipse of reason and failure of will-power attacked a man like a disease, developed gradually and reached its highest point just before the perpetration of the crime, continued with equal violence at the moment of the crime, and for longer or shorter time after, according to the individual case, and then passed off like any other disease. The question whether the disease gives rise to the crime, or whether the crime from its own peculiar nature is always accompanied by something of the nature of disease, he did not yet feel able to decide. When he reached these conclusions, he decided that in his own case there could not be such a morbid reaction, that his reason and will would remain unimpaired at the time of carrying out his design, for the simple reason that his design was not a crime. We will omit all the process by means of which he arrived at this last conclusion. We have run too far ahead already. We may add only that the practical, purely material difficulties of the affair occupied a secondary position in his mind. One has but to keep all one's will-power and reason to deal with them, and they will all be overcome at the time when once one has familiarized oneself with the minutest details of the business but this preparation had never been begun. His final decisions were what he came to trust least, and when the hour struck it all came to pass quite differently, as it were accidentally and unexpectedly. One trifling circumstance upset his calculations, before he had even left the staircase. When he reached the landlady's kitchen, the door of which was open as usual, he glanced cautiously in to see whether, in Nastasia's absence, the landlady herself was there or if not, whether the door to her own room was closed, so that she might not peep out when he went in for the axe. But what was his amazement when he suddenly saw that Nastasia was not only at home in the kitchen, but was occupied there, taking linen out of a basket and hanging it on a line. Seeing him, she left off hanging the clothes, turned to him and stared at him all the time he was passing. He turned away his eyes and walked past as though he noticed nothing but it was the end of everything. He had not the axe. He was overwhelmed. What made me think, he reflected, as he went under the gateway, what made me think that she would be sure not to be at home at that moment? Why, why, why did I assume this so certainly? He was crushed and even humiliated. He could have laughed at himself in his anger. A dull animal rage boiled within him. He stood hesitating in the gateway. To go into the street, to go a walk for appearance sake was revolting, to go back to his room even more revolting. "'And what a chance I have lost for ever!' he muttered, standing aimlessly in the gateway, just opposite the porter's little dark room, which was also open. Suddenly he started. From the porter's room, two paces away from him, something shining under the bench to the right caught his eye. He looked about him, nobody. He approached the room on tiptoe, went down two steps into it, and in a faint voice called the porter. Yes, not at home. Somewhere near, though, in the yard, for the door is wide open. He dashed to the axe, it was an axe, and pulled it out from under the bench, where it lay between two chunks of wood. At once, before going out, he made it fast in the noose, he thrust both hands into his pockets and went out of the room no one had noticed him. 
When reason fails, the devil helps, he thought with a strange grin. This chance raised his spirits extraordinarily. He walked along quietly and sedately, without hurry, to avoid awakening suspicion. He scarcely looked at the passers-by, tried to escape looking at their faces at all, and to be as little noticeable as possible. Suddenly he thought of his hat. Good heavens! I had the money the day before yesterday and did not get a cap to wear instead! A curse rose from the bottom of his soul. Glancing out of the corner of his eye into a shop, he saw by a clock on the wall that it was ten minutes past seven. He had to make haste and at the same time go some way round, so as to approach the house from the other side. When he had happened to imagine all this beforehand, he had sometimes thought that he would be very much afraid. But he was not very much afraid now, was not afraid at all indeed. His mind was even occupied by irrelevant matters, but by nothing for long. As he passed the Yusupov garden, he was deeply absorbed in considering the building of great fountains, and of their refreshing effect on the atmosphere in all the squares. By degrees he passed to the conviction that, if the summer garden were extended to the field of Mars, and perhaps joined to the garden of the Mihalovsky Palace, it would be a splendid thing and a great benefit to the town. Then he was interested by the question why in all great towns men are not simply driven by necessity, but in some peculiar way inclined to live in those parts of the town where there are no gardens nor fountains, where there is most dirt and smell and all sorts of nastiness. Then his own walks through the haymarket came back to his mind, and for a moment he waked up to reality. What nonsense! he thought. Better think of nothing at all. So, probably, men led to execution clutch mentally at every object that meets them on the way, flashed through his mind, but simply flashed, like lightning. He made haste to dismiss this thought, and by now he was near. Here was the house. Here was the gate. Suddenly a clock somewhere struck once. What? Can it be half-past seven? Impossible! It must be fast! Luckily for him, everything went well again at the gates. At that very moment, as though expressly for his benefit, a huge wagon of hay had just driven in at the gate, completely screening him as he passed under the gateway, and the wagon had scarcely had time to drive through into the yard before he had slipped in a flash to the right. On the other side of the wagon he could hear shouting and quarreling, but no one noticed him and no one met him. Many windows looking into that huge quadrangular yard were open at that moment, but he did not raise his head, he had not the strength to. The staircase leading to the old woman's room was close by, just on the right of the gateway. He was already on the stairs. Drawing a breath, pressing his hand against his throbbing heart, and once more feeling for the axe and setting it straight, he began softly and cautiously ascending the stairs, listening every minute. But the stairs too were quite deserted. All the doors were shut. He met no one. One flat indeed on the first floor was wide open and painters were at work in it, but they did not glance at him. He stood still, thought a minute and went on. Of course, it would be better if they had not been here, but it's two stories above them. And there was the fourth story, here was the door, here was the flat opposite, the empty one. The flat underneath the old woman's was apparently empty also. The visiting card nailed on the door had been torn off, they had gone away. He was out of breath. For one instant the thought floated through his mind, shall I go back? But he made no answer and began listening at the old woman's door, a dead silence. Then he listened again on the staircase, listened long and intently, then looked about him for the last time, pulled himself together, drew himself up, and once more tried the axe in the noose. Am I very pale? he wondered. Am I not evidently agitated? She is mistrustful. Had I better wait a little longer? till my heart leaves off thumping." But his heart did not leave off. On the contrary, as though to spite him, it throbbed more and more violently. He could stand it no longer. He slowly put out his hand to the bell and rang. 
Half a minute later, he rang again, more loudly. No answer. To go on ringing was useless and out of place. The old woman was, of course, at home, but she was suspicious and alone. He had some knowledge of her habits, and once more he put his ear to the door. Either his senses were peculiarly keen, which it is difficult to suppose, or the sound was really very distinct. Anyway, he suddenly heard something like the cautious touch of a hand on the lock and the rustle of a skirt at the very door. Someone was standing stealthily close to the lock and just as he was doing on the outside was secretly listening within, and seemed to have her ear to the door. He moved a little on purpose, and muttered something aloud that he might not have the appearance of hiding, then rang a third time, but quietly, soberly, and without impatience. Recalling it afterwards, that moment stood out in his mind vividly, distinctly forever. He could not make out how he had had such cunning, for his mind was, as it were, clouded at moments, and he was almost unconscious of his body. An instant later he heard the latch unfastened. End of Part 1 Chapter 6 Part 1 Chapter 7 of Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky Translated by Constance Garnett, 1861 to 1946. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part One, Chapter Seven. The door was, as before, opened a tiny crack, and again two sharp and suspicious eyes stared at him out of the darkness. Then Raskolnikov lost his head and nearly made a great mistake. Fearing the old woman would be frightened by their being alone and not hoping that the sight of him would disarm her suspicions, he took hold of the door and drew it towards him to prevent the old woman from attempting to shut it again. Seeing this, she did not pull the door back, but she did not let go the handle, so that he almost dragged her out with it on to the stairs. Seeing that she was standing in the doorway, not allowing him to pass, he advanced straight upon her. She stepped back in alarm, tried to say something, but seemed unable to speak and stared with open eyes at him. "'Good evening, Alyona Ivanovna,' he began, trying to speak easily, but his voice would not obey him, it broke and shook. "'I have come. I have brought something. But we'd better come in. To the light.' And leaving her, he passed straight into the room uninvited. The old woman ran after him, her tongue was unloosed. "'Good heavens! What is it? Who is it? What do you want?" "'Why, Alyona Ivanovna, you know me, Raskolnikov. Here, I brought you the pledge I promised the other day.' And he held out the pledge. The old woman glanced for a moment at the pledge, but at once stared in the eyes of her uninvited visitor. She looked intently, maliciously, and mistrustfully. A minute passed. He even fancied something like a sneer in her eyes as though she had already guessed everything. He felt that he was losing his head, that he was almost frightened, so frightened that if she were to look like that and not say a word for another half-minute, he thought he would have run away from her. "'Why do you look at me as though you did not know me?' he said suddenly, also with malice. "'Take it if you like. If not, I'll go elsewhere. I am in a hurry.' He had not even thought of saying this but it was suddenly said of itself. The old woman recovered herself, and her visitor's resolute tone evidently restored her confidence. "'But why, my good sir, all of a minute? What is it?' she asked, looking at the pledge. "'The silver cigarette case. I spoke of it last time, you know.' She held out her hand. "'But how pale you are, to be sure! And your hands are trembling, too! Have you been bathing, or what?" Fever, he answered abruptly. You can't help getting pale, if you've nothing to eat, he added, with difficulty articulating the words. His strength was failing him again. But his answer sounded like truth. The old woman took the pledge. What is it? she asked once more, scanning Raskolnikov intently, and weighing the pledge in her hand. A thing. Cigarette case. Silver. Look at it. It does not seem somehow like silver. How has he wrapped it up? 
trying to untie the string and turning to the window, to the light, all her windows were shut, in spite of the stifling heat, she left him altogether for some seconds and stood with her back to him. He unbuttoned his coat and freed the axe from the noose, but did not yet take it out altogether, simply holding it in his right hand under the coat. His hands were fearfully weak, he felt them every moment growing more numb and more wooden. He was afraid he would let the axe slip and fall. A sudden giddiness came over him. "'But what has he tied it up like this for?' the old woman cried with vexation and moved towards him. He had not a minute more to lose. He pulled the axe quite out, swung it with both arms, scarcely conscious of himself, and almost without effort, almost mechanically, brought the blunt side down on her head. He seemed not to use his own strength in this. But as soon as he had once brought the axe down, his strength returned to him. The old woman was always bareheaded. Her thin, light hair, streaked with gray, thickly smeared with grease, was plaited in a rat's tail and fastened by a broken horn comb which stood out on the nape of her neck. As she was so short, the blow fell on the very top of her skull. She cried out, but very faintly, and suddenly sank all of a heap on the floor, raising her hands to her head. In one hand she still held the pledge. Then he dealt her another and another blow with the blunt side and on the same spot. The blood gushed as from an overturned glass, the body fell back. He stepped back, let it fall, and at once bent over her face. She was dead. Her eyes seemed to be staring out of their sockets. The brow and the whole face were drawn and contorted convulsively. He laid the axe on the ground near the dead body and felt at once in her pocket, trying to avoid the streaming body the same right-hand pocket from which she had taken the key on his last visit. He was in full possession of his faculties, free from confusion or giddiness, but his hands were still trembling. He remembered afterwards that he had been particularly collected and careful, trying all the time not to get smeared with blood. He pulled out the keys at once, they were all as before, in one bunch on a steel ring. He ran at once into the bedroom with them. It was a very small room with a whole shrine of holy images. Against the other wall stood a big bed, very clean and covered with a silk patchwork wadded quilt. Against a third wall was a chest of drawers. Strange to say, so soon as he began to fit the keys into the chest, so soon as he heard their jingling, a convulsive shudder passed over him. He suddenly felt tempted again to give it all up and go away. But that was only for an instant it was too late to go back. He positively smiled at himself when suddenly another terrifying idea occurred to his mind. He suddenly fancied that the old woman might still be alive and might recover her senses. Leaving the keys in the chest, he ran back to the body, snatched up the axe and lifted it once more over the old woman, but did not bring it down. There was no doubt that she was dead. Bending down and examining her again more closely, he saw clearly that the skull was broken and even battered in on one side. He was about to feel it with his finger, but drew back his hand, and indeed it was evident without that. Meanwhile there was a perfect pool of blood. All at once he noticed a string on her neck. He tugged at it, but the string was strong and did not snap, and besides it was soaked with blood. He tried to pull it out from the front of the dress, but something held it and prevented its coming. In his impatience he raised the axe again to cut the string from above on the body, but did not dare, and with difficulty, smearing his hand and the axe in the blood, after two minutes' hurried effort, he cut the string and took it off without touching the body with the axe. He was not mistaken, it was a purse. On the string were two crosses, one of cypress wood and one of copper, and an image in silver filigree and with them a small greasy chamois leather purse with a steel rim and ring. The purse was stuffed very full. Raskolnikov thrust it in his pocket without looking at it, flung the crosses on the old woman's body and rushed back into the bedroom, this time taking the axe with him. He was in terrible haste. He snatched the keys and began trying them again. But he was unsuccessful. They would not fit in the locks. It was not so much that his hands were shaking, but that he kept making mistakes. Though he saw, for instance, that
that a key was not the right one and would not fit, still he tried to put it in. Suddenly he remembered and realized that the big key with the deep notches, which was hanging there with the small keys, could not possibly belong to the chest of drawers. On his last visit this had struck him. But to some strong box, and that everything perhaps was hidden in that box. He left the chest of drawers and at once felt under the bedstead, knowing that old women usually keep boxes under their beds. And so it was. There was a good-sized box under the bed, at least a yard in length, with an arched lid covered with red leather and studded with steel nails. The notched key fitted at once and unlocked it. At the top, under a white sheet, was a coat of red brocade lined with hairskin. Under it was a silk dress, then a shawl, and it seemed as though there was nothing below but clothes. The first thing he did was to wipe his blood-stained hands on the red brocade. It's red, and on red blood will be less noticeable, the thought passed through his mind. Then he suddenly came to himself. Good God, am I going out of my senses? he thought with terror. But no sooner did he touch the clothes than a gold watch slipped from under the fur coat. He made haste to turn them all over. There turned out to be various articles made of gold among the clothes, probably all pledges, unredeemed or waiting to be redeemed, bracelets, chains, earrings, pins and such things. Some were in cases, others simply wrapped in newspaper, carefully and exactly folded and tied round with tape. Without any delay he began filling up the pockets of his trousers and overcoat without examining or undoing the parcels and cases, but he had not time to take many. He suddenly heard steps in the room where the old woman lay. He stopped short and was still as death. But all was quiet, so it must have been his fancy. All at once he heard distinctly a faint cry, as though someone had uttered a low broken moan then again dead silence for a minute or two. He sat squatting on his heels by the box and waited holding his breath. Suddenly he jumped up, seized the axe and ran out of the bedroom. In the middle of the room stood Lizaveta with a big bundle in her arms. She was gazing in stupefaction at her murdered sister, white as a sheet and seeming not to have the strength to cry out. Seeing him run out of the bedroom, she began faintly quivering all over like a leaf. A shudder ran down her face. She lifted her hand, opened her mouth, but still did not scream. She began slowly backing away from him into the corner, staring intently, persistently at him, but still uttered no sound, as though she could not get breath to scream. He rushed at her with the axe. Her mouth twitched piteously, as one sees babies' mouths, when they begin to be frightened, stare intently at what frightens them and are on the point of screaming. And this hapless Lizaveta was so simple, and had been so thoroughly crushed and scared, that she did not even raise a hand to guard her face, though that was the most necessary and natural action at the moment, for the axe was raised over her face. She only put up her empty left hand, but not to her face, slowly holding it out before her as though motioning him away. The axe fell with the sharp edge just on the skull and split at one blow all the top of the head. She fell heavily at once. Raskolnikov completely lost his head, snatching up her bundle, dropped it again and ran into the entry. Fear gained more and more mastery over him, especially after this second, quite unexpected murder. He longed to run away from the place as fast as possible and if at that moment he had been capable of seeing and reasoning more correctly, if he had been able to realize all the difficulties of his position, the hopelessness, the hideousness, and the absurdity of it, if he could have understood how many obstacles, and perhaps crimes he had still to overcome or to commit, to get out of that place and to make his way home, it is very possible that he would have flung up everything, and would have gone to give himself up, and not from fear, but from simple horror and loathing of what he had done. The feeling of loathing especially surged up within him and grew stronger every minute. He would not now have gone to the box or even into the room for anything in the world. But a sort of blankness, even dreaminess, had begun by degrees to take possession of him. At moments he forgot himself, or rather forgot what was of importance, and caught at trifles. 
Glancing, however, into the kitchen and seeing a bucket half full of water on a bench, he bethought him of washing his hands and the axe. His hands were sticky with blood. He dropped the axe with the blade in the water, snatched a piece of soap that lay in a broken saucer on the window, and began washing his hands in the bucket. When they were clean, he took out the axe, washed the blade, and spent a long time, about three minutes, washing the wood where there were spots of blood rubbing them with soap. Then he wiped it all with some linen that was hanging to dry on a line in the kitchen, and then he was a long while attentively examining the axe at the window. There was no trace left on it, only the wood was still damp. He carefully hung the axe in the noose under his coat. Then, as far as was possible, in the dim light in the kitchen, he looked over his overcoat, his trousers, and his boots. At the first glance there seemed to be nothing but stains on the boots. He wetted the rag and rubbed the boots. But he knew he was not looking thoroughly, that there might be something quite noticeable that he was overlooking. He stood in the middle of the room, lost in thought. Dark, agonizing ideas rose in his mind. The idea that he was mad, and that at that moment he was incapable of reasoning, of protecting himself, that he ought perhaps to be doing something utterly different from what he was now doing. "'Good God!' he muttered. "'I must fly! Fly!' And he rushed into the entry. But here a shock of terror awaited him, such as he had never known before. He stood and gazed and could not believe his eyes. The door, the outer door from the stairs, at which he had not long before waited and rung, was standing unfastened and at least six inches open. No lock, no bolt, all the time, all that time. The old woman had not shut it after him, perhaps as a precaution. But, good God, why, he had seen Lizaveta afterwards, and how could he, how could he have failed to reflect that she must have come in somehow? She could not have come through the wall. He dashed to the door and fastened the latch. But no, the wrong thing again. I must get away, get away. He unfastened the latch, opened the door, and began listening on the staircase. He listened a long time. Somewhere, far away, it might be in the gateway, two voices were loudly and shrilly shouting, quarreling, and scolding. What are they about? He waited patiently. At last all was still, as though suddenly cut off. They had separated. He was meaning to go out, but suddenly, on the floor below, a door was noisily opened and someone began going downstairs humming a tune. "'How is it they all make such a noise?' flashed through his mind. Once more he closed the door and waited. At last all was still, not a soul stirring. He was just taking a step towards the stairs when he heard fresh footsteps. The steps sounded very far off, at the very bottom of the stairs. But he remembered quite clearly and distinctly that from the first sound he began for some reason to suspect that this was someone coming there, to the fourth floor, to the old woman. Why? Were the sounds somehow peculiar, significant? The steps were heavy, even and unhurried. Now he had passed the first floor, now he was mounting higher. It was growing more and more distinct. He could hear his heavy breathing. And now the third story had been reached. Coming here! And it seemed to him all at once that he was turned to stone, that it was like a dream in which one was being pursued, nearly caught and will be killed, and is rooted to the spot and cannot even move one's arms. At last, when the unknown was mounting to the fourth floor, he suddenly started, and succeeded in slipping neatly and quickly back into the flat and closing the door behind him. Then he took the hook and softly, noiselessly fixed it in the catch. Instinct helped him. When he had done this, he crouched holding his breath by the door. The unknown visitor was by now also at the door. They were now standing opposite one another, as he had just before been standing with the old woman, when the door divided them and he was listening. The visitor panted several times. "'He must be a big fat man,' thought Raskolnikov, squeezing the axe in his hand. It seemed like a dream indeed. The visitor took hold of the bell and rang it loudly. As soon as the tin bell tinkled, Raskolnikov seemed to be aware of something moving in the room. 
For some seconds he listened quite seriously. The unknown rang again, waited and suddenly tugged violently and impatiently at the handle of the door. Raskolnikov gazed in horror at the hook shaking in its fastening, and in blank terror expected every minute that the fastening would be pulled out. It certainly did seem possible, so violently was he shaking it. He was tempted to hold the fastening, but he might be aware of it. A giddiness came over him again. "'I shall fall down,' flashed through his mind, but the unknown began to speak and he recovered himself at once. "'What's up? Are they asleep or murdered? Damn them!' he bawled in a thick voice. "'Hey, Alyona Ivanovna, old witch! Lizaveta Ivanovna, hey, my beauty, open the door! Oh, damn them! Are they asleep or what?' and again enraged he tugged with all his might a dozen times at the bell. He must certainly be a man of authority and an intimate acquaintance. At this moment light-hurried steps were heard not far off on the stairs. Someone else was approaching. Raskolnikov had not heard them at first. "'You don't say there's no one at home,' the newcomer cried in a cheerful, ringing voice, addressing the first visitor, who still went on pulling the bell. Good evening, Coke." From his voice he must be quite young, thought Raskolnikov. "'Who the devil can tell? I've almost broken the lock,' answered Coke. "'But how do you come to know me?' "'Why, the day before yesterday I beat you three times running at billiards at Gumbrino's.' "'Oh!' "'So they are not at home? That's queer. It's awfully stupid, though. Where could the old woman have gone?' I've come on business." "'Yes, and I have business with her, too. Well, what can we do? Go back, I suppose. Ay, ay, and I was hoping to get some money,' cried the young man. "'We must give it up, of course, but what did she fix this time for? The old witch fixed the time for me to come myself. It's out of my way. And where the devil she can have got to I can't make out. She sits here from year's end to year's end, the old hag. Her legs are bad, and yet here all of a sudden she's out for a walk." "'Hadn't we better ask the porter?' "'What?' "'Where she's gone and when she'll come back.' "'Hm. Damn it all. We might ask. But you know she never does go anywhere.' And he once more tugged at the door-handle. "'Damn it all. There's nothing to be done. We must go.' "'Stay!' cried the young man suddenly. Do you see how the door shakes if you pull it? Well? That shows it's not locked, but fastened with the hook. Do you hear how the hook clanks? Well? Why, don't you see? That proves that one of them is at home. If they were all out, they would have locked the door from the outside with the key and not with the hook from the inside. There, do you hear how the hook is clanking? To fasten the hook on the inside they must be at home, don't you see? So there they are sitting inside and don't open the door. Well, and so they must be, cried Coke, astonished. What are they about in there? And he began furiously shaking the door. Stay, cried the young man again. Don't pull at it. There must be something wrong here. Here you've been ringing and pulling at the door and still they don't open. So either they both fainted or... What? I tell you what, let's go fetch the porter, let him wake them up. All right. Both were going down. Stay, you stop here while I run down for the porter. What for? Well, you'd better. All right. I'm studying the law, you see. It's evident, evident there's something wrong here, the young man cried hotly, and he ran downstairs. Coke remained. Once more he softly touched the bell, which gave one tinkle, then gently, as though reflecting and looking about him, began touching the door-handle, pulling it and letting it go to make sure once more that it was only fastened by the hook. Then puffing and panting he bent down and began looking at the keyhole. But the key was in the lock on the inside and so nothing could be seen. Raskolnikov stood keeping tight hold of the axe. He was in a sort of delirium. He was even making ready to fight when they should come in. While they were knocking and talking together, 
the idea several times occurred to him to end it all at once and shout to them through the door. Now and then he was tempted to swear at them, to jeer at them, while they could not open the door. Only make haste, was the thought that flashed through his mind. But what the devil is he about? Time was passing, one minute and another. No one came. Coke began to be restless. What the devil! he cried suddenly, and in impatience, deserting his sentry duty, he too went down, hurrying and thumping with his heavy boots on the stairs. The steps died away. Good heavens! What am I to do? Raskolnikov unfastened the hook, opened the door. There was no sound. Abruptly, without any thought at all, he went out, closing the door as thoroughly as he could, and went downstairs. He had gone down three flights, when he suddenly heard a loud voice below. Where could he go? There was nowhere to hide. He was just going back to the flat. "'Hey there! Catch the brute!' Somebody dashed out of a flat below, shouting, and rather fell than ran down the stairs, bawling at the top of his voice. "'Mitka! Mitka! 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 Blast him!' The shout ended in a shriek. The last sounds came from the yard. All was still. But at the same instant several men talking loud and fast began noisily mounting the stairs. There were three or four of them. He distinguished the ringing voice of the young man. Hey! Filled with despair, he went straight to meet them, feeling, come what must. If they stopped him, all was lost. If they let him pass, all was lost, too. They would remember him they were approaching. They were only a flight from him, and suddenly deliverance. A few steps from him on the right there was an empty flat with the door wide open, the flat on the second floor where the painters had been at work, and which, as though for his benefit, they had just left. It was they, no doubt, who had just run down, shouting. The floor had only just been painted. In the middle of the room stood a pail and a broken pot with paint and brushes. In one instant, he had whisked in at the open door and hidden behind the wall, and only in the nick of time. They had already reached the landing. Then they turned and went on up to the fourth floor, talking loudly. He waited, went out on tiptoe, and ran down the stairs. No one was on the stairs, nor in the gateway. He passed quickly through the gateway and turned to the left in the street. He knew, he knew perfectly well, that at that moment they were at the flat, that they were greatly astonished at finding it unlocked, as the door had just been fastened, that by now they were looking at the bodies, that before another minute had passed they would guess and completely realize that the murderer had just been there, and had succeeded in hiding somewhere, slipping by them and escaping. They would guess most likely that he had been in the empty flat, while they were going downstairs and meanwhile he dared not quicken his pace much, though the next turning was still nearly a hundred yards away. Should he slip through some gateway and wait somewhere in an unknown street? No, hopeless. Should he fling away the axe? Should he take a cab? Hopeless, hopeless! At last he reached the turning. He turned down it more dead than alive. Here he was halfway to safety, and he understood it. It was less risky because there was a great crowd of people, and he was lost in it like a grain of sand. But all he had suffered had so weakened him that he could scarcely move. Perspiration ran down him in drops, his neck was all wet. "'My word, he has been going it!' someone shouted at him when he came out on the canal bank. He was only dimly conscious of himself now, and the farther he went the worse it was. He remembered, however, that on coming out onto the canal bank he was alarmed at finding few people there, and so being more conspicuous, and he had the thought of turning back. Though he was almost falling from fatigue, he went a long way round so as to get home from quite a different direction. He was not fully conscious when he passed through the gateway of his house. He was already on the staircase before he recollected the axe, and yet he had a very grave problem before him to put it back and to escape observation as far as possible in doing so. He was, of course, incapable of reflecting that it might perhaps be far better not to restore the axe at all, but to drop it later on in somebody's yard. 
but it all happened fortunately, the door of the porter's room was closed but not locked, so that it seemed most likely that the porter was at home. But he had so completely lost all power of reflection that he walked straight to the door and opened it. If the porter had asked him, What do you want? he would perhaps have simply handed him the axe. But again the porter was not at home, and he succeeded in putting the axe back under the bench and even covering it with the chunk of wood as before. He met no one, not a soul afterwards, on the way to his room. The landlady's door was shut. When he was in his room, he flung himself on the sofa just as he was. He did not sleep, but sank into blank forgetfulness. If anyone had come into his room then, he would have jumped up at once and screamed. Scraps and shreds of thoughts were simply swarming in his brain, but he could not catch at one, he could not rest on one, in spite of all his efforts. End of Part 1 Chapter 7 Part 2 Chapter 1 of Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky Translated by Constance Garnett, 1861-1946 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2 Chapter 1 So he lay a very long while. Now and then he seemed to wake up, and at such moments he noticed that it was far into the night but it did not occur to him to get up. At last he noticed that it was beginning to get light. He was lying on his back, still dazed from his recent oblivion. Fearful, despairing cries rose shrilly from the street, sounds which he heard every night, indeed, under his window after two o'clock. They woke him up now. "'Ah! The drunken men are coming out of the taverns,' he thought. "'It's past two o'clock.' And at once he leaped up as though someone had pulled him from the sofa. What? Past two o'clock! He sat down on the sofa, and instantly recollected everything. All at once, in one flash, he recollected everything. For the first moment he thought he was going mad. A dreadful chill came over him, but the chill was from the fever that had begun long before in his sleep. Now he was suddenly taken with violent shivering so that his teeth chattered and all his limbs were shaking. He opened the door and began listening. Everything in the house was asleep. With amazement he gazed at himself and everything in the room around him, wondering how he could have come in the night before without fastening the door, and have flung himself on the sofa without undressing, without even taking his hat off. It had fallen off and was lying on the floor near his pillow. If anyone had come in, what would he have thought? That I'm drunk, but... He rushed to the window. There was light enough, and he began hurriedly looking himself all over from head to foot, all his clothes. Were there no traces? But there was no doing it like that. Shivering with the cold, he began taking off everything and looking over again. He turned everything over to the last threads and rags, and, mistrusting himself, went through his search three times but there seemed to be nothing, no trace, except in one place, where some thick drops of congealed blood were clinging to the frayed edge of his trousers. He picked up a big clasp-knife and cut off the frayed threads. There seemed to be nothing more. Suddenly he remembered that the purse and the things he had taken out of the old woman's box were still in his pockets. He had not thought till then of taking them out and hiding them. He had not even thought of them while he was examining his clothes. What next? Instantly he rushed to take them out and fling them on the table. When he had pulled out everything and turned the pocket inside out to be sure there was nothing left, he carried the whole heap to the corner. The paper had come off the bottom of the wall and hung there in tatters. He began stuffing all the things into the hole under the paper. They're in, all out of sight, and the purse too he thought gleefully, getting up and gazing blankly at the hole which bulged out more than ever. Suddenly he shuddered all over with horror. "'My God!' he whispered in despair. "'What's the matter with me? Is that hidden? Is that the way to hide things?' He had not reckoned on having trinkets to hide. He had only thought of money, and so had not prepared a hiding-place. But now—' Now what am I glad of? he thought. Is that hiding things? 
my reason's deserting me, simply." He sat down on the sofa in exhaustion, and was at once shaken by another unbearable fit of shivering. Mechanically he drew from a chair beside him his old student's winter coat, which was still warm though almost in rags, covered himself up with it and once more sank into drowsiness and delirium. He lost consciousness. Not more than five minutes had passed when he jumped up a second time, and at once pounced in a frenzy on his clothes again. How could I go to sleep again with nothing done? Yes, yes, I have not taken the loop off the armhole. I forgot, forgot a thing like that. Such a piece of evidence!" He pulled off the noose, hurriedly cut it to pieces and threw the bits among his linen under the pillow. Pieces of torn linen couldn't rouse suspicion, whatever happened. I think not. I think not, anyway," he repeated, standing in the middle of the room, and with painful concentration he fell to gazing about him again, at the floor and everywhere, trying to make sure he had not forgotten anything. The conviction that all his faculties, even memory and the simplest power of reflection were failing him, began to be an insufferable torture. Surely it isn't beginning already. Surely it isn't my punishment coming upon me. It is." The frayed rags he had cut off his trousers were actually lying on the floor in the middle of the room, where anyone coming in would see them. "'What is the matter with me?' he cried again, like one distraught. Then a strange idea entered his head. That, perhaps, all his clothes were covered with blood that perhaps there were a great many stains, but that he did not see them, did not notice them because his perceptions were failing, were going to pieces. His reason was clouded. Suddenly he remembered that there had been blood on the purse, too. Ah, then there must be blood in the pocket, too, for I put the wet purse in my pocket. In a flash he had turned the pocket inside out, and, yes, there were traces stains on the lining of the pocket. So my reason has not quite deserted me, so I still have some sense and memory since I guessed it of myself," he thought triumphantly, with a deep sigh of relief. It's simply the weakness of fever, a moment's delirium. And he tore the whole lining out of the left pocket of his trousers. At that instant the sunlight fell on his left boot. On the sock which poked out from the boot, he fancied there were traces. He flung off his boots. Traces, indeed! The tip of the sock was soaked with blood! He must have unwarily stepped into that pool. But what am I to do with this now? Where am I to put the sock and rags and pocket? He gathered them all up in his hands and stood in the middle of the room. In the stove? But they would ransack the stove first of all. Burn them? But what can I burn them with? There are no matches even. No, better go out and throw it all away somewhere. Yes, better throw it away," he repeated, sitting down on the sofa again. And at once, this minute, without lingering. But his head sank on the pillow instead. Again the unbearable icy shivering came over him. Again he drew his coat over him. And for a long while, for some hours, he was haunted by the impulse to go off somewhere at once, this moment, and fling it all away, so that it may be out of sight and done with, at once, at once!" Several times he tried to rise from the sofa, but could not. He was thoroughly waked up at last by a violent knocking at his door. "'Open, do! Are you dead or alive? He keeps sleeping here!' shouted Nastasia, banging with her fist on the door. "'For whole days together he's snoring here like a dog! A dog he is, too. Open, I tell you, it's past ten. Maybe he's not at home, said a man's voice. Ha! Huh, that's the porter's voice. What does he want? He jumped up and sat on the sofa. The beating of his heart was a positive pain. Then who could have latched the door? retorted Nastasia. He's taken to bolting himself in, as if he were worth stealing. Open, you stupid! Wake up!" What do they want? Why the porter? All's discovered. Resist or open? Come what may. He half rose, stooped forward, and unlatched the door. 
His room was so small that he could undo the latch without leaving the bed. Yes, the porter and Nastasia were standing there. Nastasia stared at him in a strange way. He glanced with defiant and desperate air at the porter, who, without a word, held out a grey folded paper sealed with bottle wax. A notice from the office, he announced, as he gave him the paper. From what office? A summons to the police office, of course. You know which office. To the police? What for? How can I tell? You're sent for, so you go. The man looked at him attentively, looked round the room, and turned to go away. He's downright ill, observed Nastasia, not taking her eyes off him. The porter turned his head for a moment. He's been in a fever since yesterday, she added. Raskolnikov made no response and held the paper in his hands without opening it. "'Don't you get up, then,' Nastasia went on compassionately, seeing that he was letting his feet down from the sofa. "'You're ill, so don't go. There's no such hurry. What have you got there?' He looked. In his right hand he held the shreds he had cut from his trousers, the sock and the rags of the pocket. So he had been asleep with them in his hand. Afterwards, reflecting upon it, he remembered that half waking up in his fever he had grasped all this tightly in his hand and so fallen asleep again. "'Look at the rags he's collected and sleeps with them, as though he has got hold of a treasure!' And Nastasia went off into her hysterical giggle. Instantly he thrust them all under his greatcoat and fixed his eyes intently upon her. Far as he was from being capable of rational reflection at that moment, he felt that no one would behave like that with a person who was going to be arrested. But the police! You'd better have some tea. Yes? I'll bring it. There's some left. No, I'm going. I'll go at once, he muttered, getting to his feet. Why, you'll never get downstairs. Yes, I'll go. As you please. She followed the porter out. At once he rushed to the light to examine the sock and rags. There are stains, but not very noticeable, all covered with dirt and rubbed and already discolored. No one who had no suspicion could distinguish anything. Nastasia from a distance could not have noticed, thank God. Then with a tremor he broke the seal of the notice and began reading. He was a long while reading, before he understood. It was an ordinary summons from the district police station to appear that day at half-past nine, at the office of the district superintendent. But when has such a thing happened? I never have anything to do with the police. And why just today? he thought in agonizing bewilderment. Good God! Only get it over soon! He was flinging himself on his knees to pray, but broke into laughter, not at the idea of prayer, but at himself. He began hurriedly dressing. If I'm lost, I am lost, I don't care. Shall I put the sock on? He suddenly wondered. It will get dustier still and the traces will be gone. But no sooner had he put it on than he pulled it off again in loathing and horror. He pulled it off, but reflecting that he had no other socks, he picked it up and put it on again. And again he laughed. That's all conventional. That's all relative, merely a way of looking at it," he thought in a flash, but only on the top surface of his mind, while he was shuddering all over. There, I've got it on. I finished by getting it on. But his laughter was quickly followed by despair. No, it's too much for me, he thought. His legs shook. From fear, he muttered. His head swam and ached with fever. It's a trick. They want to decoy me there and confound me over everything," he mused as he went out onto the stairs. The worst of it is I'm almost light-headed. I may blurt out something stupid. On the stairs he remembered that he was leaving all the things just as they were in the hole in the wall. And very likely it's on purpose to search when I'm out, he thought and stopped short. But he was possessed by such despair such cynicism of misery, if one might so call it, that with a wave of his hand he went on. Only to get it over. In the street the heat was insufferable again. 
not a drop of rain had fallen all those days. Again dust, bricks and mortar, again the stench from the shops and pothouses, again the drunken men, the finished peddlers and half-broken-down cabs. The sun shone straight in his eyes, so that it hurt him to look out of them, and he felt his head going round, as a man in fever is apt to feel when he comes out into the street on a bright sunny day. When he reached the turning into THE street, in an agony of trepidation he looked down it, at THE house, and at once averted his eyes. "'If they question me, perhaps I'll simply tell,' he thought, as he drew near the police station. The police station was about a quarter of a mile off. It had lately been moved to new rooms on the fourth floor of a new house. He had been once for a moment in the old office, but long ago. Turning in at the gateway, he saw on the right a flight of stairs which a peasant was mounting with a book in his hand. A house porter, no doubt. So then the office is here. And he began ascending the stairs on the chance. He did not want to ask questions of anyone. I'll go in, fall on my knees, and confess everything, he thought as he reached the fourth floor. The staircase was steep, narrow, and all sloppy with dirty water. The kitchens of the flats opened onto the stairs and stood open almost the whole day. So there was a fearful smell and heat. The staircase was crowded with porters going up and down with their books under their arms, policemen and persons of all sorts and both sexes. The door of the office, too, stood wide open. Peasants stood waiting within. There, too, the heat was stifling, and there was a sickening smell of fresh paint and stale oil from the newly decorated rooms. After a little while he decided to move forward into the next room. All the rooms were small and low-pitched. A fearful impatience drew him on and on. No one paid attention to him. In the second room some clerks sat writing, dressed hardly better than he was, and rather a queer-looking set. He went up to one of them. "'What is it?' He showed the notice he had received. "'You are a student?' the man asked, glancing at the notice. "'Yes, formerly a student.' The clerk looked at him, but without the slightest interest. He was a particularly unkempt person with the look of a fixed idea in his eye. "'There would be no getting anything out of him, because he has no interest in anything,' thought Raskolnikov. "'Go in there to the head clerk,' said the clerk, pointing towards the furthest room. He went into that room the fourth in order. It was a small room and packed full of people, rather better dressed than in the outer rooms. Among them were two ladies. One, poorly dressed in mourning, sat at the table opposite the chief clerk, writing something at his dictation. The other, a very stout, buxom woman with a purplish-red, blotchy face, excessively smartly dressed with a brooch on her bosom as big as a saucer, was standing on one side apparently waiting for something. Raskolnikov thrust his notice upon the head clerk. The latter glanced at it, said, "'Wait a minute,' and went on attending to the lady in mourning. He breathed more freely. "'It can't be that!' By degrees he began to regain confidence. He kept urging himself to have courage and be calm. "'Some foolishness, some trifling carelessness, and I may betray myself.' Hmm. It's a pity there's no air here," he added. It's stifling. It makes one's head dizzier than ever. And one's mind, too. He was conscious of a terrible inner turmoil. He was afraid of losing his self-control. He tried to catch at something and fix his mind on it, something quite irrelevant, but he could not succeed in this at all. Yet the head clerk greatly interested him. He kept hoping to see through him and guess something from his face. He was a very young man, about two and twenty, with a dark, mobile face that looked older than his years. He was fashionably dressed and foppish, with his hair parted in the middle, well combed and pomaded, and wore a number of rings on his well-scrubbed fingers and a gold chain on his waistcoat. He said a couple of words in French to a foreigner who was in the room, and said them fairly correctly. Louise Ivanova, you can sit down, he said casually to the gaily dressed, purple-faced lady, 
who was still standing as though not venturing to sit down, though there was a chair beside her. Ich danke, said the latter, and softly, with a rustle of silk she sank into the chair. Her light blue dress trimmed with white lace floated about the table like an air balloon, and filled almost half the room. She smelt of scent. But she was obviously embarrassed at filling half the room and smelling so strongly of scent, and though her smile was impudent as well as cringing, it betrayed evident uneasiness. The lady in mourning had done at last and got up. All at once, with some noise, an officer walked in very jauntily, with a peculiar swing of his shoulders at each step. He tossed his cockaded cap on the table and sat down in an easy chair. The small lady positively skipped from her seat on seeing him, and fell to curtsying in a sort of ecstasy. But the officer took not the smallest notice of her, and she did not venture to sit down again in his presence. He was the assistant superintendent. He had a reddish moustache that stood out horizontally on each side of his face, and extremely small features, expressive of nothing much except a certain insolence. He looked askance and rather indignantly at Raskolnikov. He was so very badly dressed, and in spite of his humiliating position his bearing was by no means in keeping with his clothes. Raskolnikov had unwarily fixed a very long and direct look on him, so that he felt positively affronted. "'What do you want?' he shouted, apparently astonished that such a ragged fellow was not annihilated by the majesty of his glance. I was summoned. By a notice," Raskolnikov faltered. For the recovery of money due from the student, the head clerk interfered hurriedly, tearing himself from his papers. Here, and he flung Raskolnikov a document and pointed out the place. Read that. Money? What money? thought Raskolnikov. But, then, it's certainly not that. And he trembled with joy. He felt sudden intense, indescribable relief. A load was lifted from his back. "'And pray, what time were you directed to appear, sir?' shouted the assistant superintendent, seeming for some unknown reason more and more aggrieved. "'You are told to come at nine, and now it's twelve. "'The notice was only brought me a quarter of an hour ago,' Raskolnikov answered loudly over his shoulder. To his own surprise, he too grew suddenly angry and found a certain pleasure in it. And it's enough that I have to come here ill with a fever. Kindly refrain from shouting. I'm not shouting. I'm speaking very quietly. It's you who are shouting at me. I'm a student and allow no one to shout at me. The assistant superintendent was so furious that for the first minute he could only splutter inarticulately. He leaped up from his seat. "'Be silent! You are in a government office! Don't be impudent, sir!' "'You're in a government office, too!' cried Raskolnikov. "'And you're smoking a cigarette as well as shouting, so you are showing disrespect to all of us!' He felt an indescribable satisfaction at having said this. The head clerk looked at him with a smile. The angry assistant superintendent was obviously disconcerted. "'That's not your business!' he shouted at last, with unnatural loudness. "'Kindly make the declaration demanded of you. Show him, Alexander Grigorovitch. There is a complaint against you. You don't pay your debts. You're a fine bird!' But Raskolnikov was not listening now. He had eagerly clutched at the paper, in haste to find an explanation. He read it once, and a second time, and still did not understand. "'What is this?' he asked the head clerk. "'It is for the recovery of money on an I.O.U., a writ. You must either pay it, with all expenses, costs, and so on, or give a written declaration when you can pay it, and at the same time an undertaking not to leave the capital without payment, and nor to sell or conceal your property.' The creditor is at liberty to sell your property and proceed against you according to the law. But I am not in debt to anyone. That's not our business. Here, an IOU for a hundred and fifteen roubles, legally attested and due for payment, has been brought us for recovery, 
given by you to the widow of the assessor Zarnitsin, nine months ago and paid over by the widow Zarnitsin to one Mr. Cheberov. We therefore summon you hereupon." "'But she is my landlady!' "'And what if she is your landlady?' The head clerk looked at him with a condescending smile of compassion, and at the same time with a certain triumph, as at a novice under fire for the first time, as though he would say, "'Well, how do you feel now?' But what did he care now for an I.O.U., for a writ of recovery? Was that worth worrying about now? Was it worth attention even? He stood, he read, he listened, he answered, he even asked questions himself, but all mechanically. The triumphant sense of security, of deliverance from overwhelming danger, that was what filled his whole soul that moment without thought for the future, without analysis, without suppositions or surmises without doubts and without questioning. It was an instant of full, direct, purely instinctive joy. But at that very moment something like a thunderstorm took place in the office. The assistant superintendent, still shaken by Raskolnikov's disrespect, still fuming and obviously anxious to keep up his wounded dignity, pounced on the unfortunate smart lady, who had been gazing at him ever since he came in with an exceedingly silly smile. "'You shameful hussy!' he shouted suddenly at the top of his voice. The lady in mourning had left the office. "'What was going on at your house last night, eh? A disgrace again! You're a scandal to the whole street! Fighting and drinking again! Do you want the house of correction? Why, I have warned you ten times over that I would not let you off the eleventh! And here you are again, again you, you!' The paper fell out of Raskolnikov's hands, and he looked wildly at the smart lady who was so unceremoniously treated. But he soon saw what it meant, and at once began to find positive amusement in the scandal. He listened with pleasure, so that he longed to laugh and laugh. All his nerves were on edge. "'Ilya Petrovitch!' the head clerk was beginning anxiously, but stopped short for he knew from experience that the enraged assistant could not be stopped except by force. As for the smart lady, at first she positively trembled before the storm. But strange to say, the more numerous and violent the terms of abuse became, the more amiable she looked, and the more seductive the smile she lavished on the terrible assistant. She moved uneasily and curtsied incessantly, waiting impatiently for a chance of putting in her word and at last she found it. "'There was no sort of noise or fighting in my house, Mr. Captain,' she pattered all at once, like peas dropping, speaking Russian confidently, though with a strong German accent. "'And no sort of scandal, and his honour came drunk, and it's the whole truth I am telling, Mr. Captain, and I am not to blame. Mine is an honourable house, Mr. Captain, and honourable behaviour, Mr. Captain, and I always, always dislike any scandal myself. But he came quite tipsy, and asked for three bottles again, and then he lifted up one leg and began playing the pianoforte with one foot, and that is not at all right in an honourable house, and he gaunce broke the piano, and it was very bad manners indeed, and I said so, and he took up a bottle and began hitting everyone with it. And then I called the porter, and Carl came, and he took Carl and hit him in the eye, and he hit Henriette in the eye too, and gave me five slaps on the cheek. And it was so ungentlemanly in an honourable house, Mr. Captain, and I screamed, and he opened the window over the canal and stood in the window, squealing like a little pig. It was a disgrace. The idea of squealing like a little pig at the window into the street. Fie upon him! And Carl pulled him away from the window by his coat, and it is true, Mr. Captain, he tore sign rock and then he shouted that man must pay him fifteen roubles damages. And I did pay him, Mr. Captain, five roubles for a sign rock. And he is an ungentlemanly visitor and caused all the scandal. I will show you up, he said, for I can write to all the papers about you. Then he was an author? Yes, Mr. Captain, and what an ungentlemanly visitor in an honourable house. Now then, enough. I have told you already. Ilya Petrovitch the head clerk repeated significantly. The assistant glanced rapidly at him, the head clerk slightly shook his head. "'So, 
I tell you this, most respectable Louise Ivanova, and I tell it you for the last time," the assistant went on. If there is a scandal in your honorable house once again, I will put you yourself in the lock-up, as it is called in polite society. Do you hear? So a literary man, an author took five roubles for his coat-tail in an honorable house. A nice set, these authors!" And he cast a contemptuous glance at Raskolnikov. There was a scandal the other day in a restaurant, too. An author had eaten his dinner and would not pay. I'll write a satire on you, says he. And there was another of them on a steamer last week used the most disgraceful language to the respectable family of a civil counselor, his wife and daughter. And there was one of them turned out of a confectioner's shop the other day. They are all like that, authors, literary men, students, town criers. Phew! You get along. I shall look in upon you myself one day. Then you had better be careful. Do you hear?" With hurried deference, Louise Ivanova fell to curtsying in all directions, and so curtsied herself to the door. But at the door she stumbled backwards against a good-looking officer with a fresh, open face and splendid, thick, fair whiskers. This was the superintendent of the district himself, Nikodim Fomich. Louise Ivanova made haste to curtsy almost to the ground, and with mincing little steps she fluttered out of the office. "'Again, thunder and lightning, a hurricane,' said Nikodim Fomich to Ilya Petrovitch, in a civil and friendly tone. "'You are aroused again, you are fuming again, I heard it on the stairs.' "'Well, what then?' Ilya Petrovitch drawled with gentlemanly nonchalance and he walked with some papers to another table, with a jaunty swing of his shoulders at each step. Here, if you will kindly look. An author, or a student, has been one at least, does not pay his debts, has given an I.O.U., won't clear out of his room, and complaints are constantly being lodged against him, and here he is pleased to make a protest against my smoking in his presence. He behaves like a cad himself, and just look at him, please. Here's the gentleman, and very attractive he is. Poverty is not a vice, my friend, but we know you go off like powder, you can't bear a slight. I dare say you took offence at something and went too far yourself," continued Nikodim Fomich, turning affably to Raskolnikov. But you were wrong there. He is a capital fellow, I assure you, but explosive, explosive. He gets hot, fires up boils over and no stopping him. And then it's all over. And at the bottom he's a heart of gold. His nickname in the regiment was the Explosive Lieutenant." "'And what a regiment it was, too!' cried Ilya Petrovitch, much gratified at this agreeable banter, though still sulky. Raskolnikov had a sudden desire to say something exceptionally pleasant to them all. "'Excuse me, Captain he began easily, suddenly addressing Nikodim Fomich. Will you enter in my position? I am ready to ask pardon, if I have been ill-mannered. I am a poor student, sick and shattered, shattered was the word he used, by poverty. I, I am not studying, because I cannot keep myself now, but I shall get money. I have a mother and sister in the province of X. They will send it to me, and I will pay. My landlady is a good-hearted woman, but she is so exasperated at my having lost my lessons, and not paying her for the last four months, that she does not even send up my dinner. And I don't understand this I.O.U. at all. She is asking me to pay her on this I.O.U. How am I to pay her? Judge for yourselves." "'But that is not our business, you know,' the head clerk was observing. "'Yes, yes, I perfectly agree with you but allow me to explain." Raskolnikov put in again, still addressing Nikodim Fomich, but trying his best to address Ilya Petrovitch also, though the latter persistently appeared to be rummaging among his papers and to be contemptuously oblivious of him. Allow me to explain that I have been living with her for nearly three years, and at first, at first, for why should I not confess it, at the very beginning I promised to marry her daughter, it was a verbal promise, freely given. She was a girl, indeed I liked her, though I was not in love with her. 
a youthful affair, in fact. That is, I mean to say that my landlady gave me credit freely in those days, and I led a life of... I was very heedless." "'Nobody asks you for these personal details, sir. We've no time to waste,' Ilya Petrovitch interposed roughly and with a note of triumph. But Raskolnikov stopped him hotly, though he suddenly found it exceedingly difficult to speak. "'But excuse me, excuse me, it is for me to explain. How it all happened. In my turn. Though I agree with you, it is unnecessary. But a year ago the girl died of typhus. I remained lodging there as before, and when my landlady moved into her present quarters, she said to me, and in a friendly way, that she had complete trust in me, but still would I not give her an I.O.U. for one hundred and fifteen roubles, all the debt I owed her. She said if only I gave her that, she would trust me again, as much as I liked, and that she would never, never, those were her own words, make use of that I.O.U. till I could pay of myself, and now when I have lost my lessons and have nothing to eat, she takes action against me. What am I to say to that?" "'All these affecting details are no business of ours,' Ilya Petrovitch interrupted rudely. "'You must give a written undertaking, but as for your love affairs and all these tragic events, we have nothing to do with that.' "'Come now, you are harsh,' muttered Nikodim Fomitch, sitting down at the table and also beginning to write. He looked a little ashamed. Right, said the head clerk to Raskolnikov. Right what? the latter asked gruffly. I will dictate to you. Raskolnikov fancied that the head clerk treated him more casually and contemptuously after his speech, but strange to say, he suddenly felt completely indifferent to anyone's opinion, and this revulsion took place in a flash, in one instant. If he had cared to think a little, he would have been amazed indeed that he could have talked to them like that a minute before, forcing his feelings upon them. And where had those feelings come from? Now if the whole room had been filled, not with police officers, but with those nearest and dearest to him, he would not have found one human word for them, so empty was his heart. A gloomy sensation of agonizing, everlasting solitude and remoteness took conscious form in his soul. It was not the meanness of his sentimental effusions before Ilya Petrovitch, nor the meanness of the latter's triumph over him that had caused this sudden revulsion in his heart. Oh, what had he to do now with his own baseness, with all these petty vanities, officers, German women, debts, police offices? If he had been sentenced to be burned at that moment, he would not have stirred, would hardly have heard the sentence to the end. Something was happening to him entirely new, sudden and unknown. It was not that he understood, but he felt clearly, with all the intensity of sensation that he could never more appeal to these people in the police office with sentimental effusions like his recent outburst, or with anything whatever, and that if they had been his own brothers and sisters, and not police officers, it would have been utterly out of the question to appeal to them in any circumstance of life. He had never experienced such a strange and awful sensation. And what was most agonizing? It was more a sensation than a conception or idea, a direct sensation, the most agonizing of all the sensations he had known in his life. The head clerk began dictating to him the usual form of declaration, that he could not pay, that he undertook to do so at a future date, that he would not leave the town nor sell his property and so on. But you can't write, you can hardly hold the pen," observed the head clerk, looking with a curiosity at Raskolnikov. Are you ill? Yes, I am giddy. Go on. That's all. Sign it. The head clerk took the paper and turned to attend to others. Raskolnikov gave back the pen. But instead of getting up and going away, he put his elbows on the table and pressed his head in his hands. He felt as if a nail were being driven into his skull. A strange idea suddenly occurred to him, to get up at once, to go to Nikodim Fomitch and tell him everything that had happened yesterday, and then to go with him to his lodgings and to show him the things in the hole in the corner. The impulse was so strong that he got up from his seat to carry it out. "'Hadn't I better think a minute?' flashed through his mind. 
No, better cast off the burden without thinking. But all at once he stood still, rooted to the spot. Nikodim Fomitch was talking eagerly with Ilya Petrovitch, and the words reached him. It's impossible. They'll both be released. To begin with, the whole story contradicts itself. Why should they have called the porter, if it had been their doing? To inform against themselves? Or as a blind? No, that would be too cunning. Besides, Pestrikov, the student, was seen at the gate by both the porters and a woman as she went in. He was walking with three friends, who left him only at the gate, and he asked the porters to direct him in the presence of the friends. Now would he have asked his way if he had been going with such an object? As for Coke, he spent half an hour at the silversmith's below, before he went up to the old woman and left him at exactly quarter to eight. Now just consider. But excuse me, how do you explain this contradiction? They state themselves that they knocked and the door was locked. Yet, three minutes later, when they went up with the porter, it turned out the door was unfastened. That's just it. The murderer must have been there and bolted himself in, and they'd have caught him for certainty if Coke had not been an ass and gone to look for the porter too. He must have seized the interval to get downstairs and slip by them somehow. Cope keeps crossing himself and saying, if I had been there he would have jumped out and killed me with his axe. He is going to have a thanksgiving service, ha ha! And no one saw the murderer? They might well not see him. The house is a regular Noah's Ark," said the head clerk, who was listening. "'It's clear, quite clear,' Nikodim Fomitch repeated warmly. "'No, it's anything but clear,' Ilya Petrovitch maintained. Raskolnikov picked up his hat and walked towards the door, but he did not reach it. When he recovered consciousness, he found himself sitting in a chair, supported by someone on the right side, while someone else was standing on the left, holding a yellowish glass filled with yellow water, and Nikodim Fomitch standing before him, looking intently at him. He got up from the chair. "'What's this? Are you ill?' Nikodim Fomitch asked, rather sharply. He could hardly hold his pen when he was signing," said the head clerk, settling back in his place and taking up his work again. "'Have you been ill long?' cried Ilya Petrovitch from his place, where he too was looking through papers. He had, of course, come to look at the sick man when he fainted, but retired at once when he recovered. "'Since yesterday,' muttered Raskolnikov in reply. "'Did you go out yesterday?' "'Yes though you were ill? Yes. At what time? About seven. And where did you go, may I ask? Along the street. Short and clear. Raskolnikov, white as a handkerchief, had answered sharply, jerkily, without dropping his black, feverish eyes before Ilya Petrovitch's stare. He can scarcely stand upright. And you, Nikodim Fomitch was beginning, no matter," Ilya Petrovitch pronounced rather peculiarly. Nikodim Fomitch would have made some further protest, but glancing at the head clerk who was looking very hard at him, he did not speak. There was a sudden silence. It was strange. "'Very well, then,' concluded Ilya Petrovitch. "'We will not detain you.' Raskolnikov went out. He caught the sound of eager conversation on his departure and above the rest rose the questioning voice of Nikodim Fomitch. In the street his faintness passed off completely. "'A search! There will be a search at once!' he repeated to himself, hurrying home. "'The brutes! They suspect!' His former terror mastered him completely again. End of Part 2 Chapter 1 Part Two, Chapter Two of Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett, 1861 to 1946. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Two, Chapter Two. And what if there has been a search already? What if I find them in my room? But here was his room, nothing and no one in it. No one had peeped in. Even Nastasia had not touched it. But heavens, how could he have left all those things in the hole? He rushed to the corner, 
slipped his hand under the paper, pulled the things out and lined his pockets with them. There were eight articles in all, two little boxes with earrings or something of the sort, he hardly looked to see, then four small leather cases. There was a chain, too, merely wrapped in newspaper and something else in newspaper that looked like a decoration. He put them all in the different pockets of his overcoat, and the remaining pocket of his trousers, trying to conceal them as much as possible. He took the purse, too. Then he went out of his room, leaving the door open. He walked quickly and resolutely, and though he felt shattered, he had his senses about him. He was afraid of pursuit. He was afraid that in another half-hour, another quarter of an hour perhaps, instructions would be issued for his pursuit, and so at all costs he must hide all traces before then. He must clear everything up while he still had some strength, some reasoning power left him. Where was he to go? That had long been settled. Fling them into the canal, and all traces hidden in the water, the thing would be at an end. So he had decided in the night of his delirium when several times he had had the impulse to get up and go away, to make haste and get rid of it all. But to get rid of it turned out to be a very difficult task. He wandered along the bank of the Ekaterininsky Canal for half an hour or more, and looked several times at the steps running down to the water, but he could not think of carrying out his plan. Either rafts stood at the step's edge, and women were washing clothes on them, or boats were moored there, and people were swarming everywhere. Moreover, he could be seen and noticed from the banks on all sides. It would look suspicious for a man to go down on purpose, stop, and throw something into the water. And what if the boxes were to float instead of sinking? And, of course, they would. Even as it was, everyone he met seemed to stare and look round as if they had nothing to do but to watch him. "'Why is it, or can it be my fancy?' he thought. At last the thought struck him that it might be better to go to the Neva. There were not so many people there, he would be less observed, and it would be more convenient in every way, above all it was further off. He wondered how he could have been wandering for a good half-hour, worried and anxious in this dangerous past, without thinking of it before and that half-hour he had lost over an irrational plan, simply because he had thought of it in delirium. He had become extremely absent and forgetful, and he was aware of it. He certainly must make haste. He walked towards the Neva along V Prospect, but on the way another idea struck him. Why to the Neva? Would it not be better to go somewhere far off, to the islands again, and there hide the things in some solitary place, in a wood or under a bush and mark the spot, perhaps? And, though he felt incapable of clear judgment, the idea seemed to him a sound one. But he was not destined to go there, for coming out of V Prospect towards the square he saw on the left a passage leading between two blank walls to a courtyard. On the right hand the blank, unwhitewashed wall of a four-storied house stretched far into the court. On the left a wooden hoarding ran parallel with it for twenty paces into the court, and then turned sharply to the left. Here was a deserted fenced-off place where rubbish of different sorts was lying. At the end of the court, the corner of a low, smutty stone shed, apparently part of some workshop, peeped from behind the hoarding. It was probably a carriage-builder's or carpenter's shed. The whole place from the entrance was black with coal-dust. Here would be the place to throw it, he thought. Not seeing anyone in the yard, he slipped in, and at once saw near the gate a sink, such as is often put in yards where there are many workmen or cab-drivers, and on the hoarding above had been scribbled in chalk the time-honored witticism, standing here strictly forbidden. This was all the better, for there would be nothing suspicious about his going in. Here I could throw it all in a heap and get away. Looking round once more, with his hand already in his pocket, he noticed against the outer wall, between the entrance and the sink, a big unhewn stone, weighing perhaps sixty pounds. The other side of the wall was a street. He could hear passers-by, always numerous in that part, but he could not be seen from the entrance, unless someone came in from the street, which might well happen indeed, so there was need of haste. He bent down over the stone 
seized the top of it firmly in both hands, and using all his strength turned it over. Under the stone was a small hollow in the ground, and he immediately emptied his pocket into it. The purse lay at the top, and yet the hollow was not filled up. Then he seized the stone again and with one twist turned it back so that it was in the same position again, though it stood a very little higher. But he scraped the earth about it and pressed it at the edges with his foot. Nothing could be noticed. Then he went out and turned into the square. Again an intense, almost unbearable joy overwhelmed him for an instant, as it had in the police office. I have buried my tracks, and who, who can think of looking under that stone? It has been lying there most likely ever since the house was built, and will lie as many years more. And if it were found, who would think of me? It is all over. No clue." And he laughed. Yes, he remembered that he began laughing a thin, nervous, noiseless laugh, and went on laughing all the time he was crossing the square. But when he reached the K Boulevard, where two days before he had come upon that girl, his laughter suddenly ceased. Other ideas crept into his mind. He felt all at once that it would be loathsome to pass that seat on which after the girl was gone he had sat and pondered, and that it would be hateful, too, to meet that whiskered policeman to whom he had given the twenty kopecks. Damn him! He walked, looking about him angrily and distractedly. All his ideas now seemed to be circling round some single point, and he felt that there really was such a point, and that now, now he was left facing that point, and for the first time indeed during the last two months. Damn it all! he thought suddenly, in a fit of ungovernable fury. If it has begun, then it has begun. Hang the new life! Good Lord, how stupid it is! And what lies I told today! How despicably I fawned upon that wretched Ilya Petrovitch! But that is all folly! What do I care for them all, and my fawning upon them? It is not that at all! It is not that at all!" Suddenly he stopped. A new, utterly unexpected and exceedingly simple question perplexed and bitterly confounded him. If it all has really been done deliberately and not idiotically, if I really had a certain and definite object, how is it I did not even glance into the purse and don't know what I had there, for which I have undergone these agonies, and have deliberately undertaken this base, filthy, degrading business? And here I wanted at once to throw into the water the purse together with all the things which I had not seen either. How's that? Yes, that was so. That was all so. Yet he had known it all before, and it was not a new question for him, even when it was decided in the night without hesitation and consideration, as though so it must be, as though it could not possibly be otherwise. Yes, he had known it all and understood it all. It surely had been all settled even yesterday at the moment when he was bending over the box and pulling the jewel cases out of it. Yes, so it was. It is because I am very ill, he decided grimly at last. I have been worrying and fretting myself, and I don't know what I am doing. Yesterday and the day before yesterday and all this time I have been worrying myself. I shall get well and I shall not worry. But what if I don't get well at all? Good God, how sick I am of it all!" He walked on without resting. He had a terrible longing for some distraction, but he did not know what to do, what to attempt. A new overwhelming sensation was gaining more and more mastery over him every moment. This was an immeasurable, almost physical repulsion for everything surrounding him, an obstinate, malignant feeling of hatred. All who met him were loathsome to him. He loathed their faces, their movements, their gestures. If anyone had addressed him, he felt that he might have spat at him or bitten him. He stopped suddenly on coming out on the bank of the little Neva, near the bridge to Vasilyevsky Ostrov. Why, he lives here, in that house, he thought. Why, I have not come to Resumian of my own accord. Here it's the same thing over again. Very interesting to know, though, 
Have I come on purpose, or have I simply walked here by chance? Never mind, I said the day before yesterday that I would go and see him the day after. Well, and so I will. Besides, I really cannot go further now." He went up to Razumian's room on the fifth floor. The latter was at home in his garret, busily writing at the moment, and he opened the door himself. It was four months since they had seen each other. Razumian was sitting in a ragged dressing-gown, with slippers on his bare feet, unkempt, unshaven, and unwashed. His face showed surprise. "'Is it you?' he cried. He looked his comrade up and down, then, after a brief pause, he whistled. "'As hard up as all that! Why, brother, you've cut me out!' he added, looking at Raskolnikov's rags. "'Come, sit down. You are tired, I'll be bound.' And when he had sunk down on the American leather sofa, which was in even worse condition than his own, Razumian saw at once that his visitor was ill. "'Why, you are seriously ill, do you know that?' He began feeling his pulse. Raskolnikov pulled away his hand. "'Never mind,' he said. "'I have come for this. I have no lessons. I wanted, but I don't really want lessons.' "'But I say! You are delirious, you know," Razumian observed, watching him carefully. No, I am not. Raskolnikov got up from the sofa. As he had mounted the stairs to Razumian's, he had not realized that he would be meeting his friend face to face. Now, in a flash, he knew that what he was least of all disposed for at that moment was to be face to face with anyone in the wide world. His spleen rose within him. He almost choked with rage at himself as soon as he crossed Razumian's threshold. Goodbye, he said abruptly, and walked to the door. Stop! Stop, you queer fish! I don't want to, said the other, again pulling away his hand. Then why the devil have you come? Are you mad or what? Why, this is almost insulting! I won't let you go like that! Well, then, I came to you because I know no one but you who could help. To begin, because you are kinder than anyone, cleverer, I mean, and can judge. And now I see that I want nothing. Do you hear? Nothing at all. No one's services, no one's sympathy. I am by myself, alone. Come, that's enough. Leave me alone. Stay a minute, you sweep. You are a perfect madman as you like for all I care. I have no lessons, do you see, and I don't care about that. But there's a bookseller, Haruvamov, and he takes the place of a lesson. I would not exchange him for five lessons. He's doing publishing of a kind, and issuing natural science manuals and what a circulation they have. The very titles are worth the money. You always maintain that I was a fool, but, by Jove, my boy, there are greater fools than I am. Now he is setting up for being advanced, not that he has an inkling of anything, but, of course, I encourage him. Here are two signatures of the German text, in my opinion the crudest charlatanism. It discusses the question, is woman a human being, and, of course, triumphantly proves that she is. Haruvamov is going to bring out this work as a contribution to the woman question. I am translating it. He will expand these two and a half signatures into six. We shall make up a gorgeous title half a page long and bring it out at half a rouble. It will do. He pays me six roubles the signature. It works out to about fifteen roubles for the job, and I've had six already in advance. When we have finished this we are going to begin a translation about whales, and then some of the dullest scandals out of the second part of Les Confessions we have marked for translation. Somebody has told Haruvamov that Rousseau was a kind of Radishev. You may be sure I don't contradict him, hang him. Well, would you like to do the second signature of Is Woman a Human Being? If you would, take the German and pens and paper, all those are provided, and take three roubles, for as I have had six roubles in advance on the whole thing, three roubles come to you for your share. And when you have finished the signature there will be another three roubles for you. And please don't think I'm doing you a service. Quite the contrary. As soon as you came in, I saw how you could help me. To begin with, 
I am weak in spelling, and secondly, I am sometimes utterly adrift in German, so that I make it up as I go along for the most part. The only comfort is that it's bound to be a change for the better. Though who can tell, maybe it's sometimes for the worse. Will you take it?" Raskolnikov took the German sheets in silence, took the three roubles and without a word went out. Razumihin gazed after him in astonishment. But when Raskolnikov was in the next street, he turned back, mounted the stairs to Razumihin's again and laying on the table the German article and the three roubles, went out again, still without uttering a word. "'Are you raving or what?' Razumihin shouted, roused to fury at last. "'What farce is this? You'll drive me crazy, too! What did you come to see me for, damn you?' "'I don't want—translation,' muttered Raskolnikov from the stairs. "'Then what the devil do you want?' shouted Razumihin from above. Raskolnikov continued descending the staircase in silence. "'Hey there! Where are you living?' No answer. "'Well, confound you, then!' But Raskolnikov was already stepping into the street. On the Nikolevsky Bridge, he was roused to full consciousness again by an unpleasant incident. A coachman, after shouting at him two or three times, gave him a violent lash on the back with his whip, for having almost fallen under the horse's hoofs. The lash so infuriated him that he dashed away to the railing, for some unknown reason he had been walking in the very middle of the bridge in the traffic. He angrily clenched and ground his teeth. He heard laughter, of course. Serves him right! A pickpocket, I dare say! Pretending to be drunk, for sure, and getting under the wheels on purpose! And you have to answer for him! It's a regular profession, that's what it is!" But while he stood at the railing, still looking angry and bewildered after the retreating carriage, and rubbing his back, he suddenly felt someone thrust money into his hand. He looked. It was an elderly woman in a kerchief and goatskin shoes, with a girl, probably her daughter, wearing a hat and carrying a green parasol. "'Take it, my good man, in Christ's name!' He took it and they passed on. It was a piece of twenty kopecks. From his dress and appearance they might well have taken him for a beggar asking alms in the streets, and the gift of twenty kopecks he doubtless owed to the blow, which made them feel sorry for him. He closed his hand on the twenty kopecks, walked on for ten paces, and turned facing the Neva, looking towards the palace. The sky was without a cloud and the water was almost bright blue, which is so rare in the Neva. The cupola of the cathedral, which is seen at its best from the bridge about twenty paces from the chapel, glittered in the sunlight, and in the pure air every ornament on it could be clearly distinguished. The pain from the lash went off and Raskolnikov forgot about it. One uneasy and not quite definite idea occupied him now completely. He stood still, and gazed long and intently into the distance. This spot was especially familiar to him. When he was attending the university, he had hundreds of times, generally on his way home, stood still on this spot, gazed at this truly magnificent spectacle and almost always marveled at a vague and mysterious emotion it roused in him. It left him strangely cold. This gorgeous picture was for him blank and lifeless. He wondered every time at his somber and enigmatic impression, and, mistrusting himself, put off finding the explanation of it. He vividly recalled those old doubts and perplexities, and it seemed to him that it was no mere chance that he recalled them now. It struck him as strange and grotesque that he should have stopped at the same spot as before as though he actually imagined he could think the same thoughts, be interested in the same theories and pictures that had interested him so short a time ago. He felt it almost amusing, and yet it wrung his heart. Deep down, hidden far away out of sight, all that seemed to him now, all his old past, his old thoughts, his old problems and theories, his old impressions, and that picture and himself and all, all, he felt as though he were flying upwards, and everything were vanishing from his sight. Making an unconscious movement with his hand, he suddenly became aware of the piece of money in his fist. He opened his hand, stared at the coin, and with a sweep of his arm flung it into the water. 
Then he turned and went home. It seemed to him he had cut himself off from everyone and from everything at that moment. Evening was coming on when he reached home, so that he must have been walking about six hours. How and where he came back he did not remember. Undressing and quivering like an overdriven horse, he lay down on the sofa, drew his greatcoat over him, and at once sank into oblivion. It was dusk when he was waked up by a fearful scream. Good God, what a scream! Such unnatural sounds, such howling, wailing, grinding, tears, blows and curses he had never heard. He could never have imagined such brutality, such frenzy. In terror he sat up in bed, almost swooning with agony. But the fighting, wailing and cursing grew louder and louder. And then, to his intense amazement, he caught the voice of his landlady. She was howling, shrieking and wailing, rapidly, hurriedly, incoherently, so that he could not make out what she was talking about. She was beseeching, no doubt, not to be beaten, for she was being mercilessly beaten on the stairs. The voice of her assailant was so horrible, from spite and rage, that it was almost a croak. But he too was saying something, and just as quickly and indistinctly, hurrying and spluttering. All at once Raskolnikov trembled. He recognized the voice. It was the voice of Ilya Petrovitch. Ilya Petrovitch here and beating the landlady. He is kicking her, banging her head against the steps. That's clear, that can be told from the sounds, from the cries and the thuds. How is it? Is the world topsy-turvy? He could hear people running in crowds from all the stories and all the staircases. He heard voices, exclamations, knocking, doors banging. But why? Why and how could it be? he repeated, thinking seriously that he had gone mad. But no, he heard too distinctly. And they would come to him then next. For, no doubt, it's all about that, about yesterday. Good God! He would have fastened his door with the latch, but he could not lift his hand. Besides, it would be useless. Terror gripped his heart like ice, tortured him and numbed him. But at last all this uproar, after continuing about ten minutes, began gradually to subside. The landlady was moaning and groaning. Ilya Petrovitch was still uttering threats and curses. But at last he too seemed to be silent, and now he could not be heard. Can he have gone away? Good Lord! Yes, and now the landlady was going too, still weeping and moaning, and then her door slammed. Now the crowd was going from the stairs to their rooms, exclaiming, disputing, calling to one another, raising their voices to a shout, dropping them to a whisper. There must have been numbers of them, almost all the inmates of the block. But, good God, how could it be? And why, why had he come here? Raskolnikov sank worn out on the sofa, but could not close his eyes. He lay for half an hour in such anguish, such an intolerable sensation of infinite terror as he had never experienced before. Suddenly a bright light flashed into his room. Nastasya came in with a candle and a plate of soup. Looking at him carefully and ascertaining that he was not asleep, she set the candle on the table and began to lay out what she had brought bread, salt, a plate, a spoon. You've eaten nothing since yesterday, I warrant. You've been trudging about all day and you're shaking with fever. Nastasya, what were they beating the landlady for? She looked intently at him. Who beat the landlady? Just now, half an hour ago, Ilya Petrovitch, the assistant superintendent, on the stairs. Why was he ill-treating her like that, and— why was he here?" Nastasya scrutinized him, silent and frowning, and her scrutiny lasted a long time. He felt uneasy, even frightened at her searching eyes. "'Nastasya, why don't you speak?' he said timidly at last in a weak voice. "'It's the blood,' she answered at last, softly, as though speaking to herself. "'Blood? What blood?' he muttered, growing white and turning towards the wall. Nastasya still looked at him without speaking. Nobody has been beating the landlady. 
she declared at last in a firm, resolute voice. He gazed at her, hardly able to breathe. "'I heard it myself. I was not asleep. I was sitting up,' he said still more timidly. I listened a long while. The assistant superintendent came. Everyone ran out onto the stairs from all the flats. No one has been here. That's the blood crying in your ears. When there's no outlet for it and it gets clotted, you begin fancying things. Will you eat something?" He made no answer. Nastasia still stood over him, watching him. "'Give me something to drink, Nastasia.' She went downstairs and returned with a white earthenware jug of water. He remembered only swallowing one sip of the cold water and spilling some on his neck. Then followed forgetfulness. End of Part 2 Chapter 2 Part 2 Chapter 3 of Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky Translated by Constance Garnett, 1861-1946 this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Two, Chapter Three. He was not completely unconscious, however, all the time he was ill. He was in a feverish state, sometimes delirious, sometimes half conscious. He remembered a great deal afterwards. Sometimes it seemed as though there were a number of people round him. They wanted to take him away somewhere. There was a great deal of squabbling and discussing about him. Then he would be alone in the room. They had all gone away afraid of him, and only now and then opened the door a crack to look at him. They threatened him, plotted something together, laughed and mocked at him. He remembered Nastasia often at his bedside. He distinguished another person, too, whom he seemed to know very well, though he could not remember who he was, and this fretted him, even made him cry. Sometimes he fancied he had been lying there a month. At other times it all seemed part of the same day. But of that, of that, he had no recollection, and yet every minute he felt that he had forgotten something he ought to remember. He worried and tormented himself trying to remember, moaned, flew into a rage, or sank into awful, intolerable terror. Then he struggled to get up, would have run away, but someone always prevented him by force and he sank back into impotence and forgetfulness. At last he returned to complete consciousness. It happened at ten o'clock in the morning. On fine days the sun shone into the room at that hour, throwing a streak of light on the right wall and the corner near the door. Nastasia was standing beside him with another person, a complete stranger, who was looking at him very inquisitively. He was a young man with a beard, wearing a full, short-waisted coat and looked like a messenger. The landlady was peeping in at the half-open door. Raskolnikov sat up. "'Who is this, Nastasia?' he asked, pointing to the young man. "'I say, he's himself again,' she said. "'He is himself,' echoed the man. Concluding that he had returned to his senses, the landlady closed the door and disappeared. She was always shy and dreaded conversations or discussions. She was a woman of forty, not at all bad-looking, fat and buxom, with black eyes and eyebrows, good-natured from fatness and laziness, and absurdly bashful. "'Who are you?' he went on, addressing the man. But at that moment the door was flung open, and, stooping a little, as he was so tall, Razumian came in. "'What a cabin it is!' he cried. "'I am always knocking my head!' You call this a lodging. So, you're conscious, brother. I just heard the news from Pashenka." "'He has just come too,' said Nastasia. "'Just come too,' echoed the man again, with a smile. "'And who are you?' Razumian asked, suddenly addressing him. "'My name is Vrazumian, at your service. Not Razumian, as I am always called, but Vrazumian, a student and a gentleman. And he is my friend. And who are you? I am the messenger from our office, from the merchant Shepolev, and I've come on business. Please sit down, Razumian seated himself on the other side of the table. It's a good thing you've come too, brother, he went on to Raskolnikov. 
For the last four days you have scarcely eaten or drunk anything. We had to give you tea in spoonfuls. I brought Zosimov to see you twice. You remember Zosimov. He examined you carefully and said at once it was nothing serious. Something seemed to have gone to your head. Some nervous nonsense. The result of bad feeling, he says you have not had enough beer and radish, but it's nothing much. It will pass, and you will be all right. Zosimov is a first-rate fellow. He is making quite a name. Come, I won't keep you, he said, addressing the man again. Will you explain what you want? You must know, Rodya, that this is the second time they have sent from the office. But it was another man last time, and I talked to him. Who was it came before? That was the day before yesterday, I ventured to say, if you please, sir. That was Alexei Semyonovitch. He is in our office, too. He was more intelligent than you, don't you think so? Yes, indeed, sir. He is of more weight than I am. Quite so. Go on. At your mamma's request, through Afanasy Ivanovitch Varushin, of whom I presume you have heard more than once, a remittance is sent to you from our office, the man began, addressing Raskolnikov. If you are in an intelligible condition, I've thirty-five roubles to remit to you, as Semyon Semyonovitch has received from Afanasy Ivanovitch at your mamma's request instructions to that effect, as on previous occasions. Do you know him, sir? Yes, I remember. Varushin, Raskolnikov said dreamily. You hear, he knows Varushin, cried Razumian. He is in an intelligible condition. And I see you are an intelligent man, too. Well, it's always pleasant to hear words of wisdom. That's the gentleman, Varushin, Afanasy Ivanovitch. And at the request of your mamma, who has sent you a remittance once before in the same manner through him, he did not refuse this time also and sent instructions to Semyon Semyonovitch some days since to hand you thirty-five roubles in the hope of better to come. That hoping for better to come is the best thing you've said, though your mamma is not bad either. Come then, what do you say? Is he fully conscious, eh? That's all right, if only he can sign this little paper. He can scrawl his name. Have you got the book? Yes, here's the book. Give it to me. Here, Rodya, sit up, I'll hold you. Take the pen and scribble Raskolnikov for him. For just now, brother, money is sweeter to us than treacle." "'I don't want it,' said Raskolnikov, pushing away the pen. "'Not want it? I won't sign it. How the devil can you do without signing it? I don't want the money. Don't want the money? Come, brother, that's nonsense. I bear witness. Don't trouble, please. It's only that he is on his travels again. But that's pretty common with him at all times, though. You are a man of judgment, and we will take him in hand, that is, more simply, take his hand and he will sign it. Here. But I can come another time. No, no! Why should we trouble you? You are a man of judgment." Now, Rodya, don't keep your visitor. You see he is waiting. And he made ready to hold Raskolnikov's hand in earnest. Stop, I'll do it alone," said the latter, taking the pen and signing his name. The messenger took out the money and went away. Bravo! And now, brother, are you hungry? Yes, answered Raskolnikov. Is there any soup? Some of yesterday's, answered Nastasya, who was still standing there. With potatoes and rice in it? Yes. I know it by heart. Bring soup and give us some tea. Very well. Raskolnikov looked at all this with profound astonishment and a dull, unreasoning terror. He made up his mind to keep quiet and see what would happen. I believe I am not wandering. I believe it's reality, he thought. In a couple of minutes Nastasia returned with the soup and announced that the tea would be ready directly. With the soup she brought two spoons, two plates, salt, pepper, mustard for the beef, and so on. The table was set as it had not been for a long time. The cloth was clean. It would not be amiss, Nastasia, if Praskovia Pavlovna were to send up a couple of bottles of beer. We could empty them. Well, you are a cool hand, muttered Nastasia, and she departed to carry out his orders. Raskolnikov still gazed wildly with strained attention. 
Meanwhile, Razumian sat down on the sofa beside him, as clumsily as a bear put his left arm round Raskolnikov's head, although he was able to sit up, and with his right hand gave him a spoonful of soup, blowing on it that it might not burn him. But the soup was only just warm. Raskolnikov swallowed one spoonful greedily, then a second, then a third. But after giving him a few more spoonfuls of soup, Razumian suddenly stopped and said that he must ask Zosimov whether he ought to have more. Nastasya came in with two bottles of beer. "'And will you have tea?' "'Yes.' "'Cut along, Nastasya, and bring some tea, for tea we may venture on without the faculty. But here is the beer.' He moved back to his chair, pulled the soup and meat in front of him, and began eating as though he had not touched food for three days. "'I must tell you, Rodya, I dine like this here every day now.' he mumbled with his mouth full of beef. And it's all Pashenka, you dear little landlady, who sees to that. She loves to do anything for me. I don't ask for it, but, of course, I don't object. And here's Nastasia with the tea. She's a quick girl. Nastasia, my dear, won't you have some beer? Get along with your nonsense. A cup of tea, then? A cup of tea, maybe. Pour it out. Stay. I'll pour it out myself. Sit down. He poured out two cups, left his dinner, and sat on the sofa again. As before, he put his left arm round the sick man's head, raised him up and gave him tea in spoonfuls, again blowing each spoonful steadily and earnestly, as though this process was the principal and most effective means towards his friend's recovery. Raskolnikov said nothing and made no resistance, though he felt quite strong enough to sit up on the sofa without support, and could not merely have held a cup or a spoon but even, perhaps, could have walked about. But from some queer, almost animal cunning, he conceived the idea of hiding his strength and lying low for a time, pretending, if necessary, not to be yet in full possession of his faculties, and meanwhile listening to find out what was going on. Yet he could not overcome his sense of repugnance. After sipping a dozen spoonfuls of tea, he suddenly released his head, pushed the spoon away capriciously, and sank back on the pillow. There were actually real pillows under his head now, down pillows in clean cases. He observed that, too, and took note of it. "'Pashenka must give us some raspberry jam today to make him some raspberry tea,' said Razumian, going back to his chair and attacking his soup and beer again. "'And where is she to get raspberries for you?' asked Nastasia, balancing a saucer on her five outspread fingers and sipping tea through a lump of sugar. "'She'll get it at the shop, my dear.' You see, Rodya, all sorts of things have been happening while you have been laid up. When you decamped in that rascally way without leaving your address, I felt so angry that I resolved to find you out and punish you. I set to work that very day. How I ran about making inquiries for you! This lodging of yours I had forgotten, though I never remembered it, indeed because I did not know it. And as for your old lodgings, I could only remember it was at the Five Corners. Harlamov's house. I kept trying to find that Harlamov's house, and afterwards it turned out that it was not Harlamov's, but books. How one muddles up sounds sometimes! So I lost my temper, and I went on the chance to the address bureau next day, and, only fancy, in two minutes they looked you up. Your name is down there." My name? I should think so. And yet a General Kobolev they could not find while I was there. Well, it's a long story. But as soon as I did land on this place, I soon got to know all your affairs. All, all, brother, I know everything. Nastasia here will tell you. I made the acquaintance of Nikodim Fomitch and Ilya Petrovich, and the house-porter and Mr. Zemitov, Alexander Grigorovich, the head clerk in the police office, and last but not least of Pashenka. Nastasia here knows. He's got rounder. Nastasya murmured, smiling slyly. "'Why don't you put the sugar in your tea, Nastasya Nikiforovna?' "'You are a one,' Nastasya cried suddenly, going off into a giggle. "'I am not Nikiforovna, but Petrovna,' she said suddenly, recovering from her mirth. "'I'll make a note of it. Well, brother, to make a long story short, I was going in for a regular explosion here to uproot all malignant influences in the locality.' But Pashenka won the day. 
I had not expected, brother, to find her so prepossessing. Eh, what do you think?" Raskolnikov did not speak, but he still kept his eyes fixed upon him, full of alarm. "'And all that could be wished, indeed, in every respect,' Razumian went on, not at all embarrassed by his silence. "'Ah, the sly dog!' Nastasia shrieked again. This conversation afforded her unspeakable delight. "'It's a pity, brother, that you did not set to work in the right way at first. You ought to have approached her differently. She is, so to speak, a most unaccountable character. But we will talk about her character later. How could you let things come to such a pass that she gave up sending you your dinner? And that I owe you! You must have been mad to sign an I owe you! And that promise of marriage when her daughter, Natalia Yegorovna, was alive? I know all about it. But I see that's a delicate matter, and I am an ass. Forgive me. But talking of foolishness, do you know Praskovia Pavlovna is not nearly so foolish as you would think at first sight?" No, mumbled Raskolnikov, looking away, but feeling that it was better to keep up the conversation. She isn't, is she? cried Razumian, delighted to get an answer out of him. But she is not very clever either, eh? She is essentially, essentially an unaccountable character. I am sometimes quite at a loss, I assure you. She must be forty. She says she is thirty-six, and of course she has every right to say so. But I swear I judge her intellectually simply from the metaphysical point of view. There is a sort of symbolism sprung up between us, a sort of algebra or what not. I don't understand it. Well, that's all nonsense. Only, seeing that you are not a student now and have lost your lessons and your clothes, and that through the young lady's death she has no need to treat you as a relation, she suddenly took fright. And as you hid in your den and dropped all your old relations with her, she planned to get rid of you. And she's been cherishing that design a long time, but she was sorry to lose the I.O.U., for you assured her yourself that your mother would pay." It was base of me to say that. My mother herself is almost a beggar. And I told a lie to keep my lodging, and be fed. Raskolnikov said, loudly and distinctly. Yes, you did very sensibly. But the worst of it is that, at that point, Mr. Chebarov turns up, a businessman. Pashenka would never have thought of doing anything on her own account, she is too retiring. But the businessman is by no means retiring, and first thing, he puts the question, is there any hope of realizing the I.O.U.? Answer, there is because he has a mother who would save her Rodya with her hundred and twenty-five roubles pension if she has to starve herself, and a sister, too, who would go into bondage for his sake. That's what he was building upon. Why do you start? I know all the ins and outs of your affairs now, my dear boy. It's not for nothing that you were so open with Pashenka when you were her prospective son-in-law, and I say all this as a friend. But I tell you what it is. An honest and sensitive man is open, and a businessman listens and goes on eating you up. Well, then she gave the I.O.U. by way of payment to this Chebarov, and without hesitation he made a formal demand for payment. When I heard of all this I wanted to blow him up too, to clear my conscience, but by that time harmony reigned between me and Pashenka, and I insisted on stopping the whole affair, engaging that you would pay. I went security for you, brother. Do you understand? We called Chebarov, flung him ten roubles, and got the I.O.U. back from him, and here I have the honor of presenting it to you. She trusts your word now. Here, take it. You see, I have torn it." Razumian put the note on the table. Raskolnikov looked at him and turned to the wall without uttering a word. Even Razumian felt a twinge. "'I see, brother,' he said a moment later, "'that I have been playing the fool again. I thought I should amuse you with my chatter, and I believe I have only made you cross." "'Was it you I did not recognize when I was delirious?' Raskolnikov asked, after a moment's pause, without turning his head. "'Yes, and you flew into a rage about it, especially when I brought Zamatov one day.' "'Zamatov? The head clerk? What for?' Raskolnikov turned round quickly and fixed his eyes on Razumian. "'What's the matter with you?' What are you upset about? 
He wanted to make your acquaintance because I talked to him a lot about you. How could I have found out so much except from him? He is a capital fellow, brother, first-rate. In his own way, of course. Now we are friends, see each other almost every day. I have moved into this part, you know. I have only just moved. I've been with him to Louise Ivanovna once or twice. Do you remember Louise, Louise Ivanovna?" Did I say anything in delirium? I should think so. You were beside yourself. What did I rave about? What next? What did you rave about? What people do rave about? Well, brother, now I must not lose time. To work." He got up from the table and took up his cap. What did I rave about? How he keeps on! Are you afraid of having let out some secret? Don't worry yourself. You said nothing about a countess. But you said a lot about a bulldog, and about earrings and chains, and about Krestovsky Island, and some porter, and Nikodim Fomich and Ilya Petrovich, the assistant superintendent. And another thing that was of special interest to you was your own sock. You whined, Give me my sock! Zamatov hunted all about your room for your socks, and with his own scented, ring-bedecked fingers he gave you the rag. And only then were you comforted, and for the next twenty-four hours you held the wretched thing in your hand. We could not get it from you. It is most likely somewhere under your quilt at this moment. And then you asked so piteously for fringe for your trousers. We tried to find out what sort of fringe, but we could not make it out. Now to business. Here are thirty-five roubles. I take ten of them, and shall give you an account of them in an hour or two. I will let Zosimov know at the same time, though he ought to have been here long ago, for it is nearly twelve. And you, Nastasia, look in pretty often while I am away, to see whether he wants a drink or anything else, and I will tell Pashenka what is wanted myself. Good-bye!" He calls her Pashenka. Ah, uh, he's a deep one said Nastasia as he went out. Then she opened the door and stood listening, but could not resist running downstairs after him. She was very eager to hear what he would say to the landlady. She was evidently quite fascinated by Razumian. No sooner had she left the room than the sick man flung off the bedclothes and leapt out of the bed like a madman. With burning, twitching impatience he had waited for them to be gone so that he might set to work. But to what work? now, as though despite him, it eluded him. Good God, only tell me one thing! Do they know of it yet or not? What if they know it and are only pretending, mocking me while I am laid up, and then they will come in and tell me that it's been discovered long ago, and that they have only... What am I to do now? That's what I've forgotten, as though on purpose. Forgotten it all at once, I remembered a minute ago. He stood in the middle of the room and gazed in miserable bewilderment about him. He walked to the door, opened it, listened. But that was not what he wanted. Suddenly, as though recalling something, he rushed to the corner where there was a hole under the paper, began examining it, put his hand into the hole, fumbled. But that was not it. He went to the stove, opened it, and began rummaging in the ashes. The frayed edges of his trousers and the rags cut off his pocket were lying there just as he had thrown them. No one had looked then. Then he remembered the sock about which Razumian had just been telling him. Yes, there it lay on the sofa under the quilt, but it was so covered with dust and grime that Zamatov could not have seen anything on it. Bah, Zamatov! The police office! And why am I sent for to the police office? Where's the notice? Bah! I am mixing it up. That was then. I looked at my sock then, too, but now... now I have been ill. But what did Zamatov come for? Why did Razumian bring him?" he muttered, helplessly sitting on the sofa again. What does it mean? Am I still in delirium, or is it real? I believe it is real. Ah! I remember. I must escape. Make haste to escape! Yes, I must, I must escape! Yes! But where? And where are my clothes? I've no boots. They've taken them away. They've hidden them. I understand. Ah, here is my coat. They pass that over. And here is money on the table, thank God. And here's the I.O.U. 
I'll take the money and go and take another lodging. They won't find me. Yes, but the address bureau. They'll find me, Resumi and will find me. Better escape altogether, far away, to America, and let them do their worst. And take the I.O.U. It would be of use there. What else shall I take? They think I am ill. They don't know that I can walk. Ha, ha, ha! I could see by their eyes that they don't know all about it. If only I could get downstairs. And what if they have set a watch there, policeman? What's this tea? Ah, and here is beer left, half a bottle, cold. He snatched up the bottle, which still contained a glass full of beer, and gulped it down with a relish, as though quenching a flame in his breast. But in another minute the beer had gone to his head, and a faint and even pleasant shiver ran down his spine. He lay down and pulled a quilt over him. His sick and incoherent thoughts grew more and more disconnected, and soon a light, pleasant drowsiness came upon him. With a sense of comfort he nestled his head into the pillow, wrapped more closely about him the soft, wadded quilt which had replaced the old ragged greatcoat, sighed softly, and sank into a deep, sound, refreshing sleep. He woke up, hearing someone come in. He opened his eyes and saw Razumian standing in the doorway, uncertain whether to come in or not. Raskolnikov sat up quickly on the sofa and gazed at him, as though trying to recall something. "'Ah, you are not asleep! Here I am! Nastasya, bring in the parcel!' Razumian shouted down the stairs. "'You shall have the account directly.' "'What time is it?' asked Raskolnikov, looking round uneasily. "'Yes, you had a fine sleep, brother. It's almost evening. It will be six o'clock directly. You have slept more than six hours.' "'Good heavens, have I?' And why not? It will do you good. What's the hurry? A tryst, is it? We've all the time before us. I've been waiting for the last three hours for you. I've been up twice and found you asleep. I've called on Zosimov twice. Not at home, only fancy. But no matter, he will turn up. And I've been out of my own business, too. You know I've been moving today, moving with my uncle. I have an uncle living with me now. But that's no matter, to business. Give me the parcel, Nastasia. We will open it directly. And how do you feel now, brother?" "'I am quite well. I am not ill. Razumian, have you been here long?' "'I tell you, I've been waiting for the last three hours. No, before.' "'How do you mean? How long have you been coming here?' "'Why, I told you all about it this morning. Don't you remember?' Raskolnikov pondered. The morning seemed like a dream to him. He could not remember alone, and looked inquiringly at Razumian. Hm, said the latter. He has forgotten. I fancied then that you were not quite yourself. Now you are better for your sleep. You really look much better. First rate. Well, to business. Look here, my dear boy. He began untying the bundle, which evidently interested him. Believe me, brother, this is something specially near my heart, for we must make a man of you. Let's begin from the top. Do you see this cap?" he said, taking out of the bundle a fairly good though cheap and ordinary cap. Let me try it on. Presently, afterwards, said Raskolnikov, waving it off pettishly. Come, Rodya, my boy, don't oppose it. Afterwards will be too late, and I shan't sleep all night, for I bought it by guess, without measure. Just right, he cried triumphantly, fitting it on. Just your size. A proper head covering is the first thing in dress, and a recommendation in its own way. Tolstyakov, a friend of mine, is always obliged to take off his pudding basin when he goes into any public place where other people wear their hats or caps. People think he does it from slavish politeness, but it's simply because he is ashamed of his bird's nest. He is such a boastful fellow. Look, Nastasya, here are two specimens of headgear. This Palmerston, he took from the corner Raskolnikov's old battered hat, which for some unknown reason he called Palmerston. Or this jewel. Guess the price, Rodya. What do you suppose I paid for it, Nastasya? He said, turning to her, seeing that Raskolnikov did not speak. Twenty kopecks, no more, I dare say, answered Nastasya. 
Twenty kopecks, silly! he cried, offended. Why, nowadays you would cost more than that. Eighty kopecks! And that only because it has been worn. And it's bought on condition that, when it's worn out, they will give you another next year. Yes, on my word! Well, now let us pass to the United States of America, as they called them at school. I assure you I am proud of these breeches." And he exhibited to Raskolnikov a pair of light, summer trousers of grey woolen material. No holes, no spots, and quite respectable, although a little worn, and a waistcoat to match, quite in the fashion. And it's being worn really as an improvement. It's softer, smoother. You see, Rodya, to my thinking, the great thing for getting on in the world is always to keep to the seasons. If you don't insist on having asparagus in January, you keep your money in your purse, and it's the same with this purchase. It's summer now, so I've been buying summer things. Warmer materials will be wanted for autumn, so you'll have to throw these away in any case, especially as they will be done for by then from their own lack of coherence if not your higher standard of luxury. Come, price them. What do you say? Two rubles, twenty-five kopecks. And remember the condition. If you wear these out, you will have another suit for nothing. They only do business on that system at Fadiev's. If you've bought a thing once, you are satisfied for life, for you will never go there again of your own free will. Now for the boots. What do you say? You see that they are a bit worn, but they'll last a couple of months, for it's foreign work and foreign leather. The secretary of the English embassy sold them last week. He had only worn them six days, but he was very short of cash. Price? A rouble and a half. A bargain? But perhaps they won't fit, observed Nastasia. Not fit? Just look! And he pulled out of his pocket Raskolnikov's old broken boot, stiffly coated with dry mud. I did not go empty-handed. They took the size from this monster. We all did our best. And as to your linen, your landlady has seen to that. Here, to begin with, are three shirts, hempen but with a fashionable front. Well, now then, eighty kopecks the cap, two roubles twenty-five kopecks the suit, together three roubles five kopecks, a rouble and a half for the boots, for you see they are very good, and that makes four roubles fifty-five kopecks, five roubles for the underclothes, they were bought in the low, which makes exactly nine roubles fifty-five kopecks. Fifty-five kopecks change in coppers. Will you take it? And so, Rodya, you are set up with a complete new rig-out, for your overcoat will serve, and even has a style of its own. That comes from getting one's clothes from charmers. As for your socks and other things, I leave them to you. We've twenty-five roubles left. And as for Pashenka and paying for your lodging, don't you worry. I tell you, she'll trust you for anything. And now, brother, let me change your linen, for I dare say you will throw off your illness with your shirt. Let me be. I don't want to." Raskolnikov waved him off. He had listened with disgust to Razumian's efforts to be playful about his purchases. "'Come, brother, don't tell me I've been trudging around for nothing,' Razumian insisted. "'Nastasia, don't be bashful, but help me. That's it.' And in spite of Raskolnikov's resistance, he changed his linen. The latter sank back on the pillows and for a minute or two said nothing. It will be long before I get rid of them, he thought. What money was all that bought with? he asked at last, gazing at the wall. Money? Why, your own, what the messenger brought from Verushin, your mother sent it. Have you forgotten that too? I remember now said Raskolnikov after a long, sullen silence. Razumihin looked at him, frowning and uneasy. The door opened, and a tall, stout man, whose appearance seemed familiar to Raskolnikov, came in. End of Part 2, Chapter 3 Part 2, Chapter 4 of Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky Translated by Constance Garnett, 1861-1946 this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Two, Chapter Four. Zosimov was a tall, fat man with a puffy, colorless, clean-shaven face and straight, flaxen hair. He wore spectacles and a big gold ring on his fat finger. He was twenty-seven. 
He had on a light gray fashionable loose coat, light summer trousers, and everything about him loose, fashionable, and spick and span. His linen was irreproachable, his watch-chain was massive. In manner he was slow and, as it were, nonchalant, and at the same time studiously free and easy. He made efforts to conceal his self-importance, but it was apparent at every instant. All his acquaintances found him tedious, but said he was clever at his work. "'I've been to see you twice to-day, brother. You see, he's come to himself,' cried Razumian. "'I see, I see. And how do we feel now, eh?' said Zosimov to Raskolnikov, watching him carefully, and sitting down at the foot of the sofa, he settled himself as comfortably as he could. "'He is still depressed,' Razumian went on. We've just changed his linen and he almost cried." "'That's very natural. You might have put it off if he did not wish it. His pulse is first-rate. Is your head still aching, eh?' "'I am well. I am perfectly well,' Raskolnikov declared positively and irritably. He raised himself on the sofa and looked at them with glittering eyes, but sank back to the pillow at once and turned to the wall. Zosimov watched him intently. "'Very good. Going on all right,' he said lazily. "'Has he eaten anything?' They told him and asked what he might have. "'He may have anything. Soup, tea. Mushrooms and cucumbers, of course, you must not give him. He better not have meat, either. But no need to tell you that.' Razumian and he looked at each other. "'No more medicine or anything. I'll look at him again tomorrow, perhaps today even. But never mind." "'Tomorrow evening I shall take him for a walk,' said Razumian. "'We are going to the Yusupov garden and then to the Palais de Cristal. I would not disturb him tomorrow at all, but I don't know, a little maybe, but we'll see. Ach, what a nuisance! I've got a housewarming party tonight. It's only a step from here. Couldn't he come? He could lie on the sofa. You are coming," Razumian said to Zosimov. Don't forget, you promised. All right, only rather later. What are you going to do? Oh, nothing. Tea, vodka, herrings. There will be a pie. Just our friends. And who? All neighbors here, almost all new friends, except my old uncle, and he is new too. He only arrived in Petersburg yesterday to see to some business of his. We meet once in five years." "'What is he?' "'He's been stagnating all his life as a district postmaster. Gets a little pension. He is sixty-five. Not worth talking about. But I am fond of him. Porfiry Petrovich, the head of the investigation department here. But you know him. Is he a relation of yours, too? A very distant one. But why are you scowling? Because you quarreled once, won't you come then? I don't care a damn for him. So much the better. Well, there will be some students, a teacher, a government clerk, a musician, an officer, and Zamatov. Do tell me, please, what you or he, Zosimov nodded at Raskolnikov, can have in common with this Zamatov. Oh, you particular gentleman! Principles! You are worked by principles, as it were, by springs. You won't venture to turn round on your own account. If a man is a nice fellow, that's the only principle I go upon. Zamatov is a delightful person. Though he does take bribes. Well, he does, and what of it? I don't care if he does take bribes," Brazumian cried with unnatural irritability. I don't praise him for taking bribes. I only say he is a nice man in his own way. But if one looks at men in all ways, are there many good ones left? Why, I am sure I shouldn't be worth a baked onion myself, perhaps with you thrown in." "'That's too little. I'd give two for you. And I wouldn't give more than one for you. No more of your jokes. Zamatov is no more than a boy. I can pull his hair and one must draw him, not repel him. You'll never improve a man by repelling him, especially a boy. One has to be twice as careful with a boy. Oh, you progressive dullards! 
You don't understand. You harm yourselves running another man down. But if you want to know, we really have something in common." I should like to know what. Why, it's all about a house-painter. We're getting him out of a mess. Though, indeed, there's nothing to fear now. The matter is absolutely self-evident. We only put on steam." A painter? Why, haven't I told you about it? I only told you the beginning, then, about the murder of the old pawnbroker woman. Well, the painter is mixed up in it. Oh, I heard about that murder before, and was rather interested in it. Partly, for one reason, I read about it in the papers, too." "'Lizaveta was murdered, too,' Nastasya blurted out, suddenly addressing Raskolnikov. She remained in the room all the time, standing by the door, listening. "'Lizaveta,' murmured Raskolnikov, hardly audibly. "'Lizaveta, who sold old clothes. Didn't you know her? She used to come here. She mended a shirt for you, too.' Raskolnikov turned to the wall where in the dirty yellow paper he picked out one clumsy, white flower with brown lines on it, and began examining how many petals there were in it, how many scallops in the petals, and how many lines on them. He felt his arms and legs as lifeless as though they had been cut off. He did not attempt to move, but stared obstinately at the flower. "'But what about the painter?' Zosimov interrupted Nastasia's chatter with marked displeasure. She sighed and was silent. "'Why, he was accused of the murder,' Razumian went on hotly. "'Was there evidence against him, then?' "'Evidence, indeed! Evidence that was no evidence! And that's what we have to prove! It was just as they pitched on those fellows, Koch and Pestrikov, at first. Foo! How stupidly it's all done! It makes one sick! Though it's not one's business! Pestrikov may be coming tonight. By the way, Rodya, you've heard about the business already. It happened before you were ill, the day before you fainted at the police office while they were talking about it." Zosimov looked curiously at Raskolnikov. He did not stir. "'But I say, Razumian, I wonder at you. What a busybody you are!' Zosimov observed. "'Maybe I am, but we will get him off anyway!' shouted Razumian, bringing his fist down on the table. What's the most offensive is not their lying. One can always forgive lying. Lying is a delightful thing, for it leads to the truth. What is offensive is that they lie and worship their own lying. I respect Porfiry, but what threw them out at first? The door was locked, and when they came back with the porter it was open. So it followed that Koch and Pestrikov were the murderers. That was their logic. But don't excite yourself. They simply detained them, they could not help that. And by the way, I've met with that man Koch. He used to buy unredeemed pledges from the old woman, eh? Yes, he is a swindler. He buys up bad debts, too. He makes a profession of it. But enough of him. Do you know what makes me angry? It's their sickening, rotten, petrified routine. And this case might be the means of introducing a new method. One can show from the psychological data alone how to get on the track of the real man. We have the facts, they say. But facts are not everything. At least, half the business lies in how you interpret them. Can you interpret them, then? Anyway, one can't hold one's tongue when one has a feeling, a tangible feeling, that one might be a help, if only— A, hey, do you know the details of the case? I am waiting to hear about the painter. Oh, yes, well, here's the story. Early on the third day after the murder, when they were still dandling Koch and Pestrikov, though they accounted for every step they took and it was plain as a pikestaff, an unexpected fact turned up. A peasant called Dushkin, who keeps a dram shop facing the house, brought to the police office a jeweler's case containing some gold earrings and told him a long rigmarole. The day before yesterday, just after eight o'clock, mark the day and the hour. A journeyman house-painter, Nikolai, who had been in to see me already that day, brought me this box of gold earrings and stones, and asked me to give him two roubles for them. When I asked him where he got them, he said that he picked them up in the street. I did not ask him anything more. I am telling you Dushkin's story. I gave him a note, a rouble that is, 
for I thought if he did not pawn it with me, he would with another. It would all come to the same thing. He'd spent it on drink, so the thing had better be with me. The further you hide it, the quicker you will find it, and if anything turns up, if I hear any rumors, I'll take it to the police. Of course that's all taradiddle. He lies like a horse, for I know this Dushkin. He is a pawnbroker and a receiver of stolen goods, and he did not cheat Nikolai out of a thirty-rouble trinket in order to give it to the police. He was simply afraid. But no matter. To return to Dushkin's story. I've known this peasant Nikolai Dementiev from a child. He comes from the same province and district of Zaraisk. We are both Ryazan men. And though Nikolai is not a drunkard, he drinks, and I knew he had a job in that house, painting work with Dmitri, who comes from the same village, too. As soon as he got the rouble, he changed it, had a couple of glasses, took his change and went out. But I did not see Dmitri with him then. And the next day I heard that someone had murdered Alyona Ivanovna and her sister, Lizaveta Ivanovna, with an axe. I knew them, and I felt suspicious about the earrings at once, for I knew the murdered woman lent money on pledges. I went to the house and began to make careful inquiries without saying a word to anyone. First of all I asked, Is Nikolai here? Dmitri told me that Nikolai had gone off on the spree. He had come home at daybreak drunk, stayed in the house about ten minutes and went out again. Dmitri didn't see him again and is finishing the job alone. And their job is on the same staircase as the murder, on the second floor. When I heard all that, I did not say a word to anyone. That's Dushkin's tale. But I found out what I could about the murder and went home feeling as suspicious as ever. And at eight o'clock this morning, that was the third day, you understand, I saw Nikolai coming in, not sober, though not to say very drunk. He could understand what was said to him. He sat down on the bench and did not speak. There was only one stranger in the bar and a man I knew asleep on a bench and our two boys. "'Have you seen Dmitri?' said I. "'No, I haven't,' said he. "'And you've not been here either?' "'Not since the day before yesterday,' said he. "'And where did you sleep last night?' "'In Pesky, with the Kolomensky men.' "'And where did you get those earrings?' I asked. "'I found them on the street.' And the way he said it was a bit queer. He did not look at me. "'Did you hear what happened that very evening, at that very hour, on that same staircase?' said I. "'No,' said he. "'I had not heard. And all the while he was listening, his eyes were staring out of his head, and he turned as white as chalk. I told him all about it, and he took his hat and began getting up. I wanted to keep him. "'Wait a bit, Nikolai,' said I. "'Won't you have a drink?' And I signed to the boy to hold the door, and I came out from behind the bar but he darted out and down the street to the turning at a run. I have not seen him since. Then my doubts were at an end. It was his doing as clear as could be." "'I should think so,' said Zosimov. "'Wait, hear the end. Of course they sought high and low for Nikolai. They detained Dushkin and searched his house. Dmitri too was arrested. The Kolomensky men also were turned inside out and the day before yesterday they arrested Nikolai in a tavern at the end of town. He had gone there, taken the silver cross off his neck, and asked for a dram for it. They gave it to him. A few minutes afterwards the woman went to the cowshed, and through a crack in the wall she saw in the stable adjoining he had made a noose of his sash from the beam, stood on a block of wood, and was trying to put his neck in the noose. The woman screeched her hardest. People ran in. "'So that's what you are up to.' Take me, he says, to such and such a police officer, I'll confess everything. Well, they took him to that police station, that is here, with a suitable escort. So they asked him this and that, how old he is, twenty-two, and so on. At the question, when you were working with Dmitri, didn't you see anyone on the staircase at such and such a time? Answer, to be sure, folks may have gone up and down, but I did not notice them. And didn't you hear anything, any noise, and so on? We heard nothing special. And did you hear, Nikolai, that on the same day widow so-and-so and her sister were murdered and robbed? I never knew a thing about it. The first I heard of it was from Afanasy Pavlovich the day before yesterday. And where did you find the earrings? I found them on the pavement. Why didn't you go to work with Dmitri the other day? Because I was drinking. 
And where were you drinking? Oh, in such and such a place. Why do you run away from Dushkin's? Because I was awfully frightened. What were you frightened of? That I should be accused. How could you be frightened if you felt free from guilt? Now, Zosimov, you may not believe me, that question was put literally in those words. I know it for a fact. It was repeated to me exactly. What do you say to that? Well, anyway, there's the evidence. I'm not talking of the evidence now, I am talking about that question, of their own idea of themselves. Well, so they squeezed and squeezed him, and he confessed. I did not find it in the street, but in the flat where I was painting with Dmitri. And how was that? Why, Dmitri and I were painting there all day, and we were just getting ready to go, and Dmitri took a brush and painted my face, and he ran off and I after him. I ran after him, shouting my hardest, and at the bottom of the stairs I ran right against the porter and some gentlemen, and how many gentlemen there were I don't remember. And the porter swore at me, and the other porter swore too, and the porter's wife came out and swore at us too. And a gentleman came into the entry with a lady, and he swore at us too, for Dmitri and I lay right across their way. I got hold of Dmitri's hair and knocked him down and began beating him and Dmitri, too, caught me by the hair and began beating me. But we did it all not for temper, but in a friendly way, for sport. And then Dmitri escaped and ran into the street, and I ran after him. But I did not catch him and went back to the flat alone. I had to clear up my things. I began putting them together, expecting Dmitri to come, and there in the passage, in the corner by the door, I stepped on the box. I saw it lying there wrapped up in paper. I took off the paper, saw some little hooks, undid them, and in the box were the earrings. "'Behind the door? Lying behind the door? Behind the door?' Raskolnikov cried suddenly, staring with a blank look of terror at Razumian, and he slowly sat up on the sofa, leaning on his hand. "'Yes. Why? What's the matter? What's wrong?' Razumian, too, got up from his seat. "'Nothing.' Raskolnikov answered faintly, turning to the wall. All were silent for a while. "'He must have waked from a dream,' Razumian said at last, looking inquiringly at Zosimov. The latter slightly shook his head. "'Well, go on,' said Zosimov. "'What next?' "'What next? As soon as he saw the earrings, forgetting Dmitri and everything, he took up his cap and ran to Dushkin, and, as we know, got a rouble from him.' He told a lie saying he found them in the street and went off drinking. He keeps repeating his old story about the murder. I know nothing of it, never heard of it till the day before yesterday. And why didn't you come to the police till now? I was frightened. And why did you try to hang yourself? From anxiety. What anxiety? That I should be accused of it. Well, that's the whole story. And now what do you suppose they deduce from that? Why, there's no supposing. There's a clue, such as it is, a fact. You wouldn't have your painter set free. Now they've simply taken him for the murderer. They haven't a shadow of doubt. That's nonsense. You are excited. But what about the earrings? You must admit that, if on the very same day and hour, earrings from the old woman's box have come into Nikolai's hands, they must have come there somehow. That's a good deal in such a case. How did they get there? How did they get there? cried Razumian. How can you, a doctor, whose duty it is to study man and who has more opportunity than anyone else for studying human nature, how can you fail to see the character of the man in the whole story? Don't you see at once that the answer he has given in the examination are the holy truth? They came into his hand precisely as he has told us. He stepped on the box and picked it up. The holy truth! But didn't he own himself that he told a lie at first? Listen to me. Listen attentively. The porter, and Koch, and Pestryakov, and the other porter, and the wife of the first porter, and the woman who was sitting in the porter's lodge, and the man Krukov, who had just got out of a cab at that minute and went in at the entry with a lady on his arm, that is eight or ten witnesses agree that Nikolai had Dmitri on the ground, was lying on him beating him, while Dmitri hung on to his hair, beating him too. They lay right across the way, 
blocking the thoroughfare. They were sworn at on all sides, while they, like children, the very words of the witnesses, were falling over one another, squealing, fighting, and laughing with the funniest faces, and chasing one another like children they ran into the street. Now take careful note. The bodies upstairs were warm, you understand, warm when they found them. If they, or Nikolai alone, had murdered them and broken open the boxes, or simply taken part in the robbery, allow me to ask you one question. Do their state of mind, their squeals and giggles and childish scuffling at the gate, fit in with axes, bloodshed, fiendish cunning, robbery? They just killed them, not five or ten minutes before, for the bodies were still warm and at once, leaving the flat open, knowing that people would go there at once, flinging away their booty, they rolled about like children, laughing and attracting general attention. And there are a dozen witnesses to swear to that. Of course it is strange. It's impossible indeed, but no, brother, no buts. And if the earrings being found in Nikolai's hands at the very day and hour of the murder, constitutes an important piece of circumstantial evidence against him, although the explanation given by him accounts for it, and therefore it does not tell seriously against him. One must take into consideration the facts which prove him innocent, especially as they are facts that cannot be denied. And do you suppose, from the character of our legal system, that they will accept or that they are in the position to accept this fact, resting simply on a psychological impossibility, as irrefutable and conclusively breaking down the circumstantial evidence for the prosecution. No, they won't accept it, they certainly won't, because they found the jewel case and the man tried to hang himself, which he could not have done if he hadn't felt guilty. That's the point. That's what excites me, you must understand. Oh, I see you're excited. Wait a bit. I forgot to ask you. What proof is there that the box came from the old woman? That's been proved," said Razumian, with apparent reluctance, frowning. Coke recognized the jewel case and gave the name of the owner, who proved conclusively that it was his. That's bad. Now another point. Did anyone see Nikolai at the time that Coke and Pestryakov were going upstairs at first, and is there no evidence about that? Nobody did see him," Razumian answered with vexation. That's the worst of it. Even Kolk and Pestryakov did not notice them on their way upstairs, though, indeed, their evidence could not have been worth much. They said they saw the flat was open and that there must be work going on in it, but they took no special notice and could not remember whether there actually were men at work in it. Hm. So the only evidence for the defense is that they were beating one another and laughing. That constitutes a strong presumption, but how do you explain the facts yourself? How do I explain them? What is there to explain? It's clear. At any rate, the direction in which explanation is to be sought is clear, and the jewel case points to it. The real murderer dropped those earrings. The murderer was upstairs, locked in, when Koch and Pestrikov knocked at the door. Koch, like an ass, did not stay at the door, so the murderer popped out and ran down too, for he had no other way of escape. He hid from Koch, Pestryakov, and the porter in the flat when Nikolai and Dmitri had just run out of it. He stopped there while the porter and the others were going upstairs, waited till they were out of hearing, and then went calmly downstairs at the very minute when Dmitri and Nikolai ran out into the street and there was no one in the entry. Possibly he was seen, but not noticed. There are lots of people going in and out. He must have dropped the earrings out of his pocket when he stood behind the door and did not notice he dropped them, because he had other things to think of. The jewel case is a conclusive proof that he did stand there. That's how I explain it. Too clever. No, my boy, you're too clever. That beats everything. But why? 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 Because everything fits too well. It's too melodramatic. Ah! Razumian was exclaiming, but at that moment the door opened, and a personage came in who was a stranger to all present. End of Part 2 Chapter 4 Part 2 Chapter 5 of Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky Translated by Constance Garnett, 1861-1946
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Two, Chapter Five. This gentleman was no longer young, of a stiff and portly appearance, and a cautious and sour countenance. He began by stopping short in the doorway, staring about him with offensive and undisguised astonishment, as though asking himself what sort of place he had come to. Mistrustfully, and with an affectation of being alarmed and almost affronted, he scanned Raskolnikov's low and narrow cabin. With the same amazement he stared at Raskolnikov, who lay undressed, disheveled, unwashed, on his miserable dirty sofa, looking fixedly at him. Then, with the same deliberation, he scrutinized the uncouth, unkempt figure and unshaven face of Razumian, who looked him boldly and inquiringly in the face without rising from his seat. A constrained silence lasted for a couple of minutes, and then, as might be expected, some scene-shifting took place. Reflecting, probably from certain fairly unmistakable signs, that he would get nothing in this cabin by attempting to overawe them, the gentleman softened somewhat, and civilly, though with some severity, emphasizing every syllable of his question, addressed Zosimov. Rodion Romanovich Raskolnikov, a student, or formerly a student? Zosimov made a slight movement and would have answered had not Razumian anticipated him. "'He is lying on the sofa. What do you want?' This familiar what do you want seemed to cut the ground from the feet of the pompous gentleman. He was turning to Razumian, but checked himself in time and turned to Zosimov again. "'This is Raskolnikov,' mumbled Zosimov, nodding towards him. Then he gave a prolonged yawn, opening his mouth as wide as possible. Then he lazily put his hand into his waistcoat pocket, pulled out a huge gold watch in a round hunter's case, opened it, looked at it, and as slowly and lazily proceeded to put it back. Raskolnikov himself lay without speaking on his back, gazing persistently, though without understanding, at the stranger. Now that his face was turned away from the strange flower on the paper, it was extremely pale and wore a look of anguish as though he had just undergone an agonizing operation, or just been taken from the rack. But the newcomer gradually began to arouse his attention, then his wonder, then suspicion, and even alarm. When Zosimov said, "'This is Raskolnikov,' he jumped up quickly, sat on the sofa, and with an almost defiant, but weak and breaking voice, articulated, "'Yes, I am Raskolnikov. What do you want?' The visitor scrutinized him and pronounced impressively, "'Piotr Petrovich Luzhin. I believe I have reason to hope that my name is not wholly unknown to you.' But Raskolnikov, who had expected something quite different, gazed blankly and dreamily at him, making no reply, as though he heard the name of Piotr Petrovich for the first time. "'Is it possible that you can up to the present have received no information?' asked Pyotr Petrovitch, somewhat disconcerted. In reply Raskolnikov sank languidly back on the pillow, put his hands behind his head and gazed at the ceiling. A look of dismay came into Luzhin's face. Zosimov and Razumian stared at him more inquisitively than ever, and at last he showed unmistakable signs of embarrassment. "'I had presumed and calculated,' he faltered, that a letter posted more than ten days, if not a fortnight ago. "'I say, why are you standing in the doorway?' Razumian interrupted suddenly. "'If you've something to say, sit down. Nastasia and you are so crowded. Nastasia, make room. Here's a chair. Thread your way in.' He moved his chair back from the table, made a little space between the table and his knees, and waited in a rather cramped position for the visitor to thread his way in. The minute was so chosen that it was impossible to refuse, and the visitor squeezed his way through, hurrying and stumbling. Reaching the chair, he sat down, looking suspiciously at Razumian. "'No need to be nervous,' the latter blurted out. "'Rodya has been ill for the last five days and delirious for three, but now he is recovering and has got an appetite. This is his doctor, who has just had a look at him.' I am a comrade of Rodya's, like him, formerly a student, and now I am nursing him. 
so don't you take any notice of us, but go on with your business. Thank you. But shall I not disturb the invalid by my presence and conversation? Pyotr Petrovitch asked of Zosimov. No, mumbled Zosimov, you may amuse him. He yawned again. He has been conscious a long time, since the morning, went on Razumian, whose familiarity seemed so much like unaffected good nature that Pyotr Petrovitch began to be more cheerful, partly, perhaps, because this shabby and impudent person had introduced himself as a student. "'Your mamma," began Luzhin. "'Hm!' Brazumian cleared his throat loudly. Luzhin looked at him inquiringly. "'That's all right. Go on.' Luzhin shrugged his shoulders. "'Your mamma had commenced a letter to you while I was sojourning in her neighborhood. On my arrival here I purposely allowed a few days to elapse before coming to see you, in order that I might be fully assured that you were in full possession of the tidings. But now, to my astonishment—" "'I know, I know!' Raskolnikov cried suddenly with impatient vexation. "'So you are the fiancé. I know, and that's enough!' There was no doubt about Pyotr Petrovitch's being offended this time but he said nothing. He made a violent effort to understand what it all meant. There was a moment's silence. Meanwhile Raskolnikov, who had turned a little towards him when he answered, began suddenly staring at him again with marked curiosity, as though he had not had a good look at him yet, or as though something new had struck him. He rose from his pillow on purpose to stare at him. There certainly was something peculiar in Pyotr Petrovitch's whole appearance something which seemed to justify the title of fiancé so unceremoniously applied to him. In the first place it was evident, far too much so indeed, that Pyotr Petrovitch had made eager use of his few days in the capital to get himself up and rig himself out in expectation of his betrothed, a perfectly innocent and permissible proceeding indeed. Even his own, perhaps too complacent, consciousness of the agreeable improvement in his appearance might have been forgiven in such circumstances, seeing that Pyotr Petrovitch had taken up the role of fiancé. All his clothes were fresh from the tailor's and were all right, except for being too new and too distinctly appropriate. Even the stylish new round hat had the same significance. Pyotr Petrovitch treated it too respectfully and held it too carefully in his hands. The exquisite pair of lavender gloves, Real Louvain told the same tale, if only from the fact of his not wearing them, but carrying them in his hand for show. Light and youthful colors predominated in Pyotr Petrovitch's attire. He wore a charming summer jacket of a fawn shade, light thin trousers, a waistcoat of the same, new and fine linen, a cravat of the lightest cambric with pink stripes on it, and the best of it was, this all suited Pyotr Petrovitch. His very fresh and even handsome face looked younger than his forty-five years at all times. His dark, mutton-chop whiskers made an agreeable setting on both sides, growing thickly upon his shining, clean-shaven chin. Even his hair, touched here and there with grey, though it had been combed and curled at a hairdresser's, did not give him a stupid appearance, as curled hair usually does, by inevitably suggesting a German on his wedding day. If there really was something unpleasing and repulsive in his rather good-looking and imposing countenance, it was due to quite other causes. After scanning Mr. Luzhin unceremoniously, Raskolnikov smiled malignantly, sank back on the pillow, and stared at the ceiling as before. But Mr. Luzhin hardened his heart and seemed to determine to take no notice of their oddities. "'I feel the greatest regret at finding you in this situation he began, again breaking the silence with an effort. "'If I had been aware of your illness, I should have come earlier. But you know what business is. I have, too, a very important legal affair in the Senate, not to mention other preoccupations which you may well conjecture. I am expecting your mamma and sister any minute.' Oskolnikov made a movement and seemed about to speak. His face showed some excitement. Pyotr Petrovitch paused waited, but as nothing followed, he went on. "'Any minute. I have found a lodging for them on their arrival.' "'Where?' 
asked Raskolnikov weakly. Very near here, in Bakaliev's house. That's in Voskresensky, put in Razumian. There are two stories of rooms, let by a merchant called Yushin. I've been there. Yes, rooms. A disgusting place, filthy, stinking, and what's more, of doubtful character. Things have happened there, and there are all sorts of queer people living there. And I went there about a scandalous business. It's cheap, though. I could not, of course, find out so much about it, for I am a stranger in Petersburg myself," Pyotr Petrovitch replied huffily. However, the two rooms are exceedingly clean, and, as it is for so short a time, I have already taken a permanent, that is, our future flat," he said, addressing Raskolnikov, and I am having it done up. And meanwhile I am myself cramped for room in a lodging with my friend Andrei Samyanovich Lebeziatnikov, in the flat of Madame Lepevezhel. It was he who told me of Bakeliev's house, too." Lebeziatnikov? said Raskolnikov slowly, as if recalling something. Yes, Andrei Semyonovitch Lebeziatnikov, a clerk in the ministry. Do you know him? Yes, uh, no, Raskolnikov answered. Excuse me, I fancied so from your inquiry. I was once his guardian, a very nice young man and advanced. I like to meet young people. One learns new things from them." Luzhin looked round hopefully at them all. "'How do you mean?' asked Razumian. "'In the most serious and essential matters,' Pyotr Petrovitch replied, as though delighted at the question. "'You see, it's ten years since I visited Petersburg. All the novelties, reforms, ideas have reached us in the provinces but to see it all more clearly one must be in Petersburg. And it's my notion that you observe and learn most by watching the younger generation. And I confess I am delighted." At what? Your question is a wide one. I may be mistaken, but I fancy I find clearer views, more, so to say, criticism, more practicality. That's true, Zosimov let drop. Nonsense! There's no practicality!" Razumian flew at him. Practicality is a difficult thing to find. It does not drop down from heaven. And for the last two hundred years we have been divorced from all practical life. Ideas, if you like, are fermenting," he said to Pyotr Petrovitch. And desire for good exists, though it's in a childish form, and honesty you may find, although there are crowds of brigands. Anyway, there's no practicality. Practicality goes well shod." "'I don't agree with you,' Pyotr Petrovitch replied, with evident enjoyment. "'Of course people do get carried away and make mistakes, but one must have indulgence. Those mistakes are merely evidence of enthusiasm for the cause, and of abnormal external environment. If little has been done, the time has been but short. Of means I will not speak. It's my personal view, if you care to know, that something has been accomplished already. New valuable ideas, new valuable works are circulating in the place of our old dreamy and romantic authors. Literature is taking a maturer form, many injurious prejudices have been rooted up and turned into ridicule. In a word, we have cut ourselves off irrevocably from the past, and that, to my thinking, is a great thing. He's learned it by heart to show off," Raskolnikov pronounced suddenly. What? asked Pyotr Petrovitch, not catching his words, but he received no reply. That's all true," Zosimov hastened to interpose. Isn't it so? Pyotr Petrovitch went on, glancing affably at Zosimov. You must admit," he went on, addressing Razumian with a shade of triumph and superciliousness, he almost added, young man that there is an advance, or as they say now, progress in the name of science and economic truth. A commonplace. No, not a commonplace. Hitherto, for instance, if I were told, love thy neighbor, what came of it? Pyotr Petrovitch went on, perhaps with excessive haste. It came to my tearing my coat in half to share with my neighbor, and we both were left half naked. As a Russian proverb has it, catch several hairs and you won't catch one. Science now tells us, 
love yourself before all men, for everything in the world rests on self-interest. You love yourself, and manage your own affairs properly, and your coat remains whole. Economic truth adds that the better private affairs are organized in society, the more whole coats, so to say, the firmer are its foundations, and the better is the common welfare organized too. Therefore, in acquiring wealth solely and exclusively for myself, I am acquiring, so to speak, for all, and helping to bring to pass my neighbors getting a little more than a torn coat, and that not from private, personal liberality, but as a consequence of the general advance. The idea is simple, but unhappily it has been a long time reaching us, being hindered by idealism and sentimentality, and yet it would seem to want very little wit to perceive it. "'Excuse me, I very little wit myself,' Brazumian cut in sharply, "'and so let us drop it. I began this discussion with an object, but I've grown so sick during the last three years of this chattering to amuse oneself, of this incessant flow of commonplaces, always the same, that, by Jove, I blush even when other people talk like that. You are in a hurry, no doubt, to exhibit your requirements, and I don't blame you, that's quite pardonable. I only wanted to find out what sort of a man you are, for so many unscrupulous people have got hold of the progressive cause of late, and have so distorted in their own interests everything they touched, that the whole cause has been dragged in the mire. That's enough." "'Excuse me, sir,' said Lucian, affronted and speaking with excessive dignity. "'Do you mean to suggest, so unceremoniously, that I, too—oh, my dear sir, how could I? Come, that's enough,' Razumian concluded, and he turned abruptly to Zasimov to continue their previous conversation. Pyotr Petrovitch had the good sense to accept the disavowal. He made up his mind to take leave in another minute or two. "'I trust our acquaintance,' he said, addressing Raskolnikov, "'may, upon your recovery, and in view of the circumstances of which you are aware, become closer. Above all, I hope for your return to health.' Raskolnikov did not even turn his head. Pyotr Petrovitch began getting up from his chair. "'One of her customers must have killed her,' Zosimov declared positively. "'Not a doubt of it,' replied Razumian. "'Porfiry doesn't give his opinion, but is examining all who have left pledges with her there.' "'Examining them?' Raskolnikov asked aloud. "'Yes. What then?' "'Nothing.' "'How does he get hold of them?' asked Zosimov. "'Coke has given the names of some of them. Other names are on the wrappers of the pledges, and some have come forward of themselves.' It must have been a cunning and practiced ruffian. The boldness of it, the coolness. That's just what it wasn't, interposed Razumian. That's what throws you all off the scent. But I maintain that he is not cunning, not practiced, and probably this was his first crime. The supposition that it was a calculated crime and a cunning criminal doesn't work. Suppose him to have been inexperienced and it's clear that it was only a chance that saved him, and chance may do anything. Why, he did not foresee obstacles, perhaps. And how did he set to work? He took jewels worth ten or twenty roubles, stuffing his pockets with them, ransacked the old woman's trunks, her rags, and they found fifteen hundred roubles, besides notes, in a box in the top drawer of the chest. He did not know how to rob, he could only murder. It was his first crime, I assure you his first crime. He lost his head. And he got off more by luck than good counsel." "'You are talking of the murder of the old pawnbroker, I believe,' Pyotr Petrovitch put in, addressing Zosimov. He was standing, hat and gloves in hand, but before departing he felt disposed to throw off a few more intellectual phrases. He was evidently anxious to make a favorable impression, and his vanity overcame his prudence. Yes, you've heard of it? Oh, yes, being in the neighborhood. Do you know the details? I can't say that, but another circumstance interests me in the case. The whole question, so to say. Not to speak of the fact that crime has been greatly on the increase among the lower classes during the last five years, not to speak of the cases of robbery and arson everywhere, what strikes me is the strangest thing 
is that in the higher classes too crime is increasing proportionately. In one place one hears of a student's robbing the mail on the high road. In another place people of good social position forge false banknotes. In Moscow of late a whole gang has been captured who used to forge lottery tickets, and one of the ringleaders was a lecturer in universal history. Then our secretary abroad was murdered from some obscure motive of gain. And if this old woman, the pawnbroker, has been murdered by someone of a higher class in society, for peasants don't pawn gold trinkets, how are we to explain this demoralization of the civilized part of our society?" "'There are many economic changes,' put in Zosimov. "'How are we to explain it?' Razumium caught him up. "'It might be explained by our inveterate impracticality.' "'How do you mean?' What answer had your lecturer in Moscow to make to the question why he was forging notes? Everybody is getting rich one way or another, so I want to make haste to get rich too. I don't remember the exact words, but the upshot was that he wants money for nothing, without waiting or working. We've grown used to having everything ready-made, to walking on crutches, to having our food chewed for us. Then the great hour struck the emancipation of the serfs in 1861 is meant, and every man showed himself in his true colors. But morality? And, so to speak, principles? But why do you worry about it? Raskolnikov interposed suddenly. It's in accordance with your theory. In accordance with my theory? Why, carry out logically the theory you are advocating just now, and it follows that people may be killed. "'Upon my word!' cried Luzhin. "'No, that's not so,' put in Zosimov. Raskolnikov lay with a white face and twitching upper lip, breathing painfully. "'There's a measure in all things,' Luzhin went on superciliously. "'Economic ideas are not an incitement to murder, and one has but to suppose—' "'And is it true?' Raskolnikov interposed once more suddenly again in a voice quivering with fury and delight in insulting him. "'Is it true that you told your fiancée, within an hour of her acceptance, that what pleased you most was that she was a beggar, because it was better to raise a wife from poverty, so that you may have complete control over her and reproach her with your being her benefactor?' "'Upon my word!' Lucian cried wrathfully and irritably, crimson with confusion to distort my words in this way. Excuse me, allow me to assure you that the report which has reached you, or rather, let me say, has been conveyed to you, has no foundation in truth, and I suspect who, in a word, this arrow, in a word, your mamma. She seemed to me, in other things, with all her excellent qualities, of a somewhat high-flown and romantic way of thinking but I was a thousand miles from supposing that she would misunderstand and misrepresent things in so fanciful a way. And indeed, indeed! I tell you what," cried Raskolnikov, raising himself on his pillow and fixing his piercing, glittering eyes upon him, I tell you what! What? Lucian stood still, waiting with a defiant and offended face. Silence lasted for some seconds. Why, if ever again! You dare to mention a single word about my mother. I shall send you flying downstairs." "'What's the matter with you?' cried Razumian. "'So, that's how it is?' Lucian turned pale and bit his lip. "'Let me tell you, sir,' he began deliberately, doing his utmost to restrain himself but breathing hard. "'At the first moment I saw you, you were ill-disposed to me but I remained here on purpose to find out more. I could forgive a great deal in a sick man and a connection, but you, never after this. I am not ill!" cried Raskolnikov. So much the worse! Go to hell!" But Luzhin was already leaving without finishing his speech, squeezing between the table and the chair. Razumian got up this time to let him pass. Without glancing at anyone, and not even nodding to Zosimov, who had for some time been making signs to him to let the sick man alone, he went out, lifting his hat to the level of his shoulders to avoid crushing it as he stooped to go out of the door. 
and even the curve of his spine was expressive of the horrible insult he had received. "'How could you? How could you?' Razumian said, shaking his head in perplexity. "'Let me alone! Let me alone, all of you!' Raskolnikov cried in a frenzy. "'Will you ever leave off tormenting me? I am not afraid of you! I am not afraid of anyone, anyone now! Get away from me! I want to be alone, alone, alone!' "'Come along,' said Zosimov, nodding to Razumian. "'But we can't leave him like this!' "'Come along!' Zosimov repeated insistently, and he went out. Razumian thought a minute and ran to overtake him. "'It might be worse not to obey him,' said Zosimov on the stairs. "'He mustn't be irritated. What's the matter with him? If only he could get some favourable shock, that's what would do it. At first he was better. You know he has got something on his mind, some fixed idea weighing on him. I am very much afraid so. He must have. Perhaps it's that gentleman, Pyotr Petrovitch. From his conversation I gather he is going to marry his sister, and that he had received a letter about it just before his illness. Yes, confound the man! He may have upset the case altogether. But have you noticed, he takes no interest in anything, he does not respond to anything except one point on which he seems excited. That's the murder? Yes, yes, Razumin agreed. I noticed that, too. He is interested, frightened. It gave him a shock on the day he was ill in the police office. He fainted. Tell me more about that this evening, and I'll tell you something afterwards. He interests me very much. In half an hour I'll go and see him again. There'll be no inflammation, though. Thanks, and I'll wait with Pashenka meantime and will keep watching him through Nastasya. Raskolnikov, left alone, looked with impatience and misery at Nastasya, but she still lingered. "'Won't you have some tea now?' she asked. "'Later. I am sleepy. Leave me.' He turned abruptly to the wall. Nastasya went out. End of Part 2 Chapter 5 Part 2 Chapter 6 Of Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky Translated by Constance Garnett, 1861-1946. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2, Chapter 6 But as soon as she went out, he got up, latched the door, undid the parcel which Razumian had brought in that evening and had tied up again, and began dressing. Strange to say, he seemed immediately to have become perfectly calm not a trace of his recent delirium nor of the panic fear that had haunted him of late. It was the first moment of a strange, sudden calm. His movements were precise and definite. A firm purpose was evident in them. "'Today! Today!' he muttered to himself. He understood that he was still weak, but his intense spiritual concentration gave him strength and self-confidence. He hoped, moreover, that he would not fall down in the street. When he had dressed in entirely new clothes, he looked at the money lying on the table, and after a moment's thought put it in his pocket. It was twenty-five roubles. He took also all the copper change from the ten roubles spent by Razumian on the clothes. Then he softly unlatched the door, went out, slipped downstairs and glanced in at the open kitchen door. Nastasia was standing with her back to him, blowing up the landlady's samovar. She heard nothing. Who would have dreamed of his going out, indeed? A minute later he was in the street. It was nearly eight o'clock, the sun was setting. It was as stifling as before, but he eagerly drank in the stinking, dusty town air. His head felt rather dizzy. A sort of savage energy gleamed suddenly in his feverish eyes and his wasted, pale and yellow face. He did not know and did not think where he was going. He had one thought only that all this must be ended today, once and for all, immediately, that he would not return home without it, because he would not go on living like that. How, with what to make an end? He had not an idea about it, he did not even want to think of it. He drove away thought, thought tortured him. All he knew, all he felt, 
was that everything must be changed one way or another, he repeated with desperate and immovable self-confidence and determination. From old habit he took his usual walk in the direction of the haymarket. A dark-haired young man with a barrel organ was standing in the road in front of a little general shop and was grinding out a very sentimental song. He was accompanying a girl of fifteen, who stood on the pavement in front of him. She was dressed up in a crinoline, a mantle and a straw hat with a flame-colored feather in it, all very old and shabby. In a strong and rather agreeable voice, cracked and coarsened by street singing, she sang in hope of getting a copper from the shop. Raskolnikov joined two or three listeners, took out a five-kopeck piece and put it in the girl's hand. She broke off abruptly on a sentimental high note, shouted sharply to the organ-grinder, "'Come on!' and both moved on to the next shop. "'Do you like street music?' said Raskolnikov, addressing a middle-aged man standing idly by him. The man looked at him, startled and wondering. "'I love to hear singing to a street-organ,' said Raskolnikov, and his manner seemed strangely out of keeping with the subject. "'I like it on cold, dark, damp autumn evenings. They must be damp, when all the passers-by have pale green, sickly faces, or better still, when the wet snow is falling straight down, when there's no wind, you know what I mean? And the street lamps shine through it." "'I don't know. Excuse me,' muttered the stranger, frightened by the question and Raskolnikov's strange manner, and he crossed over to the other side of the street. Raskolnikov walked straight on and came out at the corner of the haymarket, where the huckster and his wife had talked with Lisveta. But they were not there now. Recognizing the place, he stopped looked round and addressed a young fellow in a red shirt, who stood gaping before a corn-chandler's shop. "'Isn't there a man who keeps a booth with his wife at this corner?' "'All sorts of people keep booths here,' answered the young man, glancing superciliously at Raskolnikov. "'What's his name?' "'What he was christened.' "'Aren't you a Zaryski man, too? Which province?' The young man looked at Raskolnikov again. It's not a province, Your Excellency, but a district. Graciously forgive me, Your Excellency." "'Is that a tavern at the top there?' "'Yes, it's an eating-house, and there's a billiard-room, and you'll find princesses there, too. La, la!' Raskolnikov crossed the square. In that corner there was a dense crowd of peasants. He pushed his way into the thickest part of it, looking at the faces. He felt an unaccountable inclination to enter into conversation with people. But the peasants took no notice of him. They were all shouting in groups together. He stood and thought a little and took a turning to the right in the direction of V. He had often crossed that little street which turns at an angle, leading from the marketplace to Sadovi Street. Of late he had often felt drawn to wander about this district, when he felt depressed, that he might feel more so. Now he walked along, thinking of nothing. At that point there is a great block of buildings, entirely let out in dram-shops and eating-houses. Women were continually running in and out, bareheaded and in their indoor clothes. Here and there they gathered in groups on the pavement, especially about the entrances to various festive establishments in the lower stories. From one of these a loud din, sounds of singing, the tinkling of a guitar and shouts of merriment, floated into the street. A crowd of women were thronging round the door. Some were sitting on the steps, others on the pavement, others were standing talking. A drunken soldier, smoking a cigarette, was walking near them in the road, swearing. He seemed to be trying to find his way somewhere, but had forgotten where. One beggar was quarreling with another, and a man dead drunk was lying right across the road. Raskolnikov joined the throng of women, who were talking in husky voices. They were bareheaded and wore cotton dresses and goatskin shoes. There were women of forty and some not more than seventeen. Almost all had blackened eyes. He felt strangely attracted by the singing and all the noise and uproar in the saloon below. Someone could be heard within dancing frantically, marking time with his heels to the sounds of the guitar and of a thin falsetto voice singing a jaunty air. 
He listened intently, gloomily and dreamily, bending down at the entrance and peeping inquisitively in from the pavement. "'Oh, my handsome soldier, don't beat me for nothing!' trilled the thin voice of the singer. Raskolnikov felt a great desire to make out what he was singing, as though everything depended on that. "'Shall I go in?' he thought. "'They are laughing, from drink. Shall I get drunk?' "'Won't you come in?' one of the women asked him. Her voice was still musical and less thick than the others. She was young and not repulsive, the only one of the group. "'Why, she's pretty,' he said, drawing himself up and looking at her. She smiled, much pleased at the compliment. "'You're very nice looking yourself,' she said. "'Isn't he thin, though?' observed another woman, in a deep bass. "'Have you just come out of a hospital?' They're all generals' daughters, it seems, but they have all snub noses," interposed a tipsy peasant with a sly smile on his face, wearing a loose coat. See how jolly they are! Go along with you! I'll go, sweetie!" And he darted down into the saloon below. Raskolnikov moved on. "'I say, sir!' the girl shouted after him. "'What is it?' She hesitated. I'll always be pleased to spend an hour with you, kind gentlemen, but now I feel shy. Give me six kopecks for a drink, there's a nice young man." Raskolnikov gave her what came first, fifteen kopecks. Ah, what a good-natured gentleman! What's your name? Ask for Duklida. Well, that's too much, one of the women observed, shaking her head at Duklida. I don't know how you can ask like that. I believe I should drop with shame." Raskolnikov looked curiously at the speaker. She was a pock-marked wench of thirty, covered with bruises, with her upper lip swollen. She made her criticism quietly and earnestly. "'Where is it?' thought Raskolnikov. "'Where is it I've read that someone condemned to death says or thinks, an hour before his death, that if he had to live on some high rock, on such a narrow ledge that he'd only room to stand, and the ocean, everlasting darkness, everlasting solitude, everlasting tempest around him. If he had to remain standing on a square yard of space all his life, a thousand years, eternity, it were better to live so than to die at once. Only to live, to live and live. Life, whatever it may be. How true it is! Good God, how true! Man is a vile creature, and vile is he who calls him vile for that," he added a moment later. He went into another street. Bah! The Palais de Cristal! Razumian was just talking of the Palais de Cristal. But what on earth was it I wanted? Yes, the newspapers. Zosimov said he read it in the papers. Have you the papers? he asked, going into a very spacious and positively clean restaurant consisting of several rooms, which were, however, rather empty. Two or three people were drinking tea, and in a room further away were sitting four men drinking champagne. Raskolnikov fancied that Zamatov was one of them, but he could not be sure at that distance. "'What if it is?' he thought. "'Will you have vodka?' asked the waiter. "'Give me some tea and bring me the papers the old ones, for the last five days, and I'll give you something." "'Yes, sir. Here's today's. No vodka?' The old newspapers and the tea were brought. Raskolnikov sat down and began to look through them. "'Oh, damn! These are the items of intelligence. An accident on a staircase. A spontaneous combustion of a shopkeeper from alcohol. A fire in Pesky. A fire in the Petersburg Quarter another fire in the Petersburg Quarter, and another fire in the Petersburg Quarter. Ah, here it is!" He found at last what he was seeking and began to read it. The lines danced before his eyes, but he read it all and began eagerly seeking later editions in the following numbers. His hands shook with nervous impatience as he turned the sheets. Suddenly someone sat down beside him at his table. He looked up. It was the head clerk, Zamatov, looking just the same, with the rings on his fingers and the watch-chain, with the curly black hair, parted and pomaded, with a smart waistcoat, rather shabby coat, 
and doubtful linen. He was in a good humour, at least he was smiling very gaily and good-humouredly. His dark face was rather flushed from the champagne he had drunk. "'What? You here?' he began in surprise, speaking as though he'd known him all his life. "'Why, Razumian told me only yesterday you were unconscious. How strange! And do you know I've been to see you?' Raskolnikov knew he would come up to him. He laid aside the papers and turned to Zamatov. There was a smile on his lips, and a new shade of irritable impatience was apparent in that smile. "'I know you have,' he answered. "'I've heard it. You looked for my sock. And you know Razumian has lost his heart to you. He says you've been with him to Louise Ivanovna's. You know, the woman you tried to befriend, for whom you winked to the explosive lieutenant, and he would not understand. Do you remember? How could he fail to understand? It was quite clear, wasn't it?" "'What a hothead he is!' "'The explosive one? No, your friend Razumian. "'You must have a jolly life, Mr. Zamatov. Entrance fee to the most agreeable places. Who's been pouring champagne into you just now?' "'We've just been... having a drink together. You talk about pouring it into me. By way of a fee! You profit by everything!" Raskolnikov laughed. "'It's all right, my dear boy,' he added, slapping Zamatov on the shoulder. "'I am not speaking from temper, but in a friendly way. For sport, as that workman of yours said when he was scuffling with Dmitri, in the case of the old woman. How do you know about it? Perhaps I know more about it than you do. How strange you are! I am sure you are still very unwell. You oughtn't to have come out." "'Oh, do I seem strange to you?' "'Yes. What are you doing, reading the papers?' "'Yes.' "'There's a lot about the fires.' "'No, I am not reading about the fires.' Here he looked mysteriously at Zamatov. His lips were twisted again in a mocking smile. "'No, I am not reading about the fires.' he went on winking at Zamatov. But confess now, my dear fellow, you're awfully anxious to know what I am reading about. I am not in the least. Mayn't I ask a question? Why do you keep on? Listen, you are a man of culture and education. I was in the sixth class at the gymnasium, said Zamatov with some dignity. Sixth class! Ah, my cock-sparrow! With your parting and your rings? You are a gentleman of fortune. Foo! What a charming boy!" Here Raskolnikov broke into a nervous laugh right in Zamatov's face. The latter drew back, more amazed than offended. "'Foo! How strange you are!' Zamatov repeated very seriously. "'I can't help it you are still delirious.' "'I am delirious? You are fibbing, my cock-sparrow. So I am strange?' You find me curious, do you?" Yes, curious. Shall I tell you what I was reading about, what I was looking for? See what a lot of papers I've made them bring me. Suspicious, eh? Well, what is it? You prick up your ears? How do you mean, prick up my ears? I'll explain that afterwards, but now, my boy, I declare to you, no, better, I confess. No, that's not right either. I make a deposition and you take it. I depose that I was reading, that I was looking and searching." He screwed up his eyes and paused. I was searching, and came here on purpose to do it, for news of the murder of the old pawnbroker woman," he articulated at last, almost in a whisper, bringing his face exceedingly close to the face of Zamatov. Zamatov looked at him steadily, without moving or drawing his face away. What struck Zamatov afterwards as the strangest part of it all was that silence followed for exactly a minute, and that they gazed at one another all the while. "'What if you have been reading about it?' he cried at last, perplexed and impatient. "'That's no business of mine. What of it?' "'The same old woman—' Raskolnikov went on in the same whisper, not heeding Zamatov's explanation. About whom you were talking in the police office. 
you remember when I fainted. Well, do you understand now? What do you mean? Understand what? Samatov brought out, almost alarmed. Raskolnikov's set and earnest face was suddenly transformed, and he suddenly went off into the same nervous laugh as before, as though utterly unable to restrain himself. And in one flash he recalled with extraordinary vividness of sensation a moment in the recent past, that moment when he stood with the axe behind the door, while the latch trembled and the men outside swore and shook it, and he had a sudden desire to shout at them, to swear at them, to put out his tongue at them, to mock them, to laugh and laugh and laugh. "'You are either mad, or—' began Zamatov, and he broke off, as though stunned by the idea that had suddenly flashed into his mind. "'Or? Or what? What? Come, tell me!' "'Nothing,' said Zamatov, getting angry. "'It's all nonsense!' Both were silent. After his sudden fit of laughter, Raskolnikov became suddenly thoughtful and melancholy. He put his elbow on the table and leaned his head on his hand. He seemed to have completely forgotten Zamatov. The silence lasted for some time. "'Why don't you drink your tea? It's getting cold,' said Zamatov. "'What? Tea? Oh, yes!' Raskolnikov sipped the glass, put a morsel of bread in his mouth, and suddenly looking at Zamatov, seemed to remember everything and pulled himself together. At the same moment his face resumed its original mocking expression. He went on drinking tea. "'There have been a great many of these crimes lately,' said Zamatov. "'Only the other day I read in the Moscow news that a whole gang of false coiners had been caught in Moscow. It was a regular society. They used to forge tickets.' "'Oh, but it was a long time ago. I read about it a month ago," Raskolnikov answered calmly. "'So you consider them criminals?' he added, smiling. "'Of course they are criminals. They? They are children, simpletons, not criminals. Why, half a hundred people meeting for such an object, what an idea! Three would be too many, and then they want to have more faith in one another than in themselves. One has only to blab in his cups and it all collapses. Simpletons! They engaged untrustworthy people to change the notes. What a thing to trust to a casual stranger! Well, let us suppose that these simpletons succeed and each makes a million, and what follows for the rest of their lives? Each is dependent on the others for the rest of his life. Better hang oneself at once. And they did not know how to change the notes either. The man who changed the notes took five thousand roubles, and his hands trembled. He counted the first four thousand, but did not count the fifth thousand. He was in such a hurry to get the money into his pocket and ran away. Of course he roused suspicion. And the whole thing came to a crash through one fool. Is it possible?" "'That his hands trembled?' observed Zamatov. "'Yes, that's quite possible. That, I feel quite sure, is possible. Sometimes one can't stand things." "'Can't stand that?' "'Why, could you stand it, then? No, I couldn't. For the sake of a hundred roubles to face such a terrible experience? To go with false notes into a bank where it's their business to spot that sort of thing? No, I should not have the face to do it. Would you?' Raskolnikov had an intense desire again to put his tongue out. Shivers kept running down his spine. "'I should do it quite differently,' Raskolnikov began. "'This is how I would change the notes. I'd count the first thousand three or four times backwards and forwards, looking at every note, and then I'd set to the second thousand. I'd count that halfway through, and then hold some fifty-rouble note to the light, then turn it, then hold it to the light again, to see whether it was a good one. I am afraid, I would say, a relation of mine lost twenty-five roubles the other day through a false note, and then I tell them the whole story. And after I began counting the third, no, excuse me, I would say, I fancy I made a mistake in the seventh hundred in that second thousand, I'm not sure. And so I would give up the third thousand and go back to the second and so on to the end. 
and when I had finished, I'd pick out one from the fifth and one from the second thousand, and take them again to the light and ask again, change them, please, and put the clerk into such a stew that he would not know how to get rid of me. When I'd finished and gone out, I'd come back. No, excuse me, and ask for some explanation. That's how I do it." Foo! What terrible things you say!" said Zamatov, laughing. But all that is only talk. I dare say when it came to deeds you'd make a slip. I believe that even a practiced, desperate man cannot always reckon on himself, much less you and I. To take an example near home. That old woman murdered in our district. The murderer seems to have been a desperate fellow. He risked everything in open daylight, was saved by a miracle. But his hands shook, too. He did not succeed in robbing the place. He couldn't stand it. That was clear from the—' Raskolnikov seemed offended. "'Clear? Why don't you catch him, then?' he cried, maliciously jibing at Zamatov. "'Well, they will catch him.' "'Who? You? Do you suppose you could catch him? You've a tough job. A great point for you is whether a man is spending money or not. If he had no money and suddenly begins spending, he must be the man, so that any child can mislead you." "'The fact is they always do that, though,' answered Zamatov. A man will commit a clever murder at the risk of his life, and then at once he goes drinking in a tavern. They are caught spending money, they are not all as cunning as you are. You wouldn't go to a tavern, of course. Raskolnikov frowned and looked steadily at Zamatov. "'You seem to enjoy the subject and would like to know how I should behave in that case, too?' he asked with displeasure. "'I should like to,' Zamatov answered firmly and seriously. Somewhat too much earnestness began to appear in his words and looks. "'Very much? Very much. "'All right, then. This is how I should behave.' Raskolnikov began, again bringing his face close to Zamatov's, again staring at him and speaking in a whisper, so that the latter positively shuddered. "'This is what I should have done. I should have taken the money and jewels. I should have walked out of there and have gone straight to some deserted place with fences round it, and scarcely any one to be seen, some kitchen garden or place of that sort. I should have looked out beforehand some stone weighing a hundredweight or more which had been lying in the corner from the time the house was built. I would lift that stone, there would sure to be a hollow under it, and I would put the jewels and money in that hole. Then I'd roll the stone back so that it would look as before, would press it down with my foot and walk away. And for a year or two, three maybe, I would not touch it. And, well, they could search there be no trace." "'You are a madman,' said Zamatov, and for some reason he too spoke in a whisper, and moved away from Raskolnikov, whose eyes were glittering. He had turned fearfully pale, and his upper lip was twitching and quivering. He bent down as close as possible to Zamatov, and his lips began to move without uttering a word. This lasted for half a minute. He knew what he was doing, but could not restrain himself. The terrible word trembled on his lips, like the latch on that door. In another moment it will break out. In another moment he will let it go. He will speak out. And what if it was I who murdered the old woman and the Zaveta? he said suddenly and realized what he had done. Zamatov looked wildly at him and turned white as the tablecloth. His face wore a contorted smile. But is it possible?" he brought out faintly. Raskolnikov looked wrathfully at him. "'Own up that you believed it, yes, you did?' "'Not a bit of it. I believe it less than ever now,' Zamatov cried hastily. "'I've caught my cocksparrow. So you did believe it before, if now you believe it less than ever.' "'Not at all!' cried Zamatov, obviously embarrassed. Have you been frightening me so as to lead up to this?" "'You don't believe it, then. What were you talking about behind my back when I went out of the police office? And why did the explosive lieutenant question me after I fainted?' "'Hey there!' 
he shouted to the waiter, getting up and taking his cap. How much? Thirty kopecks, the latter replied, running up. And there is twenty kopecks for vodka. See what a lot of money! He held out his shaking hand to Zamatov with notes in it. Red notes and blue, twenty-five roubles. Where did I get them? And where did my new clothes come from? You know I had not a kopeck. You've cross-examined my landlady, I'll be bound. Well, that's enough. As it goes. Till we meet again." He went out, trembling all over from a sort of wild hysterical sensation, in which there was an element of insufferable rapture. Yet he was gloomy and terribly tired. His face was twisted as after a fit. His fatigue increased rapidly. Any shock, any irritating sensation stimulated and revived his energies at once, but his strength failed as quickly when the stimulus was removed. Zamatov, left alone, sat for a long time in the same place, plunged in thought. Raskolnikov had unwittingly worked a revolution in his brain on a certain point, and had made up his mind for him conclusively. Ilya Petrovitch is a blockhead, he decided. Raskolnikov had hardly opened the door of the restaurant when he stumbled against Razumian on the steps. They did not see each other till they almost knocked against each other. For a moment they stood looking each other up and down. Razumian was greatly astounded. Then anger, real anger, gleamed fiercely in his eyes. "'So here you are!' he shouted at the top of his voice. "'You ran away from your bed! And here I've been looking for you under the sofa! We went up to the garret! I almost beat Nastasia on your account! And here he is after all! Rodya, what is the meaning of it? Tell me the whole truth! Confess! Do you hear?" "'It means that I'm sick to death of you all and I want to be alone,' Raskolnikov answered calmly. "'Alone? When you are not able to walk, when your face is as white as a sheet, and you are gasping for breath? Idiot! What have you been doing in the Palais de Cristal? Own up at once!' "'Let me go,' said Raskolnikov, and tried to pass him. This was too much for Azumian. He gripped him firmly by the shoulder. "'Let you go? You dare tell me to let you go? Do you know what I'll do with you directly? I'll pick you up, tie you in a bundle, carry you home under my arm, and lock you up!' "'Listen, Razumian. Raskolnikov began quietly, apparently calm. "'Can't you see that I don't want your benevolence? A strange desire you have to shower benefits on a man who curses them, who feels them a burden, in fact. Why did you seek me out at the beginning of my illness? Maybe I was very glad to die. Didn't I tell you plainly enough today that you were torturing me, that I was sick of you? You seem to want to torture people. I assure you that all that is seriously hindering my recovery, because it's continually irritating me. You saw Zosimov went away just now to avoid irritating me. You leave me alone, too, for goodness' sake. What right have you, indeed, to keep me by force? Don't you see that I am in possession of all my faculties now? How, how can I persuade you not to persecute me with your kindness? I may be ungrateful, I may be mean. Only let me be, for God's sake, let me be. Let me be, let me be. He began calmly gloating beforehand over the venomous phrases he was about to utter, but finished, panting for breath, in a frenzy, as he had been with Luzhin. Razumian stood a moment, thought, and let his hand drop. "'Well, go to hell, then,' he said gently and thoughtfully. "'Stay!' he roared, as Raskolnikov was about to move. "'Listen to me. Let me tell you that you are all a set of babbling, posing idiots. If you've any little trouble, you brood over it like a hen over an egg. And you're plagiarists even at that. There isn't a sign of independent life in you. You are made of spermaceti ointment, and you've lymph in your veins instead of blood. I don't believe in any one of you. In any circumstances, the first thing for all of you is to be unlike a human being. Stop! he cried with redoubled fury, noticing that Raskolnikov was again making a movement. Hear me out! You know I'm having a housewarming this evening. I dare say they've arrived by now, 
but I left my uncle there, I just ran in, to receive the guests. And if you weren't a fool, a common fool, a perfect fool, if you were an original instead of a translation... You see, Rodya, I recognize you're a clever fellow, but you're a fool. And if you weren't a fool, you'd come round to me this evening instead of wearing out your boots in the street. Since you have gone out, there's no help for it. I'd give you a snug easy chair, my landlady has one, a cup of tea, company, or you could lie on the sofa, any way you would be with us. Zosimov will be there too. Will you come?" No. Rubbish! Razumian shouted, out of patience. How do you know? You can't answer for yourself. You don't know anything about it. Thousands of times I've fought tooth and nail with people and run back to them afterwards. One feels ashamed and goes back to a man. So remember, Pachinkov's house on the third story. Why, Mr. Razumian, I do believe you'd let anybody beat you from sheer benevolence. Beat? Whom? Me? I twist up his nose at the mere idea. Pachinkov's house, 47 Babushkin's flat. I shall not come, Razumian. Raskolnikov turned and walked away. I'll bet you will, Razumian shouted after him. I refuse to know you if you don't. Stay! Hey, is Amatov in there? Yes. Did you see him? Yes. Talk to him? Yes. What about? Confound you, don't tell me then. Pachinkov's house, 47, Babushkin's flat, remember. Raskolnikov walked on and turned the corner into Sadovy Street. Razumian looked after him thoughtfully. Then, with a wave of his hand, he went into the house but stopped short of the stairs. Confound it! he went on almost aloud. He talked sensibly, but yet. I am a fool. As if madmen didn't talk sensibly. And this was just what Zosimov seemed afraid of. He struck his finger on his forehead. What if? How could I let him go off alone? He may drown himself. Ah, what a blunder! I can't. And he ran back to overtake Raskolnikov, but there was no trace of him. With a curse he returned with rapid steps to the Palais de Cristal to question Zamatov. Raskolnikov walked straight to X Bridge, stood in the middle, and, leaning both elbows on the rail, stared into the distance. On parting with Razumian, he felt so much weaker that he could scarcely reach this place. He longed to sit or lie down somewhere in the street. Bending over the water, he gazed mechanically at the last pink flush of the sunset, at the row of houses growing dark in the gathering twilight, at one distant attic window on the left bank, flashing as though on fire in the last rays of the setting sun, at the darkening water of the canal, and the water seemed to catch his attention. At last red circles flashed before his eyes. The houses seemed moving, the passers-by, the canal banks, the carriages all danced before his eyes. Suddenly he started, saved again perhaps from swooning by an uncanny and hideous sight. He became aware of someone standing on the right side of him. He looked and saw a tall woman with a kerchief on her head, with a long, yellow, wasted face and red, sunken eyes. She was looking straight at him but obviously she saw nothing and recognized no one. Suddenly she leaned her right hand on the parapet, lifted her right leg over the railing, then her left and threw herself into the canal. The filthy water parted and swallowed up its victim for a moment, then an instant later the drowning woman floated to the surface, moving slowly with the current, her head and legs in the water, her skirt inflated like a balloon over her back. A woman drowning! A woman drowning!" shouted dozens of voices. People ran up. Both banks were thronged with spectators. On the bridge people crowded about Raskolnikov, pressing up behind him. "'Mercy on it! It's our Afrosinia! a woman cried tearfully close by. "'Mercy! Save her! Kind people, pull her out!' "'A boat! A boat!' was shouted in the crowd. But there was no need of a boat. A policeman ran down the steps to the canal, 
threw off his gray coat and his boots, and rushed into the water. It was easy to reach her. She floated within a couple of yards of the steps. He caught hold of her clothes with his right hand, and with his left seized a pole which a comrade held out to him. The drowning woman was pulled out at once. They laid her on the granite pavement of the embankment. She soon recovered consciousness, raised her head, sat up and began sneezing and coughing, stupidly wiping her wet dress with her hands. She said nothing. "'She's drunk herself out of her senses!' the same woman's voice wailed at her side. "'Out of her senses! The other day she tried to hang herself. We cut her down. I ran out to the shop just now, left my little girl to look after her, and here she's in trouble again. A neighbor, gentlemen, a neighbor, we live close by, the second house from the end, see, yonder." The crowd broke up. The police still remained round the woman. Someone mentioned the police station. Raskolnikov looked on with a strange sensation of indifference and apathy. He felt disgusted. "'No, that's loathsome, water. It's not good enough,' he muttered to himself. "'Nothing will come of it,' he added. "'No use to wait. What about the police office? And why isn't Zamatov at the police office? The police office is open till ten o'clock.' He turned his back to the railing and looked about him. "'Very well, then,' he said resolutely. He moved from the bridge and walked in the direction of the police office. His heart felt hollow and empty. He did not want to think. Even his depression had passed. There was not a trace now of the energy with which he had set out to make an end of it all. Complete apathy had succeeded to it. "'Well, it's a way out of it,' he thought, walking slowly and listlessly along the canal bank. Anyway, I'll make an end, for I want to. But is it a way out? What does it matter? There'll be the square yard of space. Ha! But what an end! Is it really the end? Shall I tell them, or not? Ah, damn! How tired I am! If I could find somewhere to sit or lie down soon! What I am most ashamed of is its being so stupid! But I don't care about that, either. What idiotic ideas come into one's head!" To reach the police office, he had to go straight forward and take the second turning to the left. It was only a few paces away. But at the first turning he stopped, and, after a minute's thought, turned into a side street and went two streets out of his way, possibly without any object, or possibly to delay a minute and gain time. He walked looking at the ground. Suddenly someone seemed to whisper in his ear. He lifted his head and saw that he was standing at the very gate of the house. He had not passed it, he had not been near it since that evening. An overwhelming, unaccountable prompting drew him on. He went into the house, passed through the gateway, then into the first entrance on the right, and began mounting the familiar staircase to the fourth story. The narrow, steep staircase was very dark. He stopped at each landing and looked round him with curiosity. On the first landing the framework of the window had been taken out. That wasn't so, then, he thought. Here was the flat on the second story where Nikolai and Dmitri had been working. It's shut up and the door newly painted. So it's to let. Then the third story and the fourth. Here. He was perplexed to find the door of the flat wide open. There were men there, he could hear voices. He had not expected that. After brief hesitation he mounted the last stairs and went into the flat. It too was being done up. There were workmen in it. This seemed to amaze him. He somehow fancied that he would find everything as he had left it, even perhaps the corpses in the same places on the floor. And now, bare walls, no furniture. It seemed strange. He walked to the window and sat down on the window sill. There were two workmen, both young fellows, but one much younger than the other. They were papering the walls with a new white paper covered with lilac flowers, instead of the old, dirty yellow one. Raskolnikov for some reason felt horribly annoyed by this. He looked at the new paper with dislike, 
as though he felt sorry to have it all so changed. The workmen had obviously stayed beyond their time, and now they were hurriedly rolling up their paper and getting ready to go home. They took no notice of Raskolnikov's coming in. They were talking. Raskolnikov folded his arms and listened. "'She comes to me in the morning,' said the elder to the younger. "'Very early, all dressed up. Why are you preening and prinking?' says I. I am ready to do anything to please you, Tit Vasilich. That's a way of going on, and she dressed up like a regular fashion book." "'And what is a fashion book?' the younger one asked. He obviously regarded the other as an authority. "'A fashion book is a lot of pictures, colored, and they come to the tailors here every Saturday, by post from abroad, to show folks how to dress, the male sex as well as the female. They're pictures. The gentlemen are generally wearing fur coats, and for the ladies' fluffles they're beyond anything you can fancy." "'There's nothing you can't find in Petersburg,' the younger cried enthusiastically. "'Except father and mother, there's everything.' "'Except them, there's everything to be found, my boy,' the elder declared sententiously. Raskolnikov got up and walked into the other room, where the strong-box, the bed, and the chest of drawers had been. The room seemed to him very tiny without furniture in it. The paper was the same. The paper in the corner showed where the case of icons had stood. He looked at it and went to the window. The elder workman looked at him askance. "'What do you want?' he asked suddenly. Instead of answering, Raskolnikov went into the passage and pulled the bell. The same bell, the same cracked note. He rang it a second and a third time. He listened and remembered. The hideous and agonizingly fearful sensation he had felt then began to come back more and more vividly. He shuddered at every ring, and it gave him more and more satisfaction. "'Well, what do you want? Who are you?' the workman shouted, going out to him. Raskolnikov went inside again. "'I want to take a flat,' he said. "'I am looking round.' "'It's not the time to look at rooms at night and you ought to come up with the porter." "'The floors have been washed. Will they be painted?' Raskolnikov went on. "'Is there no blood?' "'What blood?' "'Why, the old woman and her sister were murdered here. There was a perfect pool there.' "'But who are you?' the workman cried, uneasy. "'Who am I?' "'Yes.' "'You want to know? Come to the police station. I'll tell you. The workman looked at him in amazement. "'It's time for us to go. We are late. Come along, Alyoshka. We must lock up,' said the elder workman. "'Very well, come along,' said Raskolnikov indifferently, and, going out first, he went slowly downstairs. "'Hey, porter!' he cried in the gateway. At the entrance several people were standing, staring at the passers-by the two porters, a peasant woman, a man in a long coat, and a few others. Raskolnikov went straight up to them. "'What do you want?' asked one of the porters. "'Have you been to the police office?' "'I've just been there. What do you want?' "'Is it open?' "'Of course.' "'Is the assistant there?' "'He was there for a time. What do you want?' Raskolnikov made no reply, but stood beside them lost in thought. He's been to look at the flat," said the elder workman, coming forward. "'Which flat?' "'Where we are at work. Why have you washed away the blood?' says he. "'There has been a murder here,' says he, and I've come to take it. And he began ringing at the bell, all but broke it. "'Come to the police station,' says he. I'll tell you everything there. He wouldn't leave us.' The porter looked at Raskolnikov, frowning and perplexed. Who are you? he shouted as impressively as he could. I am Rodion Romanovich Raskolnikov, formerly a student. I live in Shields House, not far from here, flat number fourteen. Ask the porter, he knows me. Raskolnikov said all this in a lazy, dreamy voice, not turning round but looking intently into the darkening street. Why have you been to the flat? To look at it. What is there to look at? Take him straight to the police station," the man in the long coat jerked in abruptly. 
Raskolnikov looked intently at him over his shoulder, and said in the same slow, lazy tones, "'Come along.' "'Yes, take him,' the man went on more confidently. "'Why was he going into that? What's in his mind, eh?' "'He's not drunk, but God knows what's the matter with him,' muttered the workman. "'But what do you want?' the porter shouted again, beginning to get angry in earnest. "'Why are you hanging about?' "'You funk the police station, then?' said Raskolnikov jeeringly. "'How funk it? Why are you hanging about?' "'He's a rogue!' shouted the peasant woman. "'Why waste time talking to him?' cried the other porter, a huge peasant in a full open coat and with keys on his belt. "'Get along! He is a rogue, and no mistake! Get along!' And seizing Raskolnikov by the shoulder, he flung him into the street. He lurched forward, but recovered his footing, looked at the spectators in silence, and walked away. "'Strange man,' observed the workman. "'There are strange folks about nowadays,' said the woman. "'You should have taken him to the police station all the same,' said the man in the long coat. "'Better have nothing to do with him,' decided the big porter. "'A regular rogue. Just what he wants, you may be sure.' but once you take him up, you won't get rid of him. We know the sort." "'Shall I go there or not?' thought Raskolnikov, standing in the middle of the thoroughfare at the crossroads, and he looked about him as though expecting from someone a decisive word. But no sound came, all was dead and silent like the stones on which he walked, dead to him, to him alone. All at once, at the end of the street, two hundred yards away, in the gathering dusk, he saw a crowd and heard talk and shouts. In the middle of the crowd stood a carriage. A light gleamed in the middle of the street. "'What is it?' Raskolnikov turned to the right and went up to the crowd. He seemed to clutch at everything, and smiled coldly when he recognized it, for he had fully made up his mind to go to the police station and knew that it would all soon be over. End of Part 2 Chapter 6